Isocrates, with an English translation by George Norlin in three volumes. Volume 3. Evagoras. When I saw you, Nicocles, honoring the tomb of your father, not only with numerous and beautiful offerings, but also with dances, music, and athletic contests, and, furthermore, with races of horses and triremes, and leaving to others no possibility of surpassing you in such celebrations, I judged that Evagoras if the dead have any perception of that which takes place in this world, while gladly accepting these offerings and rejoicing in the spectacle of your devotion and princely. Magnificence in honouring him, would feel far greater gratitude to anyone who could worthily recount his principles in life and his perilous deeds than to all other men, for we shall find that men of ambition and greatness of soul not only are desirous of praise for such things, but prefer a glorious death to life, zealously seeking glory rather than existence, and doing all that lies in their power to leave behind a memory of themselves that shall never die. Expenditure of money can affect nothing of this kind but is an indication of wealth only, and those who devote themselves to music and letters and to the various contests, some by exhibiting their strength and others their artistic skill, win for themselves greater honour. But the spoken words which should adequately recount the deeds of Evagoras would make his virtues never to be forgotten among all mankind. Now other writers should have praised those who in their own time had proved themselves good men, to the end that those who have the ability to glorify the deeds of their contemporaries, by speaking in the presence of those who knew the facts might have employed the truth concerning them, and also that the younger generation might with greater emulation have striven for virtue, knowing well that they would be praised more highly than those whom they have excelled in merit. But as it is, who would not be disheartened when he sees those who lived in the time of the Trojan War, and even earlier? Celebrated in song and tragedy and yet foresees that even if he himself surpass their valorous achievements he will never be thought worthy of such praise. The cause of this is envy, which has this as its only good it is the greatest evil to those who feel it. For some are so ungenerous by nature that they would listen more gladly to the praise of men of whose existence they are uncertain rather than of those who may have been their own benefactors. Men of intelligence, however, should not let themselves be enslaved by men whose minds are so perverted, on the contrary. They should ignore such as these and accustom their fellows to hear about those whom we are in duty bound to praise, especially since we are aware that progress is made, not only in the arts, but in all other activities, not through the agency of those that are satisfied with things as they are, but through those who correct, and have the courage constantly to change, anything which is not as it should be. I am fully aware that what I propose to do is difficult to eulogize in prose the virtues of a man. The best proof is this, those who devote themselves to philosophy venture to speak on many subjects of every kind, but no one of them has ever attempted to compose a discourse on such a theme. And I can make much allowance for them. For to the poets is granted the use of many embellishments of language, since they can represent the gods as associating with men, conversing with and aiding in battle whomsoever they please. And they can treat of these subjects not only in conventional expressions but in words now exotic, now newly coined, and now in figures of speech, neglecting none, but using every kind with which to embroider their poesy. Orators, on the contrary, are not permitted the use of such devices, they must use with precision only words in current use and only such ideas as bear upon the actual facts. Besides, the poets compose all their works with metre and rhythm, while the orators do not share in any of these advantages, and these lend such charm that even though the poets may be deficient in style and thoughts, yet by the very spell of their rhythm and harmony they bewitch their listeners. The power of poetry may be understood from this consideration, if one should retain the words and ideas of poems which are held in high esteem, but do away with the metre, they will appear far inferior to the opinion we now have of them. Nevertheless, although poetry has advantages so great, we must not shrink from the task. But must make the effort and see if it will be possible in prose to eulogize good men in no worse fashion than their encomiasts do who employ song and verse. In the first place, with respect to the birth and ancestry of Evagoras, even if many are already familiar with the facts, I believe it is fitting that I also should recount them for the sake of the others, that all may know that he proved himself not inferior to the noblest and greatest examples of excellence which were of his inheritance. For it is acknowledged that the noblest of the demigods are the sons of Zeus, and there is no one who would not award first place among these to the Eacidae, for while in the other families we shall find some of superior and some of inferior worth, yet all the Eacidae have been most renowned of all their contemporaries. In the first place Eacus, son of Zeus and ancestor of the family of the Teucridae, was so distinguished that when a drought visited the Greeks and many persons had perished, and when the magnitude of the calamity had passed all bounds, the leaders of the cities came as suppliants to him, for they thought that, by reason of his kinship with Zeus and his piety, 
they would most quickly obtain from the gods relief from the woes that afflicted them. Having gained their desire, they were saved and built in Aegina a temple to be shared by all the Greeks on the very spot where he had offered his prayer. During his entire stay among men he ever enjoyed the fairest repute, and after his departure from life it is said that he sits by the side of Pluto and Kauai in the enjoyment of the highest honours. The sons of Echus were Telamon and Peleus, Telamon won the Mede of Vela in an expedition with Heracles against Laomedon, and Peleus, having distinguished himself in the battle with the centaurs and having won glory in many other hazardous enterprises, wedded the Tees, the daughter of Nereus, he immortal winning an immortal bride. And they say that at his wedding alone, of all the human race who have ever lived, the wedding song was sung by gods. To each of these two were born sons to Telamon Arjax and Teusa, and to Peleus Achilles. And these heroes gave proof of their valour in the clearest and most convincing way, for not alone in their own cities were they preeminent. Or in the places where they made their homes, but when an expedition was organised by the Greeks against the barbarians. And a great army was assembled on either side and no warrior of repute was absent, Achilles above all distinguished himself in these perils. And Arjux was second to him in Vela, and Teusa, who proved himself worthy of their kinship and inferior to none of the other heroes, after he had helped in the capture of Troy, went to Cyprus and founded Salamis, giving to it the name of his former native land, and he left behind him the family that now reigns. So distinguished from the beginning was the heritage transmitted to Evagoras by his ancestors. After the city had been founded in this manner, the rule at first was held by Teusa's descendants, at a later time, however, there came from Phoenicia a fugitive, who after he had gained the confidence of the king who then reigned, and had won great power, showed no proper gratitude for the favour shown him, on the contrary, he acted basely toward his host, and being skilled at grasping. He expelled his benefactor and himself seized the throne. But distrustful of the consequences of his measures and wishing to make his position secure, he reduced the city to barbarism, and brought the whole island into subservience to the great king. Such was the state of affairs in Salamis, and the descendants of the usurper were in possession of the throne when Evagoras was born. I prefer to say nothing of the portents, the oracles, the visions appearing in dreams, from which the impression might be gained that he was of superhuman birth, not because I disbelieve the reports, but that I may make it clear to all that I am so far from resorting to invention in speaking of his deeds that even of those matters which are in fact true I dismiss such as are known only to the few and of which not all the citizens are cognizant. And I shall begin my account of him with the generally acknowledged facts. When Evagoras was a boy he possessed beauty, bodily strength, and modesty, the very qualities that are most becoming to that age. Witnesses could be produced for these assertions, for his modesty fellow citizens who were educated with him, for his beauty all who beheld him, for his strength all the contests in which he vanquished his age mates. When he attained to manhood not only did all these qualities grow up with him, but to them were also added manly courage, wisdom, and justice, and that too in no ordinary measure, as is the case with some others, but each of these characteristics in extraordinary degree. So surpassing was his excellence of both body and mind, that when the kings of that time looked upon him they were terrified and feared for their throne, thinking that a man of such nature could not possibly pass his life in the status of a private citizen, but whenever they observed his character, they felt such confidence in him that they believed that even if anyone else should dare to injure them, Evagoras would be their champion. And although opinions of him were so at variance, they were mistaken in neither respect, for he neither remained in private life, nor did them injury, on the contrary, the deity took such thought for him that he should honourably assume the throne. That all the preparations which necessarily involved impiety were made by another. While he preserved for Evagoras those means whereby it was possible for him to gain the rule in accordance with piety and justice. For one of the princes, starting a conspiracy, slew the tyrant and attempted to arrest Evagoras, believing that he would not be able to retain the rule himself unless he should get him out of the way. But Evagoras escaped this peril, and having saved himself by fleeing to Soli in Cilicia did not show the same spirit as those who are the victims of like misfortune. For other exiles from royal power are humbled in spirit because of their misfortunes, whereas Evagoras attained to such greatness of soul that, although until that time he had lived as a private citizen, when he was driven into exile he determined to gain the throne. The wandering life of an exile, the dependence upon the help of others in seeking his restoration and the paying of court to his inferiors all these he scorned, but this he took as his guiding principle which those who would be God-fearing men must take to act only in self-defence and never to be the aggressor, and he chose either by success to regain the throne or, failing in that, to die. 
and so, calling to his side men numbering, according to the highest estimates, about fifty, with these he prepared to effect his return from exile. And from this venture especially the character of Evagoras and his reputation among his associates may be seen, for although he was on the point of sailing with so few companions for the accomplishment of so great a design, and although all the attendant dangers were near at hand, neither did he himself lose heart, nor did any of his companions see fit to shrink from these dangers, nay, as if a god were their leader, they one and all held fast to their promises, and Evagoras, just as if. Either he had an army superior to that of his adversaries or foresaw the outcome, held to his opinion. This is evident from his acts, for, when he had landed on the island, he did not think it necessary to seize a strong position, make sure of his own safety. And then to wait and see if some of the citizens would rally to his aid, but immediately. Just as he was, on that very night he broke through a little gate in the wall, and leading his followers through this opening, attacked the palace. The confusion attendant upon such occasions, the fears of his followers, the exhortations of their leader why need I take the time to describe? When the supporters of the tyrant opposed him and the citizens generally were observers for they held their peace because they feared either the authority of the one party or the valour of the other, he did not cease from fighting, whether alone against many or with few opposing all the foe, until, having captured the palace, he had taken vengeance upon the enemy and had succoured his friends, furthermore he restored its ancestral honours to his family and established himself as ruler of the city. I think that even if I should mention nothing more, but should discontinue my discourse at this point. From what I have said the valour of Evagoras and the greatness of his deeds would be readily manifest, nevertheless. I consider that both will be yet more clearly revealed from what remains to be said. For of all the many sovereigns since time began, none will be found to have won this honour more gloriously than Evagoras. If we were to compare the deeds of Evagoras with those of each one, such an account would perhaps be inappropriate to the occasion, and the time would not suffice for the telling. But if we select the most illustrious of these rulers and examine their exploits in the light of his, our investigation will lose nothing thereby and our discussion will be much more brief. Who then, would not choose the perilous deeds of Evagoras before the fortunes of those who inherited their kingdoms from their fathers? For surely there is no one so mean of spirit that he would prefer to receive that power from his ancestors than first to acquire it, as he did, and then to bequeath it to his children. Furthermore, of the returns to their thrones by princes of ancient times the most renowned are those of which the poets tell us, indeed they not only chronicle for us those which have been most glorious, but also compose new ones of their own invention. Nevertheless no poet has told the story of any legendary prince who has faced hazards so formidable and yet regained his throne, on the contrary, most of their heroes have been represented as having regained their kingdoms by chance, others as having employed deceit and artifice to overcome their foes. Nay, of those who lived later, perhaps indeed of all, the one hero who was most admired by the greatest number was Cyrus, who deprived the Medes of their kingdom and gained it for the Persians. But while Cyrus with a Persian army conquered the Medes, a deed which many a Greek or a barbarian could easily do, Evagoras manifestly accomplished the greater part of the deeds which have been mentioned through strength of his own mind and body. Again, while it is not at all certain from the expedition of Cyrus that he would have endured the dangers of Evagoras, yet it is obvious to all from the deeds of Evagoras that the latter would have readily attempted the exploits of Cyrus. In addition, while piety and justice characterized every act of Evagoras, some of the successes of Cyrus were gained impiously, for the former destroyed his enemies, but Cyrus slew his mother's father. Consequently if any should wish to judge, not of the greatness of their successes, but of the essential merit of each, they would justly award greater praise to Evagoras than even to Cyrus. And if there is need to speak concisely, without reservation or fear of arousing ill feeling, but with the utmost frankness, I would say that no one, whether mortal, demigod, or immortal, will be found to have obtained his throne more nobly, more splendidly, or more piously. Anyone would in the highest degree be confirmed in this belief if, distrusting completely what I have said, he were to set about examining how each gained royal power. For it will be manifest that it is through no desire whatever of grandiloquence, but because of the truth of the matter, that I have spoken thus boldly about Evagoras. Now if he had distinguished himself in unimportant ways only, he would fittingly be thought worthy also of praise of like nature, but as it is, all would admit that of all blessings whether human or divine supreme power is the greatest, the most august, and the object of greatest strife. That man, therefore, who has most gloriously acquired the most glorious of possessions, what poet or what artificer of words could raise in a manner worthy of his deeds? 
nor again, though he was a man of surpassing merit in these respects, will Evagoras be found deficient in all others, but, in the first place, although gifted by nature with the highest intelligence and capable of successful action in very many fields, yet he judged that he should not slight any matter or act on the spur of the moment in public affairs, nay, he spent most of his time in inquiring, in deliberation, and in taking counsel, for he believed that if he should prepare his mind well, all would be well with his kingdom also, and he marveled at those who, while they cultivate the mind for all other ends, take no thought of the mind itself. Again, in public affairs he held to the same opinion, for, seeing that those persons who look best after realities are least worried, and that the true freedom from anxiety is to be found, not in inactivity, but in success and patient endurance. He left nothing unexamined, on the contrary, so thoroughly was he cognizant of public affairs and so thorough was his knowledge of each of the citizens, that neither those who conspired against him took him unawares, nor did the good citizens remain unknown to him, but all got their deserts, for he neither punished nor honoured them on the basis of what he heard from others, but from his own knowledge he judged them. When he had engaged himself in the care of such matters he made not a single mistake in dealing with the unexpected incidents which daily befell, but he governed the city so reverently and humanely that visitors to the island did not so much envy Evagoras his office as they did the citizens their government under him, for throughout his whole life he never acted unjustly toward anyone but ever honoured the good, and while he ruled all his subjects with strictness, yet he punished wrongdoers. In accordance with the laws, and while he was in no need of advisers. Yet he sought the counsel of his friends. He yielded often to his intimates, but in everything dominated his enemies, he inspired respect, not by the frownings of his brow, but by the principles of his life in no thing was he disposed to carelessness or caprice, but observed his agreements in deed as well as word, he was proud, not of successes that were due to fortune, but of those that came about through his own efforts his friends he made subject to himself by his benefactions the rest by his magnanimity he enslaved, he inspired fear, not by venting his wrath upon many, but because in character he far surpassed all others, of his pleasures he was the master and not their servant, by little labour he gained much leisure, but would not, to gain a little respite, leave great labours undone, in general, he fell in no respect short of the qualities which belong to kings. But choosing from each kind of government the best characteristic, he was democratic in his service to the people, statesmanlike in the administration of the city as a whole, an able general in his good counsel in the face of dangers, and princely in his superiority in all these qualities. That these attributes were inherent in Evagoras, and even more than these, it is easy to learn from his deeds themselves. After he had taken over the government of the city, which had been reduced to a state of barbarism and, because it was ruled by Phoenicians, was neither hospitable to the Greeks nor acquainted with the arts, nor possessed of a trading port or harbour, Evagoras remedied all these defects and, besides, acquired much additional territory, surrounded it all with new walls and built triremes, and with other constructions so increased the city that it was inferior to none of the cities of Greece. And he caused it to become so powerful that many who formerly despised it, now feared it. And yet it is not possible that cities should take on such increase unless there are those who govern them by such principles as Evagoras had and as I endeavoured to describe a little before. In consequence I am not afraid of appearing to exaggerate in speaking of the qualities of the man, but rather lest I greatly fall short of doing justice to his deeds. For who could do justice to a man of such natural gifts, a man who not only increased the importance of his own city, but advanced the whole region surrounding the island to a regime of mildness and moderation? Before Evagoras gained the throne the inhabitants were so hostile to strangers and fierce that they considered the best rulers to be those who treated the Greeks in the most cruel fashion. At present, however, they have undergone so great a change that they strive with one another to see who shall be regarded as most friendly to the Greeks. And the majority of them take their wives from us and from them beget children. And they have greater pleasure in owning Greek possessions and observing Greek institutions than in their own, and more of those who occupy themselves with the liberal arts and with education in general now dwell in these regions than in the communities in which they formerly used to live. And for all these changes, no one could deny that Evagoras is responsible. The most convincing proof of the character and uprightness of Evagoras is this that many of the most reputable Greeks left their own fatherlands and came to Cyrus to dwell, because they considered Evagoras as rule less burdensome and more equitable than that of their own governments at home. To mention all the others by name would be too great a task, but who does not know about Conan, first among the Greeks for his very many glorious deeds, that when his own city had met with ill fortune, he chose out of all the world Evagoras and came to him believing that for himself Evagoras would provide the most secure asylum and for his country the most speedy assistance. 
and indeed Conan, although he had been successful in many previous ventures, in no one of them, it is believed, had he planned more wisely than in this, for the result of his visit to Cyprus was that he both conferred and received most benefits. In the first place, no sooner had Evagoras and Conan met one another than they esteemed each other more highly than those who before had been their intimate friends. Again, they not only were in complete harmony all their lives regarding all other matters, but also in matters relating to our own city they held to the same opinion. For when they beheld Athens under the domination of the Lacedaemonians and the victim of a great reversal of fortune, they were filled with grief and indignation, both acting fittingly, for Conan was a native son of Athens, and Evagoras, because of his many generous benefactions, had legally been given citizenship by the Athenians. And while they were deliberating how they might free Athens from her misfortunes, the Lacedaemonians themselves soon furnished the opportunity, for, as rulers of the Greeks on land and sea, they became so insatiate that they attempted to ravage Asia also. Conan and Evagoras seized this opportunity, and, as the generals of the Persian king were at a loss to know how to handle the situation, these two advised them to wage war against the Lacedaemonians, not upon land but upon the sea, their opinion being that if the Persians should organize an army on land and with this should gain a victory, the mainland alone would profit, whereas, if they should be victors on the sea, all Hellas would have a share in the victory. And that in fact is what happened, the generals followed this advice, a fleet was assembled, the Lacedaemonians were defeated in a naval battle and lost their supremacy, while the Greeks regained their freedom and our city recovered in some measure its old-time glory and became leader of the Allies. And although all this was accomplished with Conan as commander, yet Evagoras both made the outcome possible and furnished the greater part of the armament. In gratitude we honoured them with the highest honours and set up their statues where stands the image of Zeus the Saviour, near to it and to one another, a memorial both of the magnitude of their benefactions and of their mutual friendship. The king of Persia, however, did not have the same opinion of them, on the contrary, the greater and more illustrious their deeds the more he feared them. Concerning Conan I will give an account elsewhere. But that toward Evagoras he entertained this feeling not even the king himself sought to conceal for he was manifestly more concerned about the war in Cyprus than about any other, and regarded Evagoras as a more powerful and formidable antagonist than Cyrus, who had disputed the throne with him. The most convincing proof of this statement is this, when the king heard of the preparations Cyrus was making he viewed him with such contempt that because of his indifference Cyrus almost stood at the doors of his palace before he was aware of him. With regard to Evagoras, however, the king had stood in terror of him for so long a time that even while he was receiving benefits from him he had undertaken to make war upon him a wrongful act, indeed, but his purpose was not altogether unreasonable. For the king well knew that many men, both Greeks and barbarians, starting from low and insignificant beginnings, had overthrown great dynasties. And he was aware too of the lofty ambition of Evagoras and that the growth of both his prestige and of his political activities was not taking place by slow degrees, also that Evagoras had unsurpassed natural ability and that fortune was fighting with him as an ally. Therefore it was not in anger for the events of the past, but with forebodings for the future, nor yet fearing for Cyprus alone, but for reasons far weightier, that he undertook the war against Evagoras. In any case he threw himself into it with such order that he expended on this expedition more than 15,000 talents. But nevertheless, although Evagoras was inferior in all the resources of war, after he had marshalled in opposition to these extraordinarily immense preparations of the king his own determination, he proved himself in these circumstances to be far more worthy of admiration than in all those I have mentioned before. For when his enemies permitted him to be at peace, all he possessed was his own city, but when he was forced to go to war, he proved so valiant, and had so valiant an ally in his son Nitagoras, that he almost subdued the whole of Cyprus, ravaged Phoenicia, took Tyre by storm, caused Cilicia to revolt from the king, and slew so many of his enemies that many of the Persians, when they mourn over their sorrows, recall the valour of Evagoras. And finally he so glutted them with war that the Persian kings, who at other times were not accustomed to make peace with their rebellious subjects until they had become masters of their persons, gladly made peace, abandoning this custom and leaving entirely undisturbed the authority of Evagoras. And although the king within three years destroyed the dominion of the Lacedaemonians, who were then at the height of their glory and power, yet after he had waged war against Evagoras for ten years, he left him lord of all that he had possessed before he entered upon the war. But the most amazing thing of all is this, the city which, held by another prince, Evagoras had captured with fifty men, the great king, with all his vast power, was unable to subdue at all. In truth, how could one reveal the courage, the wisdom, 
all the virtues generally of Evagoras more clearly than by pointing to such deeds and perilous enterprises. For he will be shown to have surpassed in his exploits. Not only those of other wars, but even those of the War of the Heroes which is celebrated in the songs of all men. For they, in company with all Hellas, captured Troy only, but Evagoras, although he possessed but one city, waged war against all Asia. Consequently, if the number of those who wished to praise him had equaled those who lauded the heroes at Troy, he would have gained far greater renown than they. For whom shall we find of the men of that age if we disregard the fabulous tales and look at the truth who has accomplished such feats or has brought about changes so great in political affairs? Evagoras, from private estate, made himself a sovereign, his entire family, which had been driven from political power, he restored again to their appropriate honours, the citizens of barbarian birth he transformed into Hellenes, cravens into warriors, and obscure individuals into men of note, and having taken over a country wholly inhospitable and utterly reduced to savagery, he made it more civilised and gentler, furthermore, when he became hostile to the king. He defended himself so gloriously that the Cyprian War has become memorable for ever, and when he was the ally of the king. He made himself so much more serviceable than the others that, in the opinion of all, the forces he contributed to the naval battle at Nidus were the largest, and as the result of this battle, while the king became master of all Asia, the Lacedaemonians instead of ravaging the continent were compelled to fight for their own land, and the Greeks, in place of servitude, gained independence and the Athenians increased in power so greatly that those who formerly were their rulers came to offer them the hegemony. Consequently, if anyone should ask me what I regard as the greatest of the achievements of Evagoras, whether the careful military preparations directed against the Lacedaemonians which resulted in the aforesaid successes, or the last war, or the recovery of his throne, or his general administration of affairs, I should be at a great loss what to say in reply, for each achievement to which I happen to direct my attention seems to me the greatest and most admirable. Therefore, I believe that, if any men of the past have by their merit become immortal, Evagoras also has earned this preferment, and my evidence for that belief is this that the life he lived on earth has been more blessed by fortune and more favoured by the gods than theirs. For of the demigods the greater number and the most renowned were, we shall find, afflicted by the most grievous misfortunes, but Evagoras continued from the beginning to be not only the most admired, but also the most envied for his blessings. For in what respect did he lack utter felicity? Such ancestors fortune gave to him as to no other man, unless it has been one sprung from the same stock, and so greatly in body and mind did he excel others that he was worthy to hold sway over not only Salamis but the whole of Asia also, and having acquired most gloriously his kingdom he continued in its possession all his life, and though immortal by birth, he left behind a memory of himself that is immortal. And he lived just so long that he was neither unacquainted with old age, nor afflicted with the infirmities attendant upon that time of life. In addition to these blessings, that which seems to he the rarest and most difficult thing to win to be blessed with many children who are at the same time good not even this was denied him, but this also fell to his lot. And the greatest blessing was this, of his offspring he left not one who was addressed merely by a private title, on the contrary, one was called king, others princes, and others princesses. In view of these facts, if any of the poets have used extravagant expressions in characterizing any man of the past, asserting that he was a god among men, or a mortal divinity, all praise of that kind would be especially in harmony with the noble qualities of Evagoras. No doubt I have omitted much that might be said of Evagoras, for I am past my prime of life, in which I should have worked out this eulogy with greater finish and diligence. Nevertheless, even at my age, to the best of my ability he has not been left without his encomium. For my part, Nicocles, I think that while effigies of the body are fine memorials, yet likenesses of deeds and of the character are of far greater value. And these are to be observed only in discourses composed according to the rules of art. These I prefer to statues because I know, in the first place, that honourable men pride themselves not so much on bodily beauty as they desire to be honoured for their deeds and their wisdom, in the second place, because I know that images must of necessity remain solely among those in whose cities they were set up, whereas portrayals in words may be published throughout Hellas, and having been spread abroad in the gatherings of enlightened men, are welcomed among those whose approval is more to be desired than that of all others, and finally, while no one can make the bodily nature resemble mould statues and portraits in painting, yet for those who do not choose to be slothful, but desire to be good men, it is easy to imitate the character of their fellow men and their thoughts and purposes those, I mean, that are embodied in the spoken word. For these reasons especially I have undertaken to write this discourse because I believe that for you. 
For your children, and for all the other descendants of Evagoras, it would be by far the best incentive, if someone should assemble his achievements, give them verbal adornment, and submit them to you for your contemplation and study. For we exhort young men to the study of philosophy by praising others in order that they, emulating those who are eulogized, may desire to adopt the same pursuits, but I appeal to you and yours, using as examples not aliens, but members of your own family, and I counsel you to devote your attention to this, that you may not be surpassed in either word or deed by any of the Hellenes and do not imagine that I am reproaching you for indifference at present, because I often admonish you on the same subject. For it has not escaped the notice of either me or anyone else that you, Nicocles, are the first and the only one of those who possess royal power, wealth, and luxury who has undertaken to pursue the study of philosophy. Nor that you will cause many kings, emulating your culture, to desire these studies and to abandon the pursuits in which they now take too great pleasure. Although I am aware of these things, none the less I am acting, and shall continue to act, in the same fashion as spectators at the athletic games, for they do not shout encouragement to the runners who have been distanced in the race, but to those who still strive for the victory. It is my task, therefore, and that of your other friends, to speak and to write in such fashion as may be likely to incite you to strive eagerly after those things which even now you do in fact desire, and you it behoves not to be negligent, but as at present so in the future to pay heed to yourself and to discipline your mind that you may be worthy of your father and of all your ancestors. For though it is the duty of all to place a high value upon wisdom, yet you kings especially should do so, who have power over very many and weighty affairs. You must not be content if you chance to be already superior to your contemporaries. But you should be chagrined if, endowed as you are by nature, distantly descended from Zeus and in our own time from a man of such distinguished excellence, you shall not far surpass, not only all others, but also those who possess the same high station as yourself it is in your power not to fail in this, for if you persevere in the study of philosophy and make as great progress as heretofore, you will soon become the man it is fitting you should be. Helen. There are some who are much pleased with themselves if, after setting up an absurd and self-contradictory subject, they succeed in discussing it in tolerable fashion, and men have grown old, some asserting that it is impossible to say, or to gainsay, what is false, or to speak on both sides of the same questions. Others maintaining that courage and wisdom and justice are identical, and that we possess none of these as natural qualities, but that there is one sort of knowledge concerned with them all. And still others waste their time in captious disputations that are not only entirely useless, but are sure to make trouble for their disciples. For my part, if I observed that this futile affectation had arisen only recently in rhetoric and that these men were priding themselves upon the novelty of their inventions, I should not be surprised at them to such degree, but as it is, who is so backward in learning as not to know that Protagoras and the sophists of his time have left to us compositions of similar character and even far more overwrought than these. For how could one surpass Gorgias, who dared to assert that nothing exists of the things that are, or Zeno, who ventured to prove the same things as possible and again as impossible, or Melissus who, although things in nature are infinite in number, made it his task to find proofs that the whole is one. Nevertheless, although these men so clearly have shown that it is easy to contrive false statements on any subject that may be proposed, they still waste time on this commonplace. They ought to give up the use of this claptrap which pretends to prove things by verbal quibbles, which in fact have long since been refuted, and to pursue the truth, to instruct their pupils in the practical affairs of our government and train to expertness therein, bearing in mind that likely conjecture about useful things is far preferable to exact knowledge of the useless, and that to be a little superior in important things is of greater worth than to be preeminent in petty things that are without value for living. But the truth is that these men care for naught save enriching themselves at the expense of the youth. It is their philosophy applied to heuristic disputations that effectively produces this result, for these rhetoricians, who care nothing at all for either private or public affairs, take most pleasure in those discourses which are of no practical service in any particular. These young men, to be sure, may well be pardoned for holding such views. For in all matters they are and always have been inclined toward what is extraordinary and astounding. But those who profess to give them training are deserving of censure because, while they condemn those who deceive in cases involving private contracts in business and those who are dishonest in what they say, yet they themselves are guilty of more reprehensible conduct, for the former wrong sundry other persons, but the latter inflict most injury upon their own pupils. And they have caused mendacity to increase to such a degree that now certain men, seeing these persons prospering from such practices, 
have the effrontery to write that the life of beggars and exiles is more enviable than that of the rest of mankind, and they use this as a proof that, if they can speak ably on ignoble subjects, it follows that in dealing with subjects of real worth they would easily find abundance of arguments. The most ridiculous thing of all, in my opinion, is this, that by these arguments they seek to convince us that they possess knowledge of the science of government. When they might be demonstrating it by actual work in their professed subject. For it is fitting that those who lay claim to learning and profess to be wise men should excel laymen and be better than they, not in fields neglected by everybody else, but where all are rivals. But as it is, their conduct resembles that of an athlete who, although pretending to be the best of all athletes, enters a contest in which no one would condescend to meet him. For what sensible man would undertake to praise misfortunes? No, it is obvious that they take refuge in such topics because of weakness. Such compositions follow one set road and this road is neither difficult to find, nor to learn, nor to imitate. On the other hand, discourses that are of general import, those that are trustworthy, and all of similar nature, are devised and expressed through the medium of a variety of forms and occasions of discourse whose opportune use is hard to learn. And their composition is more difficult as it is more arduous to practice dignity than buffoonery and seriousness than levity. The strongest proof is this, no one who has chosen to praise bumblebees and salt and kindred topics has never been at a loss for words, yet those who have essayed to speak on subjects recognized as good or noble, or of superior moral worth have all fallen far short of the possibilities which these subjects offer. For it does not belong to the same mentality to do justice to both kinds of subjects, on the contrary, while it is easy by eloquence to overdo the trivial themes, it is difficult to reach the heights of greatness of the others, and while on famous subjects one rarely finds thoughts which no one has previously uttered, yet on trifling and insignificant topics whatever the speaker may chance to say is entirely original. This is the reason why, of those who have wished to discuss a subject with eloquence, I praise especially him who chose to write of Helen, because he has recalled to memory so remarkable a woman, one who in birth, and in beauty, and in renown far surpassed all others. Nevertheless, even he committed a slight inadvertence for although he asserts that he has written an encomium of Helen, it turns out that he has actually spoken a defense of her conduct. But the composition in defense does not draw upon the same topics as the encomium nor indeed does it deal with actions of the same kind. But quite the contrary, for a plea in defence is appropriate only when the defendant is charged with a crime, whereas we praise those who excel in some good quality. But that I may not seem to be taking the easiest course, criticising others without exhibiting any specimen of my own, I will try to speak of this same woman, disregarding all that any others have said about her. I will take as the beginning of my discourse the beginning of her family. For although Zeus begat very many of the demigods, of this woman alone he condescended to be called father. While he was devoted most of all to the son of Alcmena and to the sons of Leda, yet his preference for Helen, as compared with Heracles, was so great that, although he conferred upon his son strength of body, which is able to overpower all others by force, yet to her he gave the gift of beauty, which by its nature brings even strength itself into subjection to it. And knowing that all distinction and renown accrue, not from a life of ease, but from wars and perilous combats, and since he wished, not only to exalt their persons to the gods, but also to bequeath to them glory that would be immortal, he gave his son a life of labours and love of perils, and to Helen he granted the gift of nature which drew the admiration of all beholders and which in all men inspired contention. In the first place the Theseus, reputedly the son of Aegeus, but in reality the progeny of Poseidon, seeing Helen not as yet in the full bloom of her beauty, but already surpassing other maidens, was so captivated by her loveliness that he, accustomed as he was to subdue others, and although the possessor of a fatherland most great and a kingdom most secure, thought life was not worth living amid the blessings he already had unless he could enjoy intimacy with her. And when he was unable to obtain her from her guardians for they were awaiting her maturity and the fulfilment of the oracle which the Pythian priestess had given scorning the royal power of Tyndarius. Disdaining the might of Castor and Pollux, and belittling all the hazards in Lacedaemon, he seized her by force and established her at Aphidna in Attica. So grateful was Theseus to Peirithos, his partner in the abduction, that when Peirithos wished to woo Persephone, the daughter of Zeus and Demeter, and summoned him to the descent into Hades to obtain her, when Theseus found that he could not by his warnings dissuade his friend, although the danger was manifest he nevertheless accompanied him, for he was of opinion that he owed this debt of gratitude to decline no task enjoined by Peirithos in return for his help in his own perilous enterprise. 
If the achiever of these exploits had been an ordinary person and not one of the very distinguished, it would not yet be clear whether this discourse is an encomium of Helen or an accusation of Theseus, but as it is, while in the case of other men who have won renown we shall find that one is deficient in courage, another in wisdom, and another in some kindred virtue, yet this hero alone was lacking in naught, but had attained consummate virtue. And it, it seems to me appropriate to speak of Theseus at still greater length, for I think this will be the strongest assurance for those who wish to praise Helen, if we can show that those who loved and admired her were themselves more deserving of admiration than other men. For contemporary events we should with good reason judge in accordance with our own opinions, but concerning events in time so remote it is fitting that we show our opinion to be in accord with the opinion of those men of wisdom who were at that time living. The fairest praise that I can award to Theseus is this that he, a contemporary of Heracles, won a fame which rivaled his. For they not only equipped themselves with similar armor, but followed the same pursuits, performing deeds that were worthy of their common origin. For being in birth the sons of brothers, the one of Zeus, the other of Poseidon, they cherished also kindred ambitions. For they alone of all who have lived before our time made themselves champions of human life. It came to pass that Heracles undertook perilous labors more celebrated and more severe, Theseus those more useful, and to the Greeks of more vital importance. For example, Heracles was ordered by Eurystheus to bring the cattle from Erythea and to obtain the apples of the Hesperides and to fetch Cerberus up from Hades and to perform other labours of that kind, labours which would bring no benefit to mankind, but only danger to himself, Theseus, however, being his own master, gave preference to those struggles which would make him a benefactor of either the Greeks at large or of his native land. Thus, the bull let loose by Poseidon which was ravaging the land of Attica, a beast which all men lacked the courage to confront, the sea single-handed subdued, and set free the inhabitants of the city from great fear and anxiety. And after this, allying himself with the Lapiths, he took the field against the centaurs, those creatures of double nature. Endowed with surpassing swiftness, strength, and daring, who were sacking, or about to sack, or were threatening, one city after another. These he conquered in battle and straightway put an end to their insolence, and not long thereafter he caused their race to disappear from the sight of men. At about the same time appeared the monster reared in Crete, the offspring of Pasipha, daughter of Helios, to whom our city was sending, in accordance with an oracle's command, tribute of twice seven children. When Theseus saw these being led away, and the entire populace escorting them, to a death savage and foreseen, and being mourned as dead while yet living, he was so incensed that he thought it better to die than to live as ruler of a city that was compelled to pay to the enemy a tribute so lamentable. Having embarked with them for Crete, he subdued this monster, half man and half bull, which possessed strength commensurate with its composite origin, and having rescued the children. He restored them to their parents and thus freed the city from an obligation so savage, so terrible, and so ineluctable. But I am at a loss how to deal with what remains to be said, for, now that I have taken up the deeds of Theseus and begun to speak of them, I hesitate to stop midway and leave unmentioned the lawlessness of Siren and of Circean and of other robbers like them whom he fought and vanquished and thereby delivered the Greeks from many great calamities. But, on the other hand, I perceive that I am being carried beyond the proper limits of my theme and I fear that some may think that I am more concerned with Theseus than with the subject which I originally chose. In this di dilemma I prefer to omit the greater part of what might be said, out of regard for impatient hearers, and to give as concise an account as I can of the rest, that I may gratify both them and myself and not make a complete surrender to those whose habit it is out of jealousy to find fault with everything that is said. His courage the sea is displayed in these perilous exploits which he hazarded alone, his knowledge of war in the battles he fought in company with the whole city, his piety toward the gods in connection with the supplications of Adrastus and the children of Heracles when, by defeating the Peloponnesians in battle, he saved the lives of the children, and to Adrastus he restored for burial, despite the the bands, the bodies of those who had died beneath the walls of the Cadmea, and finally, he revealed his other virtues and his prudence, not only in the deeds already recited, but especially in the manner in which he governed our city. For he saw that those who seek to rule their fellow citizens by force are themselves the slaves of others. And that those who keep the lives of their fellow citizens in peril themselves live in extreme fear, and are forced to make war, on the one hand, with the help of citizens against invaders from abroad, and, on the other hand, with the help of auxiliaries against their fellow citizens. Further, he saw them despoiling the temples of the gods, putting to death the best of their fellow citizens, distrusting those nearest to them, living lives no more free from care than do men who in 
Prison await their death, he saw that, although they are envied for their external blessings, yet in their own hearts they are more miserable than all other men for what? Pray, is more grievous than to live in constant fear lest some bystander kill you, dreading no less your own guards than those who plot against you? Theseus, then, despising all these and considering such men to be not rulers, but pests, of their states, demonstrated that it is easy to exercise the supreme power and at the same time to enjoy as good relations as those who live as citizens on terms of perfect equality. In the first place, the scattered settlements and villages of which the state was composed he united, and made Athens into a city-state so great that from then even to the present day it is the greatest state of Hellas, and after this, when he had established a common fatherland and had set free the minds of his fellow citizens, he instituted for them on equal terms that rivalry of theirs for distinction based on merit, confident that he would stand out as their superior in any case. Whether they practiced that privilege or neglected it, and he also knew that honours bestowed by high-minded men are sweeter than those that are awarded by slaves. And he was so far from doing anything contrary to the will of the citizens that he made the people masters of the government, and they on their part thought it best that he should rule alone, believing that his sole rule was more to be trusted and more equitable than their democracy. For he did not, as the other rulers did habitually, impose the labours upon the citizens and himself alone enjoy the pleasures, but the dangers he made his own, and the benefits he bestowed upon the people in common. In consequence, Theseus passed his life beloved of his people and not the object of their plots, not preserving his sovereignty by means of alien military force, but protected, as by a bodyguard, by the goodwill of the citizens, by virtue of his authority ruling as a king, but by his benefactions as a popular leader, for so equitably and so well did he administer the city that even to this day traces of his clemency may be seen remaining in our institutions. As for Helen, daughter of Zeus, established her power over such excellence and sobriety, should she not be praised and honoured, and regarded as far superior to all the women who have ever lived. For surely we shall never have a more trustworthy witness or more competent judge of Helen's good attributes than the opinion of Theseus. But lest I seem through poverty of ideas to be dwelling unduly upon the same theme and by misusing the glory of one man to be praising Helen, I wish now to review the subsequent events also. After the descent of Theseus to Hades, when Helen returned to Lacedaemon, and was now of marriageable age, all the kings and potentates of that time formed of her the same opinion, for although it was possible for them in their own cities to wed women of the first rank, they disdained wedlock at home and went to Sparta to woo Helen. And before it had yet been decided who was to be her husband and all her suitors still had an equal chance, it was so evident to all that Helen would be the object of armed contention that they met together and exchanged solemn pledges of assistance if anyone should attempt to take her away from him who had been adjudged worthy of winning her, for each thought he was providing this alliance for himself. In this their private hope all, it is true, save one man, were disappointed, yet in the general opinion which all had formed concerning her no one was mistaken. For not much later when strife arose among the goddesses for the prize of beauty. And Alexander, son of Priam, was appointed judge and when Hera offered him sovereignty over all Asia, Athena victory in war, and Aphrodite Helen as his wife, finding himself unable to make a distinction regarding the charms of their persons, but overwhelmed by the sight of the goddesses, Alexander, compelled to make a choice of their proffered gifts, chose living with Helen before all else. In so doing he did not look to its pleasures although even this is thought by the wise to be preferable to many things, but nevertheless it was not this he strove for, but because he was eager to become a son of Zeus by marriage, considering this a much greater and more glorious honour than sovereignty over Asia, and thinking that while great dominions and sovereignties fall at times even to quite ordinary men, no man would ever in all time to come be considered worthy of such a woman, and furthermore, that he could leave no more glorious heritage to his children than by seeing to it that they should be descendants of Zeus. Not only on their father's side, but also on their mother's. For he knew that while other blessings bestowed by fortune soon change hands, nobility of birth abides forever with the same possessors, therefore he foresaw that this choice would be to the advantage of all his race, whereas the other gifts would be enjoyed for the duration of his own life only. No sensible person surely could find fault with this reasoning, but some, who have not taken into consideration the antecedent events but look at the sequel alone, have before now reviled Alexander, but the folly of these accusers is easily discerned by all from the calumnies they have uttered. Are they not in a ridiculous state of mind if they think their own judgment is more competent than that which the gods chose as best? For surely they did not select any ordinary arbiter to decide a dispute about an issue that had got them into so fierce a quarrel but obviously they were as anxious to select the most competent judge as they were concerned about the matter itself. 
there is need. Moreover, to consider his real worth and to judge him, not by the resentment of those who were defeated for the prize, but by the reasons which caused the goddesses unanimously to choose his judgment. For nothing prevents even innocent persons from being ill-treated by the stronger, but only a mortal man of greatly superior intelligence could have received such honour as to become a judge of immortals. I am astonished that anyone should think that Alexander was ill-advised in choosing to live with Helen, for whom many demigods were willing to die. Would he not have been a fool if, knowing that the deities themselves were contending for the prize of beauty, he had himself scorned beauty, and had failed to regard as the greatest of gifts that for the possession of which he saw even those goddesses most earnestly striving? What man would have rejected marriage with Helen, at whose abduction the Greeks were as incensed as if all Greece had been laid waste? While the barbarians were as filled with pride as if they had conquered us all. It is clear how each party felt about the matter. For although there had been many causes of contention between them before, none of these disturbed their peace, whereas for her they waged so great a war, not only the greatest of all wars in the violence of its passions, but also in the duration of the struggle and in the extent of the preparations the greatest of all time. And although the Trojans might have rid themselves of the misfortunes which encompassed them by surrendering Helen, and the Greeks might have lived in peace for all time by being indifferent to her fate, neither so wished, on the contrary, the Trojans allowed their cities to be laid waste and their land to be ravaged, so as to avoid yielding Helen to the Greeks, and the Greeks chose rather. Remaining in a foreign land to grow old there and never to see their own again, than, leaving her behind, to return to their fatherland. And they were not acting in this way as eager champions of Alexander or of Menelaus. Nay, the Trojans were upholding the cause of Asia, the Greeks of Europe, in the belief that the land in which Helen in person resided would be the more favoured of fortune. So great a passion for the hardships of that expedition and for participation in it took possession not only of the Greeks and the barbarians, but also of the gods, that they did not dissuade even their own children from joining in the struggles around Troy, Zeus, though foreseeing the fate of Sarpedon, and Eos that of Memnon, and Poseidon that of Sickness, and the Tees that of Achilles, nevertheless they all urged them on and sent them forth, thinking it more honourable for them to die. Fighting for the daughter of Zeus than to live without having taken part in the perils undergone on her account. And why should we be astonished that the gods felt thus concerning their children? For they themselves engaged in a far greater and more terrible struggle than when they fought the giants. For against those enemies they had fought a battle in concert. But for Helen they fought a war against one another. With good reason in truth they came to this decision, and I, for my part, am justified in employing extravagant language in speaking of Helen, for beauty she possessed in the highest degree, and beauty is of all things the most venerated, the most precious, and the most divine. And it is easy to determine its power, for while many things which do not have any attributes of courage, wisdom, or justice will be seen to be more highly valued than any one of these attributes, yet of those things which lack beauty we shall find not one that is beloved, on the contrary, all are despised, except in so far as they possess in some degree this outward form, beauty, and it is for this reason that virtue is most highly esteemed, because it is the most beautiful of ways of living. And we may learn how superior beauty is to all other things by observing how we ourselves are affected by each of them severally. For in regard to the other things which we need, we only wish to possess them and our heart's desire is set on nothing further than this, for beautiful things, however, we have an inborn passion whose strength of desire corresponds to the superiority of the thing sought. And while we are jealous of those who excel us in intelligence or in anything else, unless they win us over by daily benefactions and compel us to be fond of them, yet at first sight we become well disposed toward those who possess beauty, and to these alone as to the gods we do not fail in our homage, on the contrary, we submit more willingly to be the slaves of such than to rule all others, and we are more grateful to them when they impose many tasks upon us than to those who demand. Nothing at all. We revile those who fall under the power of anything other than beauty and call them flatterers, but those who are subservient to beauty we regard as lovers of beauty and lovers of service. So strong are our feelings of reverence and solicitude for such a quality, that we hold in greater dishonour those of its possessors who have trafficked in it and ill-used their own youth than those who do violence to the persons of others, whereas those who guard their youthful beauty as a holy shrine, inaccessible to the base, are honoured by us for all time equally with those who have benefited the city as a whole. But why need I waste time in citing the opinions of men? Nay, Zeus, Lord of all, reveals his power in all else, but deigns to approach beauty in humble guise. 
for in the likeness of Amphitryon he came to Alcmena, and as a shower of gold he united with Danae, and in the guise of a swan he took refuge in the bosom of Nemesis, and again in this form he espoused Leda, ever with artifice manifestly, and not with violence. Does he pursue beauty in women? And so much greater honour is paid to beauty among the gods than among us that they pardon their own wives when they are vanquished by it, and one could cite many instances of goddesses who succumb to mortal beauty, and no one of these sought to keep the fact concealed as if it involved disgrace, on the contrary, they desired their adventures to be celebrated in song as glorious deeds rather than to be hushed in silence. The greatest proof of my statements is this, we shall find that more mortals have been made immortal because of their beauty than for all other excellences. All these personages Helen surpassed in proportion as she excelled them in the beauty of her person. For not only did she attain immortality but, having one power equaling that of a god, she first raised to divine station her brothers, who were already in the grip of fate, and wishing to make their transformation believed by men. She gave to them honours so manifest that they have power to save when they are seen by sailors in peril on the sea. If they but piously invoke them. After this she so amply recompensed Menelaus for the toils and perils which he had undergone because of her, that when all the race of the Pelopidae had perished and were the victims of irremediable disasters, not only did she free him from these misfortunes but, having made him god instead of mortal, she established him as partner of her house and sharer of her throne, throne forever. And I can produce the city of the Spartans, which preserves with especial care its ancient traditions, as witness for the fact, for even to the present day at Therapne in Laconia the people offer holy and traditional sacrifices to them both, not as to heroes, but as to gods. And she displayed her own power to the poet Stesichorus also, for when, at the beginning of his ode, he spoke in disparagement of her, he arose deprived of his sight, but when he recognized the cause of his misfortune and composed the recantation, as it is called, she restored to him his normal sight. And some of the Homeridae also relate that Helen appeared to Homer by night and commanded him to compose a poem on those who went on the expedition to Troy, since she wished to make their death more to be envied than the life of the rest of mankind, and they say that while it is partly because of Homer's art. Yet it is chiefly through her that this poem has such charm and has become so famous among all men. Since, then, Helen has power to punish as well as to reward, it is the duty of those who have great wealth to propitiate and to honour her with thank-offerings, sacrifices, and processions, and philosophers should endeavour to speak of her in a manner worthy of her merits, for such are the first fruits it is fitting that men of cultivation should offer. Far more has been passed over than has been said. Apart from the arts and philosophic studies and all the other benefits which one might attribute to her and to the Trojan War, we should be justified in considering that it is owing to Helen that we are not the slaves of the barbarians. For we shall find that it was because of her that the Greeks became united in harmonious accord and organized a common expedition against the barbarians, and that it was then for the first time that Europe set up a trophy of victory over Asia, and in consequence, we experienced a change so great that, Although in former times any barbarians who were in misfortune presumed to be rulers over the Greek cities for example. Danus, an exile from Egypt, occupied Argos, Cadmus of Sidon became king of Thebes, the Carians colonized the islands, and Pelops, son of Tantalus, became master of all the Peloponnese, yet after that war our race expanded so greatly that it took from the barbarians great cities and much territory. If, therefore, any orators wish to dilate upon these matters and dwell upon them, they will not be at a loss for material apart from what I have said, wherewith to praise Helen, on the contrary, they will discover many new arguments that relate to her. Bus Iris. I have learned of your fair-mindedness, Polycrates, and of the reversal in your life, through information from others, and having myself read certain of the discourses which you have written, I should have been greatly pleased to discuss frankly with you and fully the education with which you have been obliged to occupy yourself. For I believe that when men through no fault of their own are unfortunate and so seek in philosophy a source of gain, it is the duty of all who have had a wider experience in that occupation, and have become more thoroughly versed in it, to make this contribution voluntarily for their benefit. But since we have not yet met one another, we shall be able, if we ever do come together, to discuss the other topics at greater length, concerning those suggestions, however, by which at the present time I might be of service to you, I have thought I should advise you by letter, though concealing my views, to the best of my ability. From everyone else. I am well aware, however, that it is instinctive with most persons when admonished, not to look to the benefits they receive but, on the contrary, to listen to what is said with the greater displeasure in proportion to the rigour with which their critic passes their faults in review. 
Nevertheless, those who are well disposed toward any persons must not shrink from incurring such resentment, but must try to effect a change in the opinion of those who feel this way toward those who offer them counsel. Having observed, therefore, that you take especial pride in your defense of Busiris and in your accusation of Socrates, I shall try to make it clear to you that in both these discourses you have fallen far short of what the subject demands. For although everyone knows that those who wish to praise a person must attribute to him a larger number of good qualities than he really possesses, and accusers must do the contrary. You have so far fallen short of following these principles of rhetoric that, though you profess to defend Busiris, you have not only failed to absolve him of the calumny with which he is attacked, but have even imputed to him a lawlessness of such enormity that it is impossible for one to invent wickedness more atrocious. For the other writers whose aim was to malign him went only so far in their abuse as to charge him with sacrificing the strangers who came to his country. You, however, accused him of actually devouring his victims. And when your purpose was to accuse Socrates, as if you wished to praise him, you gave Alcibiades to him as a pupil who, as far as anybody observed, never was taught by Socrates, but that Alcibiades far excelled all his contemporaries all would agree. Hence, if the dead should acquire the power of judging what has been said of them, Socrates would be as grateful to you for your accusation as to any who have been wont to eulogize him, while Busiris, even if he had been most tender-hearted toward his guests, would be so enraged by your account of him that he would abstain from no vengeance whatever. And yet ought not that man to feel shame, rather than pride, who is more loved by those whom he has reviled than by those whom he has praised. And you have been so careless about committing inconsistencies that you say Busiris emulated the fame of Aeolus and Orpheus. Yet you do not show that any of his pursuits was identical with theirs. What, can we compare his deeds with the reported exploits of Aeolus? But Aeolus restored to their native land strangers who were cast on his shores, whereas Busiris, if we are to give credence to your account, sacrificed and ate them. Or, are we to liken his deeds to those of Orpheus? But Orpheus led the dead back from Hades, whereas Busiris brought death to the living before their day of destiny. Consequently, I should be glad to know what, in truth, Busiris would have done if he had happened to despise Aeolus and Orpheus. Seeing that, while admiring their virtues, all his own deeds are manifestly the opposite of theirs. But the greatest absurdity is this though you have made a specialty of genealogies, you have dared to say that Busiris emulated those whose fathers even at that time had not yet been born but that I may not seem to be doing the easiest thing in assailing what others have said without exhibiting any specimen of my own, I will try briefly to expound the same subject even though it is not serious and does not call for a dignified style and show out of what element you ought to have composed the eulogy and the speech in defence. Of the noble lineage of Busiris who would not find it easy to speak. His father was Poseidon, his mother Libya the daughter of Epiphus the son of Zeus, and she, they say, was the first woman to rule as queen and to give her own name to her country. Although fortune had given him such ancestors, these alone did not satisfy his pride. But he thought he must also leave behind an everlasting monument to his own valour. He was not content with his mother's kingdom, considering it too small for one of his endowment, and when he had conquered many peoples and had acquired supreme power he established his royal seat in Egypt, because he judged that country to be far superior as his place of residence, not only to the lands which then were his, but even to all other countries in the world. For he saw that all other regions are neither seasonably nor conveniently situated in relation to the nature of the universe, but some are deluged by rains and others scorched by heat, Egypt however, having the most admirable situation of the universe, was able to produce the most abundant and most varied products, and was defended by the immortal ramparts of the Nile, a river which by its nature provides not only protection to the land, but also its means of subsistence in abundance. Being impregnable and difficult for foes to conquer. Yet convenient for commerce and in many respects serviceable to dwellers within its bounds. For in addition to the advantages I have mentioned, the Nile has bestowed upon the Egyptians a godlike power in respect to the cultivation of the land, for while Zeus is the dispenser of rains and droughts to the rest of mankind, of both of these each Egyptian has made himself master on his own account. And to so perfect a state of happiness have the Egyptians come that with respect to the excellence and fertility of their land and the extent of their plains they reap the fruits of a continent, and as regards the disposition of their superfluous products and the importation of what they lack, the river's possibilities are such that they inhabit an island, for the Nile, encircling the land and flowing through its whole extent, has given them abundant means for both. So Busiris thus began, as wise men should, by occupying the fairest country and also by finding sustenance sufficient for his subjects. Afterwards, 
he divided them into classes, some he appointed to priestly services. Others he turned to the arts and crafts, and others he forced to practice the arts of war. He judged that, while necessities and superfluous products must be provided by the land and the arts, the safest means of protecting these was practice in warfare and reverence for the gods. Including in all classes the right numbers for the best administration of the commonwealth, he gave orders that the same individuals should always engage in the same pursuits, because he knew that those who continually change their occupations never achieve proficiency in even a single one of their tasks, whereas those who apply themselves constantly to the same activities perform each thing they do surpassingly well. Hence we shall find that in the arts the Egyptians surpass those who work at the same skilled occupations elsewhere more than artisans in general excel the laymen, also with respect to the system which enables them to preserve royalty and their political institutions in general. They have been so successful that philosophers who undertake to discuss such topics and have won the greatest reputation prefer above all others the Egyptian form of government, and that the Lacedaemonians, on the other hand, govern their own city in admirable fashion because they imitate certain of the Egyptian customs. For instance, the provision that no citizen fit for military service could leave the country without official authorization, the meals taken in common, and the training of their bodies, furthermore, the fact that lacking none of the necessities of life, they do not neglect the edicts of the state, and that none engage in any other crafts, but that all devote themselves to arms and warfare, all these practices they have taken from Egypt but the Lacedaemonians have made so much worse use. Of these institutions that all of them, being professional soldiers, Claim the right to seize by force the property of everybody else, whereas the Egyptians live as people should who neither neglect their own possessions, nor plot how they may acquire the property of others. The difference in the aims of the two polities may be seen from the following, if we should all imitate the sloth and greed of the Lacedaemonians, we should straightway perish through both the lack of the necessities of daily life and civil war, but if we should wish to adopt the laws of the Egyptians which prescribe that some must work and that the rest must protect the property of the workers, we should all possess our own goods and pass our days in happiness. Furthermore, the cultivation of practical wisdom may also reasonably be attributed to Busiris. For example, he saw to it that from the revenues of the sacrifices the priests should acquire affluence, but self-control through the purifications prescribed by the laws. And leisure by exemption from the hazards of fighting and from all work. And the priests, because they enjoyed such conditions of life, discovered for the body the aid which the medical art affords, not that which uses dangerous drugs, but drugs of such a nature that they are as harmless as daily food, yet in their effects are so beneficial that all men agree the Egyptians are the healthiest and most long of life among men, and then for the soul they introduced philosophy's training, a pursuit which has the power, not only to establish laws, but also to investigate the nature of the universe. The older men Bus Iris appointed to have charge of the most important matters, but the younger he persuaded to forego all pleasures and devote themselves to the study of the stars, to arithmetic, and to geometry, the value of these sciences some praise for their utility in certain ways, while others attempt to demonstrate that they are conducive in the highest measure to the attainment of virtue. The piety of the Egyptians and their worship of the gods are especially deserving of praise and admiration. For all persons who have so bedizened themselves as to create the impression that they possess greater wisdom, or some other excellence, than they can rightly claim, certainly do harm to their dupes, but those persons who have so championed the cause of religion that divine rewards and punishments are made to appear more certain than they prove to be, such men, I say, benefit in the greatest measure the lives of men. For actually those who in the beginning inspired in us our fear of the gods, brought it about that we in our relations to one another are not altogether like wild beasts so great, moreover, is the piety and the solemnity with which the Egyptians deal with these matters that not only are the oaths taken in their sanctuaries more binding than is the case elsewhere. But each person believes that he will pay the penalty for his misdeeds immediately and that he will neither escape detection for the present nor will the punishment be deferred to his children's time. And they have good reason for this belief, for Bus Iris established for them numerous and varied practices of piety and ordered them by law even to worship and to revere certain animals which among us are regarded with contempt, not because he misapprehended their power, but because he thought that the crowd ought to be habituated to obedience to all the commands of those in authority, and at the same time he wished to test invisible matters how they felt in regard to the invisible. For he judged that those who belittled these instructions would perhaps look with contempt upon the more important commands also, but that those who gave strict obedience equally in everything would have given proof of their steadfast piety. If one were not determined to make haste, one might cite many admirable instances of the piety of the Egyptians, that piety which I am neither the first nor the only one to have observed, on the contrary. Many contemporaries and predecessors have remarked it.
of whom Pythagoras of Samos is one on a visit to Egypt he became a student of the religion of the people, and was first to bring to the Greeks all philosophy, and more conspicuously than others he seriously interested himself in sacrifices and in ceremonial purity, since he believed that even if he should gain thereby no greater reward from the gods. Among men, at any rate, his reputation would be greatly enhanced. And this indeed happened to him. For so greatly did he surpass all others in reputation that all the younger men desired to be his pupils, and their elders were more pleased to see their sons staying in his company than attending to their private affairs. And these reports we cannot disbelieve, for even now persons who profess to be followers of his teaching are more admired when silent than are those who have the greatest renown for eloquence. Perhaps, however, you would reply against all I have said, that I am praising the land, the laws and the piety of the Egyptians, and also their philosophy, but that Busiris was their author, as I have assumed, I am able to offer no proof whatever. If any other person criticized me in that fashion, I should believe that his censure was that of a scholar, but you are not the one to reprove me. For, when you wished to praise Busiris, you chose to say that he forced the Nile to break into branches and surround the land, and that he sacrificed and ate strangers who came to his country, but you gave no proof that he did these things. And yet is it not ridiculous to demand that others follow a procedure which you yourself have not used in the slightest degree? Nay, your account is far less credible than mine, since I attribute to him no impossible deed, but only laws and political organization, which are the accomplishments of honorable men, whereas you represent him as the author of two astounding acts which no human being would commit. One requiring the cruelty of wild beasts. The other the power of the gods. Further, even if both of us, perchance, are wrong, I, at any rate, have used only such arguments as authors of eulogies must use. You, on the contrary, have employed those which are appropriate to revilers. Consequently, it is obvious that you have gone astray, not only from the truth, but also from the entire pattern which must be employed in eulogy. Apart from these considerations, if your discourse should be put aside and mine carefully examined, no one would justly find fault with it. For if it were manifest that another had done the deeds which I assert were done by him, I acknowledge that I am exceedingly audacious in trying to change men's views about matters of which all the world has knowledge. But as it is, since the question is open to the judgment of all and one must resort to conjecture, who, reasoning from what is probable, would be considered to have a better claim to the authorship of the institutions of Egypt rather than a son of Poseidon, a descendant of Zeus on his mother's side. The most powerful personage of his time and the most renowned among all other peoples. For surely it is not fitting that any who were in all these respects inferior should, in preference to Bus Iris, have the credit of being the authors of those great benefactions. Furthermore, it could be easily proved on chronological grounds also that the statements of the detractors of Bus Iris are false. For the same writers who accuse Bus Iris of slaying strangers also assert that he died at the hands of Heracles, but all chroniclers agree that Heracles was later by four generations than Perseus, son of Zeus and Danae, and that Bus Iris lived more than two hundred years earlier than Perseus. And yet what can be more absurd than that one who was desirous of clearing Bus Iris of the calumny has failed to mention that evidence, so manifest and so conclusive? But the fact is that you had no regard for the truth, on the contrary, you followed the calumnies of the poets, who declare that the offspring of the immortals have perpetrated as well as suffered things more atrocious than any perpetrated or suffered by the offspring of the most impious of mortals, I. The poets have related about the gods themselves tales more outrageous than anyone would dare tell concerning their enemies. For not only have they imputed to them thefts and adulteries, and vassalage among men, but they have fabricated tales of the eating of children, the castrations of fathers, the fetterings of mothers, and many other crimes for these blasphemies the poets, it is true, did not pay the penalty they deserved, but assuredly they did not escape punishment altogether, some became vagabonds begging for their daily bread. Others became blind, another spent all his life in exile from his fatherland and in warring with his kinsmen, and Orpheus, who made a point of rehearsing these tales, died by being torn asunder therefore if we are wise we shall not imitate their tales, nor while passing laws for the punishment of libels against each other, shall we disregard loose-tongued vilification of the gods, on the contrary, we shall be on our guard and consider equally guilty of impiety those who recite and those who believe such lies now I, for my part, think that not only the gods but also their offspring have no share in any wickedness but themselves are by nature endowed with all the virtues and have become for all mankind guides and teachers of the most honourable conduct. For it is absurd that we should attribute to the gods the responsibility for the happy fortunes of our children, and yet believe them to be indifferent to those of their own. Nay. 
if any one of us should obtain the power of regulating human nature. He would not allow even his slaves to be vicious, yet we condemn the gods by believing that they permitted their own offspring to be so impious and lawless. And you, Polycrates, assume that you will make men better even if they are not related to you, provided that they become your pupils, yet believe that the gods have no care for the virtue of their own children. And yet, according to your own reasoning, the gods are not free from the two most disgraceful faults, for if they do not want their children to be virtuous, they are inferior in character to human beings, but if, on the other hand, they desire it but are at a loss how to effect it, they are more impotent than the sophists. Although the subject admits of many arguments for the amplification of my theme of eulogy and defence, I believe it unnecessary to speak at greater length, for my aim in this discourse is not to make a display to impress others. But to show for your benefit how each of these topics should be treated. Since the composition which you wrote may justly be considered by anyone to be, not a defence of Busiris, but an admission of all the crimes charged against him. For you do not exonerate him from the charges, but only declare that some others have done the same things, inventing thus a very easy refuge for all criminals. Why, if it is not easy to find a crime which has not yet been committed, and if we should consider that those who have been found guilty of one or another of these crimes have done nothing so very wrong, whenever others are found to have perpetrated the same offences, should we not be providing ready-made pleas in exculpation of all criminals and be granting complete licence for those who are bent on villainy? You would best perceive the inanity of your defence of Bus Iris if you should imagine yourself in his position. Just suppose this case, if you had been accused of grave and terrible crimes and an advocate should defend you in this fashion. What would be your state of mind? I know very well that you would detest him more heartily than your accusers. And yet is it not disgraceful to compose for others a plea in defence of such kind that it would arouse your extreme anger if spoken on your own behalf? Again, consider this, and meditate upon it. If one of your pupils should be induced to do those things which you praise, would he not be the most wretched of men who are now alive and, in truth, of all who ever have lived? Is it right, therefore, to compose discourses such that they will do the most good if they succeed in convincing no one among those who hear them? But perhaps you will say that you too were not unaware of all this but that you wish to bequeath to men of learning an example of how pleas in defence of shameful charges and difficult causes ought to be made. But I think it has now been made clear to you, even if you were previously in ignorance, that an accused person would sooner gain acquittal by not uttering a word than by pleading his cause in this way. And, furthermore, this too is evident. That philosophy, which is already in mortal jeopardy and is hated, will be detested even more because of such discourses. If, then, you will listen to me, you will preferably not deal in future with such base subjects, but if that cannot be, you will seek to speak of such things as will neither injure your own reputation, nor corrupt your imitators, nor bring the teaching of rhetoric into disrepute. And do not be astonished if I, who am younger than you and unrelated to you, essay so lightly to admonish you, for, in my opinion, giving good counsel on such subjects is not the function of older men or of the most intimate friends, but of those who know most and desire most to render service. Plataeacus. Since we Plataeans know, Athenians, that it is your custom not only zealously to come to the rescue of victims of injustice, but also to requite your benefactors with the utmost gratitude, we have come as suppliants to beg you not to remain indifferent to our having been driven from our homes in time of peace by the the bands. And since many peoples in the past have fled to you for protection and have obtained all they craved, we think it beseems you more than others to show solicitude for our city, for victims of a greater injustice than ourselves, or any who have been plunged into calamity so great, you could not find anywhere, nor any people who for a longer time have maintained toward your city a more loyal friendship. Furthermore, we have come here to ask you for assistance of such a kind that your granting it will involve you in no danger whatever and yet will cause all the world to regard you as the most scrupulous and most just of all the Greeks. If we did not observe that the the bands have schemed to win you over, by fair means or foul, to their contention that they have done us no wrong, we could have finished our plea in a few words. But since we have reached such a state of misfortune that we must struggle, not only against them, but also against the ablest of your orators, men whom they have hired with our resources to be their advocates, we must explain our cause at greater length. It is difficult indeed not to speak inadequately on the subject of our wrongs. For what eloquence could match our misfortunes, or what orator could adequately denounce the wrongs that the bands have done? Nevertheless, we must try to the best of our ability to make their transgressions known. 
and the chief cause of our indignation is that we are so far from being judged worthy of equality with the rest of the Greeks that, although we are at peace and although treaties exist, we not only have no share in the liberty which all the rest enjoy, but that we are not considered worthy of even a moderate condition of servitude. We therefore beg of you, citizens of Athens, that you listen to our plea in a friendly spirit, reflecting that for us the most preposterous outcome of all would be, if those who have always been hostile to your city shall have regained their freedom through your efforts, but we, even when we supplicate you, should fail to obtain the same treatment as is accorded to your greatest enemies. As for the events which have occurred in the past, I see no reason why I should speak of them at length. For who does not know that the, the bands have portioned out our land for pasturage and have raised our city to the ground? But it is with respect to their argument, by which they hope to deceive you, that we shall try to inform you. At times, you know, they attempt to maintain that they have subjected us to this treatment because we were unwilling to be members of their federation. But I ask you to consider, first, if on such grounds it is just to inflict penalties so contrary to justice and so cruel. Next, if it seems to you consistent with the dignity of the city of the Plataeans, without their consent but under compulsion, to accept such dependence under the, the bands. For my part, I consider that there exists no people more overbearing than those who blot out the cities of each of us and compel us, when we have no use for it, to participate in their form of polity. Besides this, they are clearly inconsistent in their dealings with others and with us. For when they were unable to gain our consent, they should have gone no farther than to compel us to submit to the hegemony of Thebes as they compelled Thespi and Tanagra, for in that case we should not have suffered irremediable misfortunes. But as it is, they have made it clear that it was not their intention to give us that status. On the contrary, it was our territory they coveted. I wonder to what precedent in the past they will appeal, and what conceivable interpretation of justice they will give, when they admit that they dictate to us in such matters. For if it is to our ancestral customs they look, they ought not to be ruling over our other cities, but far rather to be paying tribute to the Orchomenians, for such was the case in ancient times. And if they hold that the treaties are valid, which indeed in justice they should be, how can they avoid admitting that they are guilty of wrong and are violating them? For these treaties direct that our cities, the small as well as the large, shall all alike be autonomous. But I imagine that on the subject of the treaties they will not venture to show their impudence, but will resort to the argument that we were taking the side of the Lacedaemonians in the war and that by destroying us they have benefited the entire confederacy. In my opinion. However. No complaint and no accusation should have greater validity than the oaths and the treaties. Nevertheless, if any people are to suffer because of their alliance with the Lacedaemonians, it was not the Plataeans who, of all the Greeks, if justice were done, would have been selected, for it was not of our own free will, but under compulsion, that we were subservient to the Lacedaemonians. Why, who could believe that we had reached such a degree of folly as to have valued more highly a people who reduced our fatherland to slavery than the people who had given us a share in their own city? No indeed, but it was difficult for us to attempt a revolt when we had so small a city ourselves and the Lacedaemonians possessed power so great, and when besides a Spartan governor occupied it with a garrison, and also a large army was stationed at Thespi, of such strength that we should have been destroyed by it not only more quickly than by the the bands, but also with greater right. For it was not fitting that the the bands in time of peace should harbour a grudge against us for what happened at that time. Whereas the Lacedaemonians, if they had been betrayed by us during the war, with good reason would have punished us most severely. And I think that you are not unaware that many other Greeks, although with their bodies they were compelled to follow the Lacedaemonians, yet in sympathy they were on your side. What conclusion must we suppose that these others will reach, if they hear that the, the bands have persuaded the Athenian people that none ought to be spared who have been subject to the Lacedaemonians? For it will be clearly evident that the Thebans' argument has no other meaning, since it is no accusation against our city in particular that has led them to destroy it but, on the contrary, they will be able to bring that same charge also against those others. These are matters which demand your deliberation and concern. Lest the overbearing ways of the the bands shall reconcile those who formerly hated the rule of the Lacedaemonians and cause them to believe that the alliance with them is their own salvation. Remember also that you undertook your most recent war, not to secure the freedom of either yourselves or your allies for you all enjoyed that already, but in behalf of those who were being deprived of their autonomy in violation of the oaths and covenants. 
but surely it would be the most outrageous thing in the world, if you are going to permit these cities, which you thought ought not to be in servitude to the Lacedaemonians, now to be destroyed by the the band's men who are so far from emulating your clemency that it would have been better for us to suffer at the hands of this city that fate which is regarded as the most dreadful of all misfortunes, to be taken prisoners of war, than to have got them as neighbours, for those whose cities were taken by you by storm were straightway freed of a Spartan governor and of slavery, and now they have share in a council and in freedom, whereas, of those who live anywhere near the, the bands. Some are no less slaves than those who have been bought with money. And as for the rest, the, the bands will not stop until they have brought them to the condition in which we now are. They accuse the Lacedaemonians because they occupied the Cadmea and established garrisons in their cities, yet they themselves, not sending garrisons, but raising the walls of some and entirely destroying others, think they have committed no atrocity. Nay, they have come to such a pitch of shamelessness that while they demand that all their allies should be guardians of the safety of Thebes, yet they arrogate to themselves the right to impose slavery upon everybody else. And yet what man would not detest the greedy spirit of these the bands, who seek to rule the weaker, but think they must be on terms of equality with the stronger and who begrudge your city the territory ceded by the Europeans, yet themselves forcibly seize and portion out territory not their own? And not content with their other base misrepresentations, they now say that they pursued this course for the common good of the allies. And yet what they ought to have done, inasmuch as there is an Hellenic council here and your city is more competent than Thebes to advise prudent measures, is, not to be here now to defend the acts they have already committed. But to have come to you for consultation before they took any such action. But as it is, having now pillaged our possessions, acting alone, they have come here to give a share of their disrepute to all their allies. And that disrepute, if you are wise, you will shun, since it is far more honourable to compel them to emulate your scrupulousness than that you allow yourselves to be persuaded to share in the lawlessness of these people, whose principles are wholly alien to those of the rest of mankind. For I presume that it is clear to all that it is incumbent upon the wise, in time of war to strive in every way to get the better of the enemy, but when peace is made, to regard nothing as of greater importance than their oaths and their covenants. The, the bands, however, in the former circumstances, in all their embassies would plead the cause of freedom and independence, but now that they believe they have secured license for themselves, disregarding everything else. They have the effrontery to speak in defence of their private gain and of their own acts of violence. And they assert that it is to the advantage of their allies that the, the bands should have our country fools that they are, not to know that no advantage ever accrues to those who unjustly seek greedy gain, on the contrary, many a people that have unjustly coveted the territory of others have with justice brought into the greatest jeopardy their own. But one thing that the bands will not be able to say that they remain loyal to their associates, though there is reason to fear that we, having recovered our country, will desert to the Lacedaemonians, for you will find, Athenians, that we have twice been besieged and forced to surrender because of our friendship for you, while the, the bands often have wronged this city. It would be a laborious task to recount their treacheries in the past, but when the Corinthian war broke out because of their overbearing conduct and the Lacedaemonians had marched against them, although the, the bands had been saved by you. They were so far from showing their gratitude for this service that, when you had put an end to the war, they abandoned you and entered into the alliance with the Lacedaemonians. The people of Chios, of Mytilene, and of Byzantium remained loyal, but the, the bands, although they dwelt in a city of such importance, did not have the fortitude even to remain neutral, but were guilty of such cowardice and baseness as to give their solemn oath to join the Lacedaemonians in attacking you, the saviors of their city. For this they were punished by the gods, and, after the Cadmea was captured, they were forced to take refuge here in Athens. By this they furnished the crowning proof of their perfidy, for when they had again been saved by your power and were restored to their city, they did not remain faithful for a single instant, but immediately sent ambassadors to Lacedaemon, showing themselves ready to be slaves and to alter in no respect their former agreement with Sparta. Why need I speak at greater length? For if the Lacedaemonians had not ordered them to take back their exiles and exclude the murderers, nothing would have hindered them from taking the field as allies of those who had injured them, against you their benefactors. And these the bands, who have recently behaved in such fashion toward your city and in times past have been guilty of betraying Greece as a whole, have seen fit to demand for themselves forgiveness for their evil deeds willingly committed and so monstrous. Yet to us, for acts done under compulsion, they think no mercy ought to be shown, but they, true the bands as they are, have the effrontery to reproach others for siding with the Lacedaemonians, when they, as we all know, have for the longest time been in servitude to them and have fought more zealously for Spartan domination than for their own security. 
In what invasion into your country of all that have ever been made have they failed to take part? Who, more consistently than they, have been your enemies and ill wishers? In the Decelian War were they not authors of more mischief than the other invaders? When misfortune befell you, did not they alone of the Allies vote that your city should be reduced to slavery and its territory be abandoned to pasturage as was the plain of Crissa, so that if the Lacedaemonians had been of the same opinion as the the bands, there would have been nothing to prevent the authors of the salvation of all the Greeks from being themselves enslaved by the Greeks and from plunging into the most grievous misfortunes. And yet what benefaction of their own could they adduce great enough to wipe? Out the hatred caused by these wrongs which you would justly feel toward them? Accordingly, to these the bands no plea is left, such is the magnitude of their crimes, and to those who wish to speak on their behalf only this that Boeotia is now fighting in defence of your country, and that, if you put an end to your friendship with them, you will be acting to the detriment of your allies, for it will be a matter of great consequence if the city of Thebes takes the side of the Lacedaemonians. My opinion is, however, that it is neither profitable to the allies that the weaker should be in servitude to the stronger in past times, in fact, we went to war to protect the weak, nor that the the bands will be so mad as to desert the alliance and hand over their city to the Lacedaemonians, this is not because I have confidence in the character of the the bands, but because I know that they are well aware that one of two fates necessarily awaits them either resisting. To die and to suffer such cruelties as they have inflicted or else, going into exile, to be in want and deprived of all their hopes. Well then, are their relations with their fellow citizens agreeable, some of whom they have put to death and others they have banished and robbed of their property? Or are they on friendly terms with the other Boeotians, whom they not only attempt to rule without warrant of justice, but have also in some instances raised their walls and have dispossessed others of their territory? But assuredly they cannot again take refuge in your city either, Athenians, the city which they will be discovered to have so consistently betrayed. It is inconceivable, therefore, that they will care to get into a quarrel with you over an alien city and on that account so rashly and so inevitably to lose their own, on the contrary, in all their dealings with you they will behave in much more seemly fashion, and the more they fear for themselves the more they will cultivate your friendship. Indeed they have proved to you how people of such character should be treated by their conduct in the matter of Oropus. For when they hoped that they would have licensed to do as they pleased they did not treat you as allies, but as ruthlessly wronged you as they would have dared to act against their deadliest enemies. But as soon as you in requital voted to exclude them from the peace, they left off their arrogance and came to you in more humble mood than we Plataeans are in now. If, then, some of their orators seek to frighten you, arguing that there is danger of the Thebans changing sides and going over to the enemy, you must not credit what they say, for they are constrained by compulsion so peremptory that they would much sooner submit to your government than tolerate the alliance with the Lacedaemonians. But even if they were likely to act altogether otherwise, not even then, in my opinion, does it become you to have greater regard for the city of the the bands than for your oaths and treaties, when you remember, first, that it is your ancient tradition to fear, not dangers but acts of infamy additiona. Next, that it usually happens that victory in war is not for those who destroy cities by violence, but for those who govern Greece in a more scrupulous and clement manner. And this could be proved by numerous instances, but as for those which have occurred in our own time at any rate. Who does not know that the Lacedaemonians shattered your power, which was thought to be irresistible although at first they possessed slight resources for the war waged at sea, but they won the Greeks over to their side because of that general belief and that you in turn took the leadership away from them, although you depended on a city without walls and in evil plight, but possessed justice as your ally. And that the Persian king was not responsible for this outcome recent years have clearly shown, for when he stood aloof from the conflict, and your situation was desperate, and when almost all the cities were in servitude to the Lacedaemonians, nevertheless you were so superior to them in the war that they were glad to see the conclusion of peace. Let no one of you, then, be afraid, if justice is with him, to take such dangers upon himself, nor think that allies will be lacking, if you are willing to aid all who are victims of wrong, and not that the bands alone. If you now cast your vote against them, you will cause many to desire your friendship. For if you show yourselves ready to war upon all alike in defense of the treaties, who will be so insane as to prefer to join those who try to enslave them to be in company with you who are fighting for their freedom? But if you are not so minded, what reason will you give, if war breaks out again, to justify your demand that the Greeks should join you, if you hold out to them independence and then grant to the, the bands to destroy any city they desire? How can you avoid the charge of acting with inconsistency if, while you do not prevent the the bands from violating their oaths and treaties, yet you pretend that you are making war on the Lacedaemonians on behalf of the same obligations?
or again, if you abandoned your own possessions in your desire to strengthen the alliance as much as possible, yet are about to permit the, the bands to keep the territory of others and act in such fashion as to injure your reputation with all the world? But this would be the crowning outrage if you have determined to stand by those who have been the constant allies of the Lacedaemonians. When the Lacedaemonians demand of them an action which violates the treaty, and yet shall permit us, who have been your allies for the longest time, and were subservient to the Lacedaemonians under compulsion in the last war only, to become for that reason the most miserable of all mankind. For who could be found to be more unhappy than we are who, in one day deprived of our city, our lands, and our possessions, and being destitute of all necessities alike, have become wanderers and beggars, not knowing whither to turn and, whatever our habitation, finding no happiness there. For if we fall in with the unfortunate, we grieve that we must be compelled, in addition to our own ills, to share in the ills of others, and if we encounter those who fare well, our lot is even harder to bear, not because we envy them their prosperity, but because amid the blessings of our neighbours we see more clearly our own miseries miseries so great that we spend no day without tears. But spend all our time mourning the loss of our fatherland and bewailing the change in our fortunes. What, think you, is our state of mind when we see our own parents unworthily cared for in their old age, and our children, instead of being educated as we had hoped when we begat them, often because of petty debts reduced to slavery, others working for hire, and the rest procuring their daily livelihood as best each one can, in a manner that accords with neither the deeds of their ancestors, nor their own youth, nor our own self-respect. But our greatest anguish of all is when one sees separated from each other, not only citizens from citizens, but also wives from husbands, daughters from mothers, and every tie of kinship severed, and this has befallen many of our fellow citizens because of poverty. For the destruction of our communal life has compelled each of us to cherish hopes for himself alone. I presume that you yourselves are not ignorant of the other causes of shame that poverty and exile bring in their train. And although we in our hearts bear these with greater difficulty than all the rest, Yet we forbear to speak of them since we are ashamed to enumerate one by one our own misfortunes. All these things we ask you to bear in mind and to take some measure of consideration for us. For indeed we are not aliens to you, on the contrary, all of us are akin to you in our loyalty and most of us in blood also, for by the right of intermarriage granted to us we are born of mothers who were of your city. You cannot, therefore, be indifferent to the pleas we have come to make. For it would be the cruelest blow of all, if you, having long ago bestowed upon us the right of a common citizenship with yourselves, should now decide not even to restore to us our own. Furthermore, it is not reasonable that, while every individual who is the victim of injustice receives pity at your hands, yet an entire city so lawlessly destroyed should be unable in the slightest degree to win commiseration from you, especially when it has taken refuge with you who in former times incurred neither shame nor infamy when you showed pity for suppliants. For when the Argives came to your ancestors and implored them to take up for burial the bodies of the dead at the foot of the Cadmea, your forefathers yielded to their persuasion and compelled the bands to adopt measures more conformable to our usage, and thus not only gained renown for themselves in those times, but also bequeathed to your city a glory never to be forgotten for all time to come, and this glory it would be unworthy of you to betray. For it is disgraceful that you should pride yourselves on the glorious deeds of your ancestors and then be found acting concerning your suppliants in a manner the very opposite of theirs. And yet the entreaties that we have come here to make are of far more weight and are more just, for the Argives came to you as suppliants after they had invaded an alien territory, whereas we have come after having lost our own, they called upon you to take up the bodies of their dead, but we do it for the rescue of the survivors. But it is not an equal or even similar evil that the dead should be denied burial and that the living should be despoiled of their fatherland and all their goods besides, nay. In the former case it is a greater disgrace for those who prevent the burial than for those who suffer the misfortune, but in the latter, to have no refuge, to be without a fatherland, daily to suffer hardships and to watch without having the power to succour the suffering of one's own, why need I say how far this has exceeded all other calamities? For these reasons we supplicate you one and all, Athenians, to restore to us our land and city, reminding the older men among you how piteous a thing it is that men of their age should be seen in misfortune and in lack of their daily bread, and the younger men we beg and implore to succour their equals in age and not to let them suffer still more evils than those I have described. Alone of the Greeks you Athenians owe us this contribution of succour, to rescue us now that we have been driven from our homes. It is a just request, for our ancestors, we are told, when in the Persian war your fathers had abandoned this land. Alone of those who lived outside of the Peloponnesus shared in their perils and thus helped them to save their city. 
it is but just, therefore, that we should receive in return the same benefaction which we first conferred upon you. If, however, you have determined to have no regard for our persons, yet it is not in your interest to let our country at any rate be ravaged, a country in which are left the most solemn memorials of your own valour and of that of all the others who fought at your side. For while all other trophies have been erected by one city victorious over another, those were in commemoration of the victory of all Greece pitted against all the power of Asia. Although the, the bands have good reason for destroying these trophies, since memorials of the events of that time bring shame to them, yet it is proper that you should preserve them, for the deeds done there gave you the leadership of the Greeks. And it is right that you should remember both the gods and the heroes who haunt that place and not permit the honours due them to be suppressed. For it was after favourable sacrifice to them that you took upon yourselves a battle so decisive that it established the freedom of both the, the bands and all the other Greeks besides. You must also take some thought of your ancestors and not be negligent of the piety due to them. Pray what would be their feelings if we may assume that the dead yonder possess any perception of what takes place here if they should perceive that, although you are masters, those who saw fit to be the slaves of barbarians had become despots over all the other Greeks and that we, who fought at your side for freedom, alone of the Greeks, have been driven from our homes, and that the graves of their companions in peril do not receive the customary funereal offerings through the lack of those to bring them, and that the the bands, who were drawn up in battle array with the enemy, hold sway over that land? Remember. 2. That you used to bring bitter reproach against the Lacedaemonians because, to gratify the the bands who were the betrayers of Greece, they destroyed us, its benefactors. Do not, therefore, allow your city to incur these foul accusations and do not prefer the insolence of the the bands to your own fair fame. Although many things remain to be said which might induce you to have greater regard for our safety, I cannot include them all in my discourse, but it is proper that you yourselves, having not only observed all that I have passed over but also having recalled especially your oaths and your treaties, and then our devotion to you and the hostility of the, the bands, should give a righteous judgment in our cause. Concerning the team of horses so then, Concerning the team of horses that my father was in possession of them, not by having taken them away from Tasia's, but by having purchased them from the Argive state you have heard both the Argive ambassadors and the others conversant with the facts testify. But in just this same fashion all are accustomed maliciously to accuse me. For they obtain leave to bring actions against me on private complaints, but make their accusations on behalf of the interests of the state, and they spend more time in slandering my father than they do in informing you with respect to their sworn charges, and so great is their contempt of the law that they claim personal satisfaction from me for the wrongs which, as they say, you suffered at my father's hands. But it is my opinion that charges involving the public interest have nothing to do with private suits, but as Tasia's often reproaches me with my father's banishment. And is more zealous concerning your affairs than he is regarding his own. I must address my defence to these matters. Certainly I should be ashamed, if I were to seem to any of my fellow citizens to have less concern for my father's good name than for my own peril. Now so far as the older men are concerned, a brief statement could have sufficed, for they all know that the same men were responsible for the destruction of the democracy and for my father's exile, but for the benefit of the younger men, who have lived after the events and have often heard the slanderers, I will begin my exposition from an earlier time. Now the persons who first plotted against the democracy and established the 400, Inasmuk as my father, although he was repeatedly invited to join them would not do so, seeing that he was a vigorous opponent of their activities and a loyal supporter of the people, judged that they were powerless to upset the established order until he was removed out of their way. And since they knew that in matters pertaining to the gods the city would be most enraged if any man should be shown to be violating the mysteries and that in other matters if any man should dare to attempt the overthrow of the democracy, they combined both these charges and tried to bring an action of impeachment before the Senate. They asserted that my father was holding meetings of his political club with a view to revolution, and that these members of the club, when dining together in the house of Pulition, had given a performance of the mysteries. The city was greatly excited by reason of the gravity of the charges, and a meeting of the assembly was hastily called at which my father so clearly proved that the accusers were lying that the people would have been glad to punish them, and furthermore elected him general for the Sicilian expedition. Thereupon he sailed away, judging that he had been already cleared of their calumnies, but his accusers, having united the council and having made the public speakers subservient to themselves, again revived the matter and suborned informers. Why need I say more? They did not cease until they had recalled my father from the expedition and had put to death some of his friends and had banished others from the city. 
but when he had learned the power of his enemies and the misfortunes of his friends, although he was of opinion that he was being grossly wrong because they would not try him when he was in Athens but were for condemning him in his absence. Not even in these circumstances did my father see fit to desert to the enemy. On the contrary, even in exile he was so scrupulous to avoid injuring his city that he went to Argos and remained quietly there. But his enemies reached such a pitch of insolence that they persuaded you to banish him from Greece entirely, to inscribe his name on a column as a traitor, and to send envoys to demand his surrender by the Argives. And he, being at a loss to know what to do in the misfortunes which encompassed him and everywhere hemmed him in, as he saw no other means of safety, was compelled at last to take refuge with the Lacedaemonians. These are the actual facts, but such an excess of insolence have my father's enemies that they accuse him, who was exiled in so illegal a manner as if he had committed outrageous crimes, and try to ruin his reputation by saying that he caused the fortification of Decelia, and the revolt of the islands, and that he became the enemy's counsellor. And sometimes they pretend to despise him, saying that in no respect did he excel his contemporaries. Yet at the present time they blame him for all that has happened and say that the Lacedaemonians have learned from him the art of war they who can teach the rest of the world this accomplishment. As for me, if I had sufficient time, I could easily prove that some of those things he did justly, but that others are unjustly imputed to him. Yet the most shocking thing that could happen would be this if, while after his exile my father was recompensed, I, because he was exiled, should be penalized. I think, however, that in justice he should obtain from you a full pardon, for you, when banished by the thirty tyrants, experienced the same misfortunes as he. Wherefore you should reflect how each of you was affected, what thoughts you each had, and what peril each would not have undergone so as to bring his own banishment to an end and to return to his native land, and to be avenged on those who banished him. To what city, or friend, or stranger did you not apply, to entreat them to help you to get back to your country? From what effort did you abstain in your endeavours to be restored? Did you not seize the Piraeus and destroy the crops in the fields and harry the land and set fire to the suburbs and finally assault the walls? And so vehemently did you believe that these actions were justifiable that you were more indignant with those of your fellow exiles who were inactive than with those who had been the authors of your misfortunes. It is not fair. Therefore, for, to censure those who wanted the same things which you desired, nor yet to regard all those men as base who, when they were exiles, sought to return, but much more should you condemn those oligarchs who, remaining in Athens, did deeds which deserved the penalty of exile, nor is it fair that you, in judging what sort of citizen my father was, should begin at the time when he had no art in the city's affairs, on the contrary, you should look to that earlier time and observe how he served the people before his exile, and called to mind that with two hundred heavy-armed soldiers he caused the most powerful cities in the Peloponnesus to revolt from the Lacedaemonians, and brought them into alliance with you, and in what perils he involved the Lacedaemonians themselves, and how he behaved as general in Sicily. For these services he is deserving of your gratitude. But for that which happened when he was in misfortune it is those who banished him whom you would justly hold responsible. Remember, too, I beg you, the many benefits he conferred upon the city after his return from exile, and, even before that time, the state of affairs here when you received him back, the democracy had been overthrown, the citizens were in a state of civil war, the army was disaffected toward the government established here, and both parties had reached such a state of madness that neither had any hope of salvation. For the one party regarded those who were in possession of the city as greater enemies than the Lacedaemonians and the other were making overtures to the Spartan forces in Decelia, judging that it was preferable to hand over their country to its enemies rather than to give a share in the rights of citizenship to those who were fighting for the city. Such was the state of mind of the citizens, the enemy was in control of land and sea. Your financial resources were exhausted. While the Persian king was supplying them with funds, furthermore, ninety ships had come from Phoenicia to Aspendus and were prepared to aid the Lacedaemonians. By so many misfortunes and such perils was the city beset when the army summoned my father, and he did not treat them with disdain in their plight, nor did he rebuke them for the past, nor did he deliberate about the future, on the contrary, he chose at once to suffer any misfortune with his country rather than to enjoy prosperity with the Lacedaemonians and he made it manifest to all that he was warring on those who had banished him and not on you, and that his heart was set on a return to Athens and not on her ruin. Having thrown in his lot with you, he persuaded Tissaphernes not to furnish the Lacedaemonians with money, checked the defection of your allies, distributed pay from his own resources to the soldiers, restored political power to the people, reconciled the citizens, and turned back the Phoenician fleet. 
As to his later services, it would be an arduous task to enumerate them one by one all the ships of war that he subsequently captured, or the battles that he won, or the cities he took by storm or by persuasion made your friends. But although innumerable dangers beset the city at that time, never did the enemy erect a trophy of victory over you while my father was your leader. I am aware that I am omitting many of my father's exploits as your general, I have not recounted them in detail because nearly all of you recall the facts. But my father's private life they revile with excessive indecency and audacity, and they are not ashamed, now that he is dead, to use a license of speech concerning him which they would have feared to employ while he lived. Nay, they have come to such a pitch of folly that they think they will win repute with both you and with the world at large if they indulge in the wildest possible abuse of him. As if all did not know that it is in the power of the vilest of men to abuse with insulting words. Not only the best of men, but even the gods. Perhaps it is foolish for me to take to heart all that has been said, nevertheless, I desire very much to recount to you my father's private pursuits, going back a little to make mention of his ancestors, that you may know that from early times our standing and services have been the greatest and most honourable among the citizens of Athens. My father on the male side belonged to the Eupatrids, whose noble birth is apparent from the very name. On the female side he was of the Alcmionidae, who left behind a glorious memorial of their wealth, for Alcmion was the first Athenian to win at Olympia with a team of horses, and the goodwill which they had toward the people they displayed in the time of the tyrants. For they were kinsmen of Pisistratus and before he came to power were closest to him of all the citizens, but they refused to share his tyranny, on the contrary. They preferred exile rather than to see their fellow citizens enslaved. And during the forty years of civic discord the Alcmionidae were hated so much more bitterly than all other Athenians by the tyrants that whenever the tyrants had the upper hand they not only raised their dwellings, but even dug up their tombs, and so completely were the Alcmionidae trusted by their fellow exiles that they continued during all that time to be leaders of the people. At last, Alcibiades and Cleisthenes the former my great-grandfather on my father's side, the latter my father's maternal great-grandfather assuming the leadership of those in exile, restored the people to their country. And drove out the tyrants. And they established that democratic form of government which so effectively trained the citizens in bravery that single-handed they conquered in battle the barbarians who had attacked all Greece and they won so great renown for justice that the Greeks voluntarily put in their hands the dominion of the sea and they made Athens so great in her power and her other resources that those who allege that she is the capital of Greece and habitually apply to her similar exaggerated expressions appear to be speaking the truth. Now this friendship with the people, which was, as I have shown, so ancient, genuine, and based upon services of the greatest importance, my father inherited from his ancestors. My father himself was left an orphan for his father died in battle at Caronia and became the ward of Pericles, whom all would acknowledge to have been the most moderate, the most just, and the wisest of the citizens. For I count this also among his blessings that, being of such origin, he was fostered, reared, and educated under the guardianship of a man of such character. When he was admitted to citizenship, he showed himself not inferior to those whom I have mentioned, nor did he think it fitting that he should lead a life of ease, pluming himself upon the brave deeds of his ancestors, on the contrary, from the beginning he was so fired with ambition that he thought that even their great deeds should be held in remembrance through his own. And first of all, when Formio led a thousand of the flower of Athenian soldiers to Thrace, my father served with this expedition, and so distinguished himself in the perilous actions of the campaign that he was crowned and received a full suit of armour from his general. Really what is required of the man who is thought worthy of the highest praise? Should he not, when serving with the bravest of the citizens, be thought worthy of the prize of valour? And when leading an army against the best of the Greeks in all the battles show his superiority to them? My father! Then, in his youth did win that prize of valour and in later life did achieve the latter. After this he married my mother, and I believe that in her he also won a glorious prize of valour. For her father was Hipponicus, first in wealth of all the Greeks and second in birth to none of the citizens, most honoured and admired of his contemporaries. The richest dowry and fairest reputation went with his daughter's hand, and although all coveted union with her, and only the greatest thought themselves worthy, it was my father whom Hipponicus chose from among them all and desired to make his son-in-law. About the same time my father, seeing that the festival assembly at Olympia was beloved and admired by the whole world and that in it the Greeks made display of their wealth, strength of body, and training, and that not only the athletes were the objects of envy but that also the cities of the victors became renowned. And believing moreover that while the public services performed in Athens redound to the prestige 
In the eyes of his fellow citizens, of the person who renders them, expenditures in the Olympian festival, however, enhance the city's reputation throughout all Greece, reflecting upon these things, I say, although in natural gifts and in strength of body he was inferior to none, he disdained the gymnastic contests, for he knew that some of the athletes were of low birth, inhabitants of petty states, and of mean education, but turned to the breeding of racehorses, which is possible only for those most blessed by fortune and not to be pursued by one of low estate, and not only did he surpass his rivals, but also all who had ever before won the victory. For he entered a larger number of teams in competition than even the mightiest cities had done, and they were of such excellence that he came out first, second, and third. Besides this, his generosity in the sacrifices and in the other expenses connected with the festival was so lavish and magnificent that the public funds of all the others were clearly less than the private means of Alcibiades alone. And when he brought his mission to an end he had caused the successes of his predecessors to seem petty in comparison with his own and those who in his own day had been victors to be no longer objects of emulation, and to future breeders of racing steeds he left behind no possibility of surpassing him. With regard to my father's services here in Athens as Chorgus and Gymnasiarch and Triarch I am ashamed to speak, for so greatly did he excel in all the other public duties that, although those who have served the state in less splendid fashion sing their own praises therefore, if anyone should on my father's behalf ask for a vote of thanks even in recognition of services as great as his, he would seem to be talking about petty things. As regards his behaviour as a citizen for neither should this be passed over in silence just as he on his part did not neglect his civic duties but on the contrary, to so great a degree had proved himself a more loyal friend of the people than those who had gained the highest repute, that while, as you will find, the other stirred up sedition for selfish advantage, he was incurring danger on your behalf. For his devotion to the democracy was not that of one who was excluded from the oligarchy, but of one who was invited to join it, indeed, time and again when it was in his power as one of a small group, not only to rule the rest, but even to dominate them, he refused, choosing rather to suffer the city's unjust penalties rather than to be traitor to our form of government. Of the truth of these statements no one would have convinced you as long as you still continued to be governed as a democracy, but as it was, the civil conflicts which arose clearly showed who were the democrats and who the oligarchs, as well as those who desired neither regime, and those who laid claim to a share in both. In these uprisings your enemies twice exiled my father, on the first occasion. No sooner had they got him out of the way than they abolished the democracy, on the second, hardly had they reduced you to servitude than they condemned him to exile before any other citizen, so exactly did my father's misfortunes affect the city and he share in her disasters. And yet many of the citizens were ill-disposed toward him in the belief that he was plotting a tyranny, they held this opinion, not on the basis of his deeds, but in the thought that all men aspire to this power and that he would have the best chance of attaining it. Wherefore you would justly feel the greater gratitude to him because, while he alone of the citizens was powerful enough to have this charge brought against him, he was of opinion that as regards political power he should be on an equality with his fellow citizens. Because of the multitude of things that might be said on my father's behalf I am at a loss which of them it is appropriate to mention on the present occasion and which should be omitted. For always the plea that has not yet been spoken seems to me of greater importance than the arguments which have already been presented to you and I believe that it is obvious to everyone that he must needs be most devoted to the welfare of the city who has the greatest share in her evil fortunes as well as in her good. Well then, when Athens was prosperous, who of the citizens was more prosperous, more admired, or more envied than my father? And when she suffered ill fortune, who was deprived of brighter hopes, or of greater wealth, or of fairer repute? Finally, when the thirty tyrants established their rule, while the others merely suffered exile from Athens, was he not banished from all Greece? Did not the Lacedaemonians and Lysander exert themselves as much to cause his death as to bring about the downfall of your dominion? In the belief that they could not be sure of the city's loyalty if they demolished her walls unless they should also destroy the man who could rebuild them? Thus it is not only from his services to you, but also from what he suffered on your account, that you may easily recognize his loyalty. For it is self-evident that it was the people he was aiding, that he desired the same form of government as yourselves, that he suffered at the hands of the same persons, that he was unfortunate when the state was unfortunate, that he considered the same persons as you his enemies and friends, that in every way he exposed himself to danger either at your hands, or on your account, or on your behalf, or in partnership with you, being as a citizen quite unlike Charicles, my opponents. Brother-in-law, who chose to be a slave to the enemy, yet claimed the right to rule his fellow citizens, who, when in exile, was inactive. But on his return was ever injuring the city. 
And yet how could one prove himself to be a baser friend or a viler enemy? And then do you, Tejas, his brother-in-law and a member of the council in the time of the thirty tyrants, have the hardihood to rake up old grudges against those of the other side, and are you not ashamed to be violating the terms of the amnesty which permits you to reside in the city, nor do you even reflect that, whenever the decision shall be made to exact punishment for past crimes, it is you who are menaced by danger more speedy and greater than mine? For surely they will not inflict punishment on me for my father's acts and at the same time pardon you for the crimes you yourself have committed. No, assuredly it will not be found that your pleas in extenuation are anything like his. For you were not banished from your native land, but on the contrary you were a member of the government, you did not act under compulsion. But you were a willing agent. It was not in self-defense, but on our own initiative, that you were wronging your fellow citizens, so that it is not fitting that you should be permitted by them even to enter a plea in your defense. But on the subject of the political misdeeds of Tejas, very likely some day at his trial I shall have the opportunity of speaking at greater length. But as for you, men of the jury, I beg you not to abandon me to my enemies nor entangle me in the net of irremediable misfortunes. For even now I have had sufficient experience of evils, since at my birth I was left an orphan through my father's exile and my mother's death, and I was not yet four years of age when I was brought into peril of my life owing to my father's exile, and while still a boy I was banished from the city by the thirty. And when the men of the Piraeus were restored, and all the rest recovered their possessions, I alone by the influence of my personal enemies was deprived of the of the land which the people gave us as compensation for the confiscated property. And after having already suffered so many misfortunes and having twice lost my property, I am now the defendant in an action involving five talents. And although the complaint involves money, the real issue is my right to continue to enjoy citizenship. For although the same penalties are prescribed for all by our laws, yet the legal risk is not the same for all, on the contrary, the wealthy risk a fine, but those who are in straitened circumstances, as is the case with me, are in danger of disfranchisement, and this is a misfortune greater, in my opinion, than exile, for it is a far more wretched fate to live among one's fellow citizens deprived of civic rights than to dwell an alien among foreigners. I entreat you, therefore, to aid me and not to suffer me to be despitefully treated by my personal enemies, or to be deprived of my fatherland, or to be made notorious by such misfortunes. The facts in the case would of themselves justly win for me your pity. Even if I have not the power by my words to evoke it. Since pity truly should be felt for those who are unjustly brought to trial, who are fighting for the greatest stakes, whose present condition is not in accordance with their own worth or with that of their ancestors, seeing that they have been deprived of immense wealth and have experienced life's greatest vicissitudes. Although I have many reasons for lamenting my fate, I am especially indignant for these reasons, first, if I must be punished by this man, who should justly be punished by me, second, if I shall lose my civic rights by reason of my father's victory at Olympia, when I see other men richly rewarded for such a victory, and, in addition, if Tejas, a man who never did the city any good, is to remain powerful in the democracy just as he was in the oligarchy, whereas I, who injured neither party, am to be ill-treated by both, and finally, if while in all other matters your actions are to be the opposite of those of the thirty, you shall in regard to me show the same spirit as they, and if I, who then lost my fatherland in company with you, shall now be deprived of it by you. Trapeziticus. This trial, men of the jury, is an important one for me. For I have at stake, not only a large sum of money, but also my reputation for I risk being thought to covet what justly belongs to another, and that is what gives me the greatest concern. For sufficient property will be left to me even if I am defrauded of this sum, but if I should be thought to be laying claim to so large a sum of money without just cause, I should have an evil reputation as long as I live. The greatest difficulty of all, men of the jury, is that I have adversaries of the character of the defendants here. For contracts with the managers of banks are entered into without witnesses, and any who are wronged by them are obliged to bring suit against men who have many friends, handle much money, and have a reputation for honesty because of their profession. In spite of these considerations I think I shall make it clear to all that I have been defrauded of my money by passion. I shall relate the facts to you from the beginning as well as I can. My father, men of the jury, is Sapius, all who sail to the Pontus know that his relations with Satyrus are so intimate that he is ruler of an extensive territory and has charge of that ruler's entire forces. Having heard reports both of this state and of the other lands where Greeks live, I desired to travel abroad. And so my father loaded two ships with grain, gave me money, and sent me off on a trading expedition and at the same time to see the world. 
Pythodorus, the Phoenician, introduced passion to me and I opened an account at his bank. Later on, as a result of slander which reached Satyrus to the effect that my father was plotting against the throne and that I was associating with the exiles, Satyrus arrested my father and sent orders to citizens of Pontus in residence here in Athens to take possession of my money and to bid me to return and, if I refused to obey, to demand of you my extradition. When I found myself in difficulty so embarrassing. Men of the jury. I related my troubles to passion, for I was on such intimate terms with him that I had the greatest confidence in him, not only in matters of money, but in everything else as well. I thought that, if I should yield control of all my money, I should run the risk, in case my father met with misfortune, after having been deprived of my money both here in Athens and at home, of becoming utterly destitute, and that, if I should acknowledge the existence of money here, yet fail to surrender it at satyrus command, I should create the most serious grounds of complaint against myself and my father in the mind of satyrus. On deliberation we decided that it would be best to agree to comply with all of Satyrus' demands and to surrender the money whose existence was known, but with respect to the funds on deposit with passion we should not only deny their existence but also make it appear that I had borrowed at interest both from passion and from others. And to do everything which was likely to make them believe that I had no money. At that time, men of the jury, I thought that passion was giving me all this advice because of goodwill toward me, but when I had arranged matters with the representatives of Satyrus, I perceived that he had designs on my property. For when I wished to recover my money and sail to Byzantium, passion thought a most favourable opportunity had come his way, for the sum of money on deposit with him was large and of sufficient value to warrant a shameless act. And I, in the presence of many listeners, had denied that I possessed anything, and everybody had seen that money was being demanded of me and that I was acknowledging that I was indebted to others also. Besides this, men of the jury, he was of opinion that if I attempted to remain here, I should be handed over by Athens to Satyrus, and if I should go anywhere else, he would be indifferent to my complaints, and if I should sail to the Pontus, I should be put to death along with my father, it was on the strength of these calculations that passion decided to defraud me of my money. And although to me he pretended that for the moment he was short of funds and would not be able to repay me, yet when I, wishing to ascertain exactly the truth, sent Philomelus and Menexenus to him to demand my property, he denied to them that he had anything belonging to me. Thus beset on every side by misfortune so dire, what, think you, was my state of mind? If I kept silent I should be defrauded of my money by passion here. If I should make this complaint, I was none the more likely to recover it and I should bring myself and my father into the greatest disrepute with Satyrus. The wisest course, therefore, as I thought, was to keep silent. After this, men of the jury, messengers arrived with the news that my father had been released and that Satyrus was so repentant of all that had occurred that he had bestowed upon my father pledges of his confidence of the most sweeping kind, and had given him authority even greater than he formerly possessed and had chosen my sister as his son's wife. When Passion learned this and understood that I would now bring action openly about my property, he spirited away his slave sitters, who had knowledge of our financial transactions. And when I went to him and demanded the surrender of sitters, because I believed that this slave could furnish the clearest proof of my claim, Passion made the most outrageous charge. That I and Menexenus had bribed and corrupted sitters as he sat at his banking table and received six talents of silver from him and that there might be neither examination nor testimony under torture on these matters, he asserted that it was we who had spirited away the slave and had brought a countercharge against himself with a demand that this slave, whom we ourselves had spirited away, be produced. And while he was making this plea and protesting and weeping, he dragged me before the pole march with a demand for bondsmen, and he did not release me until I had furnished bondsmen in the sum of six talents. Please summon for me witnesses to these facts. Witnesses you have heard the witnesses, men of the jury, and I, who had already lost part of my money and with regard to the rest was under the most infamous charges, left Athens for the Peloponnesus to investigate for myself. But Menexenus found the slave here in the city, and having seized him demanded that he give testimony under torture about both the deposit and the charge brought by his master. Passion, however, reached such a pitch of audacity that he secured the release of the slave on the ground that he was a freeman and Utterly devoid of shame and of fear, he claimed as a freeman and prevented the torture of a person who, as he alleged, had been stolen from him by us and had given us all that money. But the crowning impudence of all was this that when Menexenus compelled passion to give security for the slave before the pole march, he gave bond for him in the sum of seven talents. Let witnesses to these facts take the stand.
witnesses after he had acted in this way, men of the jury, passion, believing that his past conduct had clearly been in error and thinking he could rectify the situation by his subsequent acts, came to us and asserted that he was ready to surrender the slave for torture. We chose questioners and met in the temple of Hephaestus. And I demanded that they flog and rack the slave, who had been surrendered. Until they were of opinion that he was telling the truth. But Passion here asserted that they had not been chosen as torturers, and bade them make oral interrogation of the slave if they wished any information. Because of our disagreement the examiners refused to put the slave to torture themselves, but decreed that Passion should surrender him to me. But Passion was so anxious to avoid the employment of torture that he refused to obey them in respect to the surrender of the slave, but declared that he was ready to restore to me the money if they should pronounce judgment against him. Please call for me witnesses to these facts. Witnesses when, as a result of these meetings, men of the jury, all declared that Passion was guilty of wrongdoing and of scandalous conduct since, in the first place, it was Passion himself who had spirited away the slave who, so I had asserted, had knowledge of the money dealings, although he accused us of having concealed him, and next, when the slave was arrested, had prevented him from giving testimony under torture on the ground that he was a freeman, and finally, after this, having surrendered him as a slave and having chosen questioners, he nominally gave orders that he be tortured but in point of fact forbade it, passion, I say, understanding that there was no possibility of escape for himself if he came before you, sent a messenger to beg me to meet him in a sanctuary. And when we had come to the Acropolis, he covered his head and wept, saying that he had been compelled to deny the debt because of lack of funds, but that he would try to repay me in a short time. He begged me to forgive him and to keep his misfortune secret, in order that he, as a receiver of deposits, might not be shown to have been culpable in such matters. In the belief that he repented of his past conduct I yielded, and bade him to devise a method, of any kind he wished, that his affairs might be in order and I received back my money. Two days later we met again and solemnly pledged each other to keep the affair secret. A pledge which he failed to keep, as you yourselves will learn as my story proceeds, and he agreed to sail with me to the Pontus and there pay me back the gold, in order that he might settle our contract at as great a distance as possible from Athens, and that no one here might know the nature of our settlement, and also that on his return from the Pontus he might say anything he pleased, but in the event that he should not fulfill these obligations, he proposed to entrust to Satyrus an arbitration on stated terms which would permit Satyrus to condemn Passion to pay the original sum, and half as much in addition. When he had drawn up this agreement in writing we brought to the Acropolis Pyron, a fiery, who frequently sailed to the Pontus, and placed the agreement in his custody, stipulating that if we should come to a satisfactory settlement with each other, he should burn the memorandum, otherwise, he was to deliver it to Satyrus. The questions in dispute between ourselves. Men of the jury, had been settled in this manner, but Menexenus was so enraged because of the charge which Passion had brought against him also, that he brought an action for libel against him and demanded the surrender of Citus, asking that Passion, if guilty of falsification, should suffer the same penalty which he himself would have incurred for the same acts. And Passion, men of the jury, begged me to appease Menexenus, saying it would be of no advantage to himself if, after having sailed to the Pontus, he should pay the money in accordance with the terms of the agreement. And then should all the same be made a laughing stock in Athens, for the slave, if put to the torture, would testify to the truth of everything. I for my part, however, asked him to take any action he pleased as to Menexenus, but to carry out his agreements with me. At that time he was in a humble mood, for he did not know what to do in his plight. For not only was he in a state of fear in regard to the torture and the impending suit, but also with respect to the memorandum, lest Menexenus should obtain possession of it. And being embarrassed and finding no other means of relief, he bribed the slaves of the alien Pyron and falsified the memorandum which Satyrus was to receive in case he did not come to an agreement with me. No sooner had he accomplished this than he became the most impudent of all men and declared that he would not sail with me to the Pontus and that no contract at all existed between us. And he demanded that the memorandum be opened in the presence of witnesses. Why need I say more to you, men of the jury? for it was discovered to have been written in the memorandum that Passion was released of all claims on my part. Well, all the facts in the case I have told you as accurately as I could. But I think, men of the jury, that Passion will base his defence on the falsified memorandum, and will especially rely on its contents. Do you, therefore, give your attention to me, for I think that from these very contents I shall reveal to you his rascality. Consider the matter first in this way. 
when we gave to the alien, Pyron, the agreement by which passion, as he claims, is released from my demands, but as I contend, I was to have received back the gold from him, we bade the alien, in case we arrived at an understanding with each other, to burn the memorandum, otherwise, to give it to Satyrus, and that this was stated both of us agree. And yet, men of the jury, what possessed us to stipulate that the memorandum should be given to Satyrus in case of our failure to come to terms? If passion had already been freed of my claims and our business had been concluded? On the contrary, it is clear that we had made this agreement because there yet remained matters which passion had to settle with me in accordance with the memorandum. In the next place, men of the jury, I can give you the reasons why he agreed to repay me the gold, for when we had been cleared of the false accusations lodged with Satyrus, and Passion had been unable to spirit away Citus, who had knowledge of my deposit, he understood that if he should deliver his slave to torture, he would be convicted of an act of rascality, and, on the other hand, if he failed to do so, he would lose his case. He wished, therefore, to reach a settlement with me in person. Bid him show you what gain I had in view, or what danger I feared, that I dropped my charges against him. But if he can show you nothing of the kind, would you not with greater justice trust me rather than him in the matter of the memorandum? Furthermore, men of the jury, this too is easy for all to see that whereas I, the plaintiff, if I distrusted the sufficiency of my proofs, could drop the prosecution even without entering into any agreement. Yet passion, on account both of the examination of his slave under torture and the suits lodged with you, could not possibly free himself from his risks when he wished except by gaining the consent of me, the complainant. In consequence, I was not obliged to make an agreement about the dismissal of my charges, but it was necessary for him to do so about the repayment of my money. Besides, it would have been a preposterous state of affairs if, before the memorandum had been drawn up, I should have had so little confidence in my case as not only to drop the charges against passion, but also to make an agreement concerning these charges and, after I had drawn up such written proof against myself, should then have desired to bring the case before you. And yet who would plan so foolishly in regard to his own interests? But here is the strongest proof of all that in the agreement passion was not absolved from his debt but on the contrary had agreed to repay the gold, when Menexenus lodged his suit against him. Which was before the memorandum had been tampered with, Passion sent Agirius, a friend of both of us, to beg that I either appease Menexenus or annul the agreement I had made with himself. And yet, men of the jury, do you think that he would desire the annulment of this agreement, which he could use to convict us of Fossard? At any rate, this was not what he was saying after they had altered the memorandum, on the contrary, in all details he appealed to the agreement and ordered the memorandum to be opened. In proof that passion at first was eager for the suppression of the agreement I will produce Agirius himself as witness. Please take the stand. Testimony, so then, the fact that we made the agreement, not as passion will try to explain, but as I have related to you, I think has been sufficiently established and it should not occasion surprise, men of the jury, that he falsified the memorandum. Not only for the reason that there have been numerous frauds of such nature, but because some of Passion's friends have been guilty of conduct far worse. For instance, is there anyone who is ignorant that Pythodorus, called the shopkeeper, whose words and acts are all in Passion's interest, last year opened the voting urns and removed the ballots naming the judges which had been cast by the council? And yet when a man who, for petty gain and at the peril of his life, has the effrontery to open secretly the urns that had been stamped by the Pritanes and sealed by the Karegi, urns that were guarded by the treasurers and kept on the Acropolis, why should there be surprise that men, who hoped to make so great a profit, falsified an insignificant written agreement in the possession of a foreigner, gaining their ends either by the bribery of his slaves or by some other means in their power? On this point, however, I do not know what more I need say. Already passion has tried to persuade certain persons that I had no money at all here. Asserting that I had borrowed 300 staters from Straticles. It is worthwhile, therefore, that you should hear me also on these matters, in order that you may understand how flimsy is the proof which encourages him to try to defraud me of my money. Now, men of the jury, when Straticles was about to sail for Pontus, I, wishing to get as much of my money out of that country as possible, asked Straticles to leave with me his own gold and on his arrival in Pontus to collect its equivalent from my father there, as I thought it would be highly advantageous not to jeopardize my money by the risks of a voyage, especially as the Lacedaemonians were then masters of the sea. For passion, then, I do not think that this is any indication that I had no money here, but for me my dealings with Straticles will constitute the strongest proof that I had gold on deposit with passion. 
for when Stratocles inquired of me who would repay him in case my father failed to carry out my written instructions. And if, on his return, he should not find me here, I introduced passion to him, and passion himself agreed to repay him both the principal and the accrued interest. And yet if passion had not had on deposit some money belonging to me, do you think he would so readily have become my guarantor for so large a sum? Witnesses, please take the stand. Witnesses perhaps, men of the jury, he will present witnesses to you who will testify that I also denied, in the presence of the agents of Satyrus, that I possessed any money except that which I surrendered to them, and that he himself was laying claim to my money on my own confession that I owed him three hundred drachmas, and also that I had allowed Hippolardus, my guest and friend, to borrow from him. As for me, men of the jury, since I was involved in the difficulties which I have related to you, deprived of all I had at home and under compulsion to surrender what I had here to the envoys from Pontus, and finding myself without any means unless I could secretly retain in my possession the money on deposit with passion, I did, I admit, acknowledge a debt due him of three hundred drachmas and that in other respects I behaved and spoke in a manner which I thought would best persuade them that I possessed nothing and that these things were done by me, not because of lack of funds, but that the parties in Pontus might believe that to be the case, you will readily learn. I will present to you first those who knew that I had received much money from Pontus, next, those who saw me as a patron of Passion's Bank, and, besides, the persons from whom at that time I bought more than a thousand gold staters. In addition to this, when a special tax was imposed upon us and other men than I were appointed registrars, I contributed more than any other foreigner and when I was myself chosen registrar. I subscribed the largest contribution, but I pleaded with my fellow registrars on behalf of Passion, explaining that it was my money that he was using. Witnesses, please take the stand. Witnesses Passion himself. Moreover in effect, at least I will present as corroborating these statements. An information had been laid by a certain party against a trading ship, upon which I had lent a large sum of money, as belonging to a man of Delos. When I disputed this claim and demanded that the ship put to sea, those who make a business of blackmail so influenced the council that at first I almost was put to death without a trial, finally, however, they were persuaded to accept bondsmen from me. And Philip, who was my father's guest friend, was summoned and appeared, but took to flight in alarm at the magnitude of the danger, passion, however, furnished for me Archistratus, the banker, as shorty for seven talents. And yet if he stood to lose but a small sum and had known that I possessed no funds here, surely he would not have become my shorty for so large an amount. But it is obvious that passion called in the three hundred drachmas as a favour to me. And that he became my shorty for seven talents because he judged that the gold on deposit with him was a sufficient guarantee. That, therefore, I had a large sum of money here and that it was deposited in his bank I have not only proved to you from passion's acts but you have also heard it from the others who know the facts. It seems to me, men of the jury, that you would best decide upon the questions at issue if you should call to mind that period and the situation in which our affairs stood when I sent Menexenus and Philomelus to claim the deposit and passion for the first time had the hardihood to deny its existence. You find, in fact, that my father had been arrested and deprived of all his property, and that I was unable, because of the embarrassment in which I found myself, either to remain here or to sail to the Pontus. And yet, which is the more reasonable supposition that I, involved in misfortunes so great brought unjust charges against passion or that he, because of the magnitude of our misfortunes and the large sum of money involved, was tempted to defraud us? But what man ever went so far in chicanery as, with his own life in jeopardy, to plot against the possessions of others? With what hope or with what intent would I have unjustly proceeded against passion? Was it my thought that, in fear of my influence, he would forthwith give me money? but neither the one nor the other of us was in such a situation. Or was I of opinion that by bringing the matter to issue in court I should have greater influence with you than passion, even contrary to justice I, who was not even preparing to remain in Athens, since I feared that Satyrus would demand of you my extradition? Or was I going to act so that, without accomplishing anything, I should make a personal enemy of the man with whom, as it happened, of all the inhabitants of Athens, I was on terms of greatest intimacy? Who of you, I ask, would think it right to condemn me as being guilty of such folly and stupidity? It is also right, men of the jury, that you should note the absurdity and the incredibility of the arguments which passion on each occasion undertook to present. For when my situation was such that, even if he acknowledged that he was defrauding me of my money, I could not have exacted the penalty from him, it is then that he accuses me of trying to make unjust claims. 
but when I had been declared innocent of the slanderous charges lodged with Satyrus and all thought that he would lose his suit. It is then that he says I renounced all claims against him. And yet how could anything be more illogical than this? But. You may say, perhaps it is on these matters only, and not on the others, that he obviously contradicts himself in both words and deeds. Yet he is the man who, though he alleged that the slave whom he himself had spirited away had been enslaved by us, yet listed this same person in his property schedule as a slave along with his other servants, and then when Menexenus demanded that this slave give testimony under torture, passion brought about his release on the ground that he was a freeman. Furthermore, while he himself was defrauding me of my deposit, he had the impudence to accuse us of having six talents from his bank. And yet when a man did not hesitate to lie in matters so obvious to everybody, how can he be believed about matters transacted between us two alone? Finally, men of the jury, although he had agreed to sail to the country of Satyrus and to do whatever he decreed, he deceived me even in this. He refused to sail himself in spite of my frequent solicitations. But sent Citus instead. On his arrival Citus alleged that he was a freeman, a Miletian by birth, and that passion had sent him to furnish information about the money. When Satyrus had heard us both, he did not wish to render a decision concerning contracts made in Athens, especially since Passion was absent and not likely to comply with his decision, but he believed so strongly that I was being wrong that he called together the ship owners and asked them to assist me and not suffer me to be wronged. And he wrote a letter to the city of Athens and gave it to Xenotimus, son of Carcinus, for delivery. Please read the letter to the jury. Letter, although, men of the jury, my claims to justice are so many, I think that the strongest proof that passion defrauded me of my money is this that he refused to surrender for torture the slave who knew about the deposit. And yet, in respect to contracts where banks are concerned, what stronger proof could there be than this? For witnesses certainly we do not use in contracts with banks. I see that in private and public causes you judge that nothing is more deserving of belief, or true, than testimony given under torture, and that while you think it possible to suborn witnesses even for acts which never occurred at all, yet that testimony under torture clearly shows which party is telling the truth. Passion, being aware of this, wished that in this affair you should judge by conjecture rather than know the exact truth. For he certainly would not be able to say that he was likely to be at a disadvantage if torture should be used and that for this reason the surrender of his slave could not reasonably be expected of him. For you all know that if Sitter spoke against his master, he would likely suffer for the remainder of his life in the most cruel manner at the hands of his master, but that if he held firm in his denials, he would be free and have a share of my money which his master had taken. In spite of the fact that he was to have so great an advantage passion. Conscious of his guilty deeds, submitted to stand suit and to rest under the other charges, all to prevent any testimony under torture being given in this case. I therefore ask of you that, keeping these facts in mind, you cast your votes against passion and not judge me guilty of a villainy so great, that I, who live in Pontus and possess so large an estate that I am able even to assist others, have come here maliciously to prosecute passion and to accuse him of dishonesty in the matter of a deposit made with his bank. It is right also that you keep in mind both Satyrus and my father, who have always esteemed you above all the other Greeks and frequently in past times, when there was a scarcity of grain and they were sending away empty the ships of other merchants, granted to you the right of export. Also, in the private contracts in which they are arbiters, you come off not only on even terms but even at an advantage. You would not reasonably, therefore, consider their letters of little importance. I ask of you, then, both on their behalf and on my own, that you vote in accordance with justice and not count the false assertions of passion to be more worthy of belief than my own words. Against Callimachus. If any others had employed in litigation such a special plea of exception, I should have begun my discourse with the facts themselves, but as the situation is, I am compelled first to speak of the law in accordance with which we have come before the court, that you may cast your vote with an understanding of the issues in our dispute and that no one of you may be surprised that I, although defendant in the case, am speaking prior to the plaintiff. Now after your return to the city from Piraeus, you saw that some of the citizens were bent upon bringing malicious prosecutions and were attempting to violate the amnesty, so, wishing to restrain these persons and to show to all others that you had not made these agreements under compulsion, but because you thought them of advantage to the city, you enacted a law, on the motion of our kindness, to the effect that, if any person should commence a lawsuit in violation of the oaths, the defendant should have the power to enter a plea of exception. 
the magistrate should first submit this question to the tribunal, and that the defendant who had entered the plea should speak first, and further, that the loser should pay a penalty of one-sixth of the sum at stake. The purpose of the penalty was this that persons who had the effrontery to rake up old grudges should not only be convicted of perjury but also, not awaiting the vengeance of the gods, should suffer immediate punishment. I thought, therefore, that it was absurd if, under the existing laws, I was to permit my calumniator to risk only thirty drachmas, while I myself am contesting a suit in which my whole property is at stake. I intend to prove that Callimachus not only is bringing a suit in violation of the terms of the amnesty agreement, but that he is also guilty of falsehood in his charges. And furthermore, that we have already resorted to arbitration in the matter at issue. But I wish to relate the facts to you from the beginning, for if you learn that he has suffered no wrong at my hands, I think that you will be more inclined to defend the amnesty and be more incensed with him. The government of the ten, who had succeeded the thirty, was then in control when Patricles, a friend of mine, was the king Archon, and with him one day I happened to be walking. Patricles, an enemy of Callimachus who is now prosecuting me in this suit, met him as he was carrying a sum of money, laid hold of him, and claimed that this money had been left by Pamphilus and belonged to the government, for Pamphilus was a member of the party of the Piraeus. Callimachus denied this and as a violent quarrel ensued many others came running up, among them by chance Rhinon, who had become one of the ten, approached. So Patricles immediately laid information with him concerning the money and Rhinon led them both before his colleagues. These officials referred the matter to the council, after an adjudication, the money was declared the property of the state. Later, after the return of the citizen exiles from Piraeus, Callimachus brought a charge against Patricles and instituted proceedings against him on the ground that he was responsible for his loss. And when he had effected with him a settlement of the matter and had exacted from him ten miners of silver, Callimachus maliciously accused Lysimachus. Having obtained two hundred drachmas from him, he began to make trouble for me. At first he charged me with being the accomplice of the others, in the end, he came to such a pitch of impudence that he accused me as responsible for everything that had been done, and it may be that even now he will have the effrontery to make just such an accusation. In rebuttal, however, I will present to you as witnesses, first, those who were present at the beginning of the affair. Who will testify that I did not arrest Callimachus nor did I touch the money? Second, Rhinon and his colleagues, who will tell you that it was Patricles, and not I, who denounced him to them, and finally, the members of the council, who will attest that Patricles was the accuser. And please call witnesses of these facts. Witnesses although so many persons had been present when the events took place, Callimachus here, as if no one had any knowledge of the matter, himself mixed with the crowds, sat in the workshops, and related again and again his story, how he had suffered outrageous treatment at my hands and had been of his money. And some of his friends came to me and advised me to settle the dispute with him, and not deliberately to risk defamation and great financial loss, even though I had the greatest confidence in my cause, and they went on to say that many decisions rendered in the tribunals were contrary to the expectation of litigants, and that chance rather than justice determined the issue in your courts. Consequently, they asserted, it was in my interest to be freed of serious charges by paying a petty sum, rather than by paying nothing to run the risk of penalties of such gravity. Why need I relate to you all the details? They omitted none of the arguments which are customarily urged in such cases. In any case I was finally prevailed upon for I will tell you the whole truth to give him two hundred drachmas. But in order that it might not be in his power to blackmail me again, we committed the arbitration under stated terms to Nicomachus of Bat. Witnesses at first Callimachus kept his agreement, but later in complicity with Xenotimus that falsifier of the laws, corrupter of our tribunals, vilifier of the authorities, and author of every evil he brought suit against me for the sum of ten thousand drachmas. But when I brought forward in my defence a witness to show that the suit was not within the jurisdiction of the court by reason of the previous arbitration, he did not attack my witness for he knew that, if he did not receive the fifth of the votes cast, he would be assessed a penalty of one-sixth of the amount demanded but having won over the magistrate, he again brought the same suit, in the belief that he risked only his court deposit fee. And since I was at a loss how to cope with my difficulties, I judged that it was best to make the hazard equal for us both and to come before you. And these are the facts. I learn that Callimachus not only intends to speak falsely in the matter of his complaint, but will also deny that the arbitration took place, and that he is prepared to go so far as to assert that he never would have entrusted an arbitration to Nicomachus, whom he knew to be an old friend of ours, and further, that it is improbable that he was willing to accept 200 drachmas instead of 10,000. 
You must reflect, however, first, that we were not in dispute in the matter of the arbitration, but we committed it as an arbitration under stated terms, so that it is not at all strange that Callimachus chose Nicomachus as arbiter, it would have been far stranger if, after he had come to an agreement about the matter, he had then made difficulty about the choice of arbiter. In the next place, it is not reasonable to assume that, if 10,000 drachmas had been owing to him, he would have settled for two minors. But since his charges were unjust and in the nature of blackmail, it is not astonishing that he was willing to take so little. Furthermore, if, after exorbitant demands, he exacted little, this is no proof in favor of his contention that the arbitration did not take place on the contrary, it confirms all the more our contention that his claim was unjust in the first place. I am astonished that, while he judges himself capable of recognizing that it was not probable that he was willing to take 200 drachmas instead of the 10,000, yet believes that I am incapable of discovering, if I had wished to lie, that I ought to have asserted that I had given him more. But this I ask that in so far as it would have been an indication in his favor that the arbitration did not take place, if he had proved the falsity of the testimony, to that same extent it shall be proof in favor of my contention that I tell the truth concerning the arbitration, inasmuch as it is clearly shown that he did not dare to proceed against my witness. I think, however, that even if there had been neither arbitration nor witnesses to the actual facts and you were under the necessity of considering the case in the light of the probabilities, not even in this event would you have difficulty in arriving at a just verdict. For if I were so audacious a man as to wrong others, you would with good reason condemn me as doing wrong to him also, but as it is, I shall be found innocent of having harmed any citizen in regard to his property, or of jeopardizing his life, or of having expunged his name from the list of active citizens, or of having inscribed his name on Lysander's list. And yet the wickedness of the thirty impelled many to act in this way for they not only did not punish the evildoers but they even commanded some persons to do wrong. So as for me, not even when they had control of the government, shall I be found guilty of any such misdeed, yet Callimachus says that he was wronged after the thirty had been expelled. The Piraeus had been taken. And when the democracy was in power, and the terms of reconciliation were being discussed. And yet do you think that a man who was well behaved under the thirty put off his wrongdoing until that period when even those who had formerly transgressed were repentant? But the most absurd thing of all would be this that although I never saw fit to avenge myself on any one of my existing enemies, I was attempting to injure this man with whom I have never had any business dealings at all. That I am not responsible for the confiscation of the money of Callimachus I think I have sufficiently proved. But that it was not legally in his power to bring a suit pertaining to events which occurred then, not even if I had done everything he says I did, you will learn from the Covenant of Amnesty. Please take the document. Covenant of Amnesty, was it, then, a weak defense of my rights I trusted in when I entered this demurrer? On the contrary. Do not the terms of the amnesty explicitly exculpate any who have laid information against or denounced any person or have done any similar thing? And am I not able to prove that I have neither committed these acts nor transgressed in any other way? Please read the oaths also. Oaths is it not outrageous, men of the jury, that, although such were the terms of the covenant and the oaths which were sworn were of such nature, Callimachus is so convinced of his own eloquence that he believes he will persuade you to vote in opposition to them. If he saw that the city regretted its past action, his conduct should not occasion surprise, but as a matter of fact you have shown the importance you attach to the covenant, not only in the enactment of the laws, but when Philon of Coel was indicted for malversation on an embassy, and although he could offer no defense but merely cited the covenant in exoneration, you decided to dismiss his case and not even hold him for trial. And although the city does not think it proper to punish even confessed transgressors, Yet this man has the effrontery to bring malicious charges against those who have done no wrong at all. Furthermore, he is certainly not unaware of this either that Thrasybulus and Enetus, men of the greatest influence in the city, although they have been robbed of large sums of money and know who gave in lists of their goods, nevertheless are not so brazen as to bring suit against them or to bring up old grudges against them, on the contrary, even if, in respect to all other claims, they have greater power than others to accomplish their ends. Yet in matters covered by the covenant at least they see fit to put themselves on terms of equality with the other citizens. And it is not these men alone who have accepted this point of view, no, not even one of you has dared to bring such an action. And yet it would be outrageous if you, while honoring your oaths where your own affairs are concerned, shall attempt to violate them in connection with the calumnious charges of Callimachus, and if, while insisting that private agreements must be held valid by public authority, shall allow anyone who so desires on his own private authority, to break the covenants of the state. 
but it would be the most astounding outcome of all if, while it was still uncertain whether or not the reconciliation would be of advantage to the city, you strengthened it with such oaths that, even if it proved disadvantageous, you were forced to abide by your agreements, yet now, when the results have been so happy for you that, even if you had not given any solemn pledge to do so, it is right for you scrupulously to preserve the existing government, you are going to seize that moment to violate your oaths. And although you were incensed with those who have said that the covenant of amnesty should be repealed, yet this man, who has the effrontery to transgress it after its official promulgation, you are going to discharge without a penalty. No, should you do so, you would neither be rendering justice nor acting in a manner worthy of yourselves or consistent with your former decisions. I beg you. However, to bear in mind that you have come to pass judgment on matters of the highest importance, for you are going to cast your votes on the question of a covenant, and covenants have never been violated to the advantage of either yourselves in relation to the other parties or of others in relation to you, and they have such binding force that almost all the daily activities of Greeks and of barbarians are governed by covenants. For it is through our reliance on them that we visit one another's lands and procure those things of which we both have need, with the aid of these we make our contracts with each other and put an end to both our private animosities and our common wars. This is the only universal institution which all we of the human race constantly employ. It is, therefore, the duty of all men to uphold them, and, above all, yours. It is your duty, I say, for recently, when we had been conquered and had fallen into the power of enemies at home and many wished to destroy the city, we took refuge in the oaths and covenants, and if the Lacedaemonians should dare to violate these, every man of you would be exceedingly indignant. And yet how can one accuse the other party of transgressions of which he is himself guilty? Who would regard us as victims of injustice when suffering injury through a violation of covenants, if even we ourselves were manifestly holding them in slight esteem? What pledges shall we find binding in our relations with other peoples if we so lightly disregard those which we have made among ourselves? This, too, is worthy of our remembrance that, although our forefathers performed many glorious deeds in war, not the least of its glory our city has won through these treaties of reconciliation. For whereas many sites might be found which have waged war gloriously, in dealing with civil discord there is none which could be shown to have taken wiser measures than ours. Furthermore, the great majority of all those achievements that have been accomplished by fighting may be attributed to fortune, but for the moderation we showed towards one another no one could find any other cause than our good judgment. Consequently it is not fitting that we should prove false to this glorious reputation. And let no one think that I exaggerate or pass due bounds, because I, a defendant in a private suit, have spoken in this fashion. For this lawsuit is concerned not merely with the sum of money specified in the indictment, for me, it is true, this is the issue, but for you it is that of which I have just spoken, on this subject no one would be able to speak in fitting fashion nor could he fix an adequate penalty. For this lawsuit differs so greatly from other private suits in this respect that, while the latter are of concern to the litigants only, in this private lawsuit common interests of the city are likewise at stake. In trying this case you are bound by two oaths, one is the customary judicial oath which you take in all ordinary cases, and the other is that oath which you swore when you ratified the covenant of amnesty. If in render an unjust verdict in this case, you will be violating not only the laws of the city, but also the laws common to all men. Consequently, it is not fitting that your vote should be based upon favour, or upon mere equity, nor upon anything else than upon the oaths you took when you made the covenant of amnesty. Now that it is right, and is expedient and just that you should decide thus concerning the covenant of amnesty not even Callimachus himself, I think, will gainsay, but he intends, I suppose, to bewail his present poverty and the misfortune which has befallen him and to say that his fate will be dreadful and cruel if now under the democracy he must pay the assessed fine for the money of which under the oligarchy he was deprived. And also if then because he possessed property he was forced to go into exile, yet now, at a time when he ought to get satisfaction for wrongs done him, he is to be deprived of his civic rights. And he will accuse also those who took part in the revolution, in the hope that in this way especially he will arouse you to wrath, for perhaps he has heard it said that whenever you fail to apprehend the guilty, you punish any who cross your path. But I for my part do not think that you are so disposed, and I believe that it is easy to controvert the pleas just suggested. As for his lamentations, it is fitting that you give aid, not to those who try to show that they are the most miserable of men, but to those whose statements concerning the facts to which they have sworn in their affidavits are manifestly the more just. And in regard to the penalty assessed against the loser, if I were responsible for this action, 
you might reasonably sympathize with him as about to be penalized. But the truth is, it is he who brings in a calumnious accusation and therefore you cannot in justice accept anything he says. In the second place, you should consider this point that all the exiles who returned to the city from the Piraeus would be able to use the very same arguments as he, but no one except Callimachus has had the audacity to introduce such a suit. And yet you ought to hate such persons and regard them as bad citizens who, although they have suffered the same misfortunes as the part of the people, think fit to exact exceptional punishments. Furthermore, it is possible for him even now, before he has made trial of your decision, to drop the suit and to be entirely rid of all his troubles. And yet is it not stupid of him to seek to win your pity while in this jeopardy, for which he himself is responsible, and in which he has involved himself? A jeopardy which even now it is possible for him to avoid? And if he does mention events which occurred under the oligarchy, demand of him that, instead of accusing persons whom no one will defend, he prove that it was I who took his money, for this is the issue upon which you must cast your votes. And demand that he, instead of showing that he has suffered cruel wrongs, prove that it is I who have committed them, I, from whom he seeks to recover what he has lost. Since the fact of his evil plight he can readily establish in a suit brought against any other citizen whatever. And yet the accusations which should have great weight with you are not those which may be made even against those who are entirely guiltless, but those only which cannot be brought against any persons except those who have committed an act of injustice. To these allegations, this will perhaps be a sufficient reply and a further rebuttal soon will be possible. Also bear in mind, I ask you even though I may be thought by someone to be repeating myself that many persons are attentively watching the outcome of this case, not because they are interested in affairs, but because they believe that the covenant of amnesty is on trial. Such persons, if your decision is just, you will enable to dwell in the city without fear, otherwise, how do you expect those who remained in the city to feel? If you show that you are angry with all alike who obtained the rights of citizenship, and what will those think who are conscious of even slight error on their part? When they see that not even persons whose conduct as citizens has been decent obtain justice. What confusion must be expected to ensue when some are encouraged to bring malicious accusations in the belief that your sentiments are now the same as theirs, and when others fear the present form of government on the ground that no place of refuge is any longer left to them? May we not rightly fear that, once your oaths have been violated, we shall again be brought to the same state of affairs which compelled us to make the covenant of amnesty. Certainly you do not need to learn from others how great is the blessing of concord or how great a curse is civil war, for you have experienced both in so extreme a form that you yourselves would be best qualified to instruct all others regarding them. But lest it be thought that the reason I am dwelling long on the covenant of amnesty is merely because it is easy when speaking on that subject to make many just observations. I urge you to remember when you cast your votes only one thing more that before we entered into those agreements we Athenians were in a state of war. Some of us occupying the circle enclosed by the city's walls, others Piraeus after we had captured it, and we hated each other more than we did the enemies bequeathed to us by our ancestors. But after we came together and exchanged the solemn pledges, we have lived so uprightly and so like citizens of one country that it seemed as if no misfortune had ever befallen us. At that time all looked upon us as the most foolish and ill-fated of mankind, now, however, we are regarded as the happiest and wisest of the Greeks. Therefore it is incumbent upon us to inflict upon those who dare to violate the covenant, not merely the heavy penalties prescribed by the treaty, but the most extreme, on the ground that these persons are the cause of the greatest evils, especially those who have lived as Callimachus has lived. For during the ten years when the Lacedaemonians warred upon you uninterruptedly, not for one single day's service did he present himself to the generals. On the contrary, all through that period he continued to evade service and to keep his property in concealment. But when the thirty came to power, then it was that he sailed back to Athens. And although he professes to be a friend of the people, yet he was so much more eager than anybody else to participate in the oligarchical government that, even though it meant hardship, he saw fit not to depart, but preferred to be besieged in company with those who had injured him rather than to live as a citizen with you, who likewise had been wronged by them. And he remained as a participant in their government until that day on which you were on the point of attacking the walls of Athens, then he left the city, not because he had come to hate the present regime, but because he was afraid of the danger which threatened, as he later made evident. For when the Lacedaemonians came and the democracy was shut up in the Piraeus, again he fled from there and resided among the Boeotians, it is far more fitting, therefore, that his name should be enrolled in the list of the deserters than that he should be called one of the exiles.
and although he has proved to be a man of such character by his conduct toward the people who occupied the Piraeus, toward those who remained in the city, and toward the whole state, he is not content to be on equal terms with the others, but seeks to be treated better than you, as if either he alone had suffered injury, or was the best of the citizens, or had met with the gravest misfortunes on your account, or had been the cause of the most numerous benefits to the city. I could wish that you knew him as well as I do, in order that, instead of commiserating with him over his losses, you might bear him a grudge for what he has left. The fact is, though, that if I should try to tell of all the others who have been the objects of his plots, of the private lawsuits in which he has been involved, of the public suits which he has entered, of the persons with whom he has conspired or against whom he has borne false witness, not even twice as much water as has been allotted me would prove sufficient. But when you have heard only one of the acts which he has committed you will readily recognize the general run of his villainy. Cratinus once had a dispute over a farm with the brother-in-law of Callimachus. A personal encounter ensued. Having concealed a female slave, they accused Cratinus of having crushed her head, and asserting that she had died as a result of the wound, they brought suit against him in the court of the Palladium on the charge of murder. Cratinus, learning of their plots, remained quiet for a long time in order that they might not change their plans and concoct another story, but instead might be caught in the very act of committing a crime. When the brother-in-law of Callimachus had made accusation and Callimachus had testified on oath that the woman was actually dead, Cratinus and his friends went to the house where she had been hidden, seized her by force and, bringing her into court, presented her alive to all present. The result was that, in a tribunal of 700 judges, after 14 witnesses had given the same testimony as that of Callimachus, he failed to receive a single vote. Please call witnesses to these facts. Witnesses who, therefore, would be able to condemn his acts as they deserve? Or who would be able to find a more flagrant example of wrongdoing? Of malicious prosecution, and of villainy? Some misdeeds, it is true, do not reveal in its entirety the character of the evildoers, but from acts such as his it is easy to discern the whole life of the culprits. For any man who testifies that the living are dead, from what villainy do you think that he would abstain? What outrageous deed would a man not have the effrontery to commit in his own interest who is so knavish a villain in the interest of others? How is it right to trust this man when he speaks in his own behalf, who is proved guilty of perjury in his testimony on behalf of another? Who was ever more convincingly proved to be a giver of false testimony? You judge all other defendants by what is said of them, but this man's testimony the jurors themselves saw was false. And after the commission of such crimes he will dare to say that it is we who are lying. Why that would be as if Renondas should reproach a man with villainy, or as if Philurgos, who stole the Gorgon's head, had called everybody else temple robbers. Who is more likely to present witnesses of events which have not occurred than my antagonist here, who himself has the hardihood to testify falsely for others? But against Callimachus it will be possible to bring accusations time and again, for he has contrived his life as a citizen that way, but as for myself, I shall say nothing of all my other contributions to the state, but I will merely remind you of that one, a service for which, if you would do me justice, you would not only be grateful, but you would take it even as evidence bearing upon the case as a whole. Now when the city had lost its ships in the Hellespont and was shorn of its power, I so far surpassed the majority of the Triarchs that I was one of the very few who saved their ships, and of these few I alone brought back my ship to the Piraeus and did not resign my duties as Triarch. But when the other Triarchs were glad to be relieved of their duties and were discouraged over the situation, and not only re regretted the loss of what they had already spent, but were trying to conceal the remainder and, judging that the commonwealth was completely ruined, were looking out for their private interests, my decision was not the same as theirs, but after persuading my brother to be joint triarch with me, we paid the crew out of our own means and proceeded to harass the enemy. And finally, when Lysander proclaimed that if anyone should import grain to you he would be punished with death, we were so zealous for the city's welfare that, although no one else dared to bring in even his own, we intercepted the grain that was being brought into them and discharged it at the Piraeus. In recognition of these services you voted that we should be honoured with crowns, and that in front of the statues of the eponymous heroes we should be proclaimed as the authors of great blessings. Yet surely men who should now be regarded as friends of the people are not those who, when the people were in power, were eager to participate in affairs, but those who, when the state was suffering misfortune, were willing to brave the first dangers in your behalf, and gratitude is due, not to him who has suffered personal hardships, but to him who has conferred benefits upon you, and in the case of those who have become poor, pity should be felt, not for those who have lost their property, but for those who have spent their fortune for your good. 
of these last named it will be found that I have been one, and I should be the most miserable of all men, if, after I have spent much of my fortune for the good of the city, it should be thought that I plot against the property of others, and that I care naught for your poor opinion of me, when it is obvious that I set less store, not merely on my property, but even on my life, than on your good opinion. Who among you would not feel remorse, even if not immediately, yet soon hereafter, if you should see the calumniator enriched? But me despoiled even of that which I left remaining when serving you as triarch, and if you should see this man, who never even ran a risk on your behalf, influential enough to override both the laws and the covenant of amnesty, and me, who have been so zealous in serving the state, adjudged unworthy of obtaining even my just rights. And who would not reproach you, if, cajoled by the words of Callimachus? You should find me of such baseness, you who, when you judged us on the strength of our deeds, crowned us for our bravery at a time when it was not so easy as it is now to win that honour? It has come to pass that our appeal is the opposite of that which other litigants generally make, for everybody else reminds the recipients of the benefactions they have received, whereas we ask you, the donors, to bear your gifts in mind, that they may serve you as corroboration of all I have said and of our principles of conduct. And it is evident that we showed ourselves worthy of this honour, not for the purpose of plundering the property of others after the oligarchy had been established, but in order that, after the city had been saved, not only all the citizens might keep their own possessions, but also that in the hearts of our fellow citizens at large there might be a feeling of gratitude to us as a debt to be paid. It is this that we beg of you now, not seeking to have more than is just, but offering proof that we are guilty of no wrongdoing and asking you to abide by the oaths and the covenant of amnesty. For it would be outrageous if those covenants should be held valid for the exculpation of the evildoers, but should be made invalid for us, your benefactors. And it is prudent for you to guard well your present fortune, remembering that while in the past such agreements have increased civic discord in other cities, yet to ours they have brought a greater degree of concord. So you, keeping these considerations in mind, should cast your votes for that which is at the same time just and also expedient. E. Geneticus. I was of opinion, citizens of Aegina, that Thrasylarchus had arranged his affairs so prudently that no one should ever come before a court to bring a suit in opposition to the will which he left. But since my adversaries have determined to contest a testament so purposefully drawn, I am compelled to try to obtain my rights from you. My feeling is unlike that of most men. For I see that others are indignant when they are unjustly involved in a lawsuit, whereas I am almost grateful to my opponents for bringing me into this trial. For if the matter had not been brought before a tribunal you would not have known of my devotion to the deceased, which led to my being made his heir, but when you learn the facts you will all perceive that I might justly have been thought worthy of even a greater reward. The proper course, however, for the woman who is laying claim to the property would have been not to try to obtain from you the estate left by Thrasylarchus, but to show that she also was devoted to him and on that ground thought fit to bring suit for it. But the truth is, she is so far from repenting of her misconduct towards Thrasylarchus in his lifetime, that now too that he is dead she is trying to annul his will and to leave the home without heirs. And I am astonished that those who are acting in her behalf think this action is reputable, just because, if they fail to win, they will need to pay no penalty. For my part, I think that it will be a severe penalty, if, having been convicted of making a wrongful claim, they shall thereafter suffer in your esteem. However, you will know the baseness of these men from their very acts when you have heard to the end what they have done, and I shall begin the recital of them at the point from which, in my opinion, you will be able to learn most quickly the matters at issue. Thrasyllus, the father of the testator, had inherited nothing from his parents, but having become the guest friend of Polymenitus, the soothsayer, he became so intimate with him that Polymenitus at his death left to him his books on divination and gave him a portion of the property which is now in question. Thrasyllus, with these books as his capital, practiced the art of divination. He became an itinerant soothsayer, lived in many cities, and was intimate with several women, some of whom had children whom he never even recognized as legitimate, and, in particular, during this period he lived with the mother of the complainant. When he had acquired a large fortune and yearned for his fatherland, he left this woman and the others as well, and debarking at Siphnos married a sister of my father. Thrasyllus himself was indeed the leading citizen in wealth, but he knew that our family was likewise preeminent in lineage and in general standing, and he cherished so warmly my father's affection for him that at the death of his wife, who was without children, he remarried, taking as wife my father's cousin, as he did not wish to dissolve the affinity with us. But after he had lived with her for only a short time, he suffered the same bereavement as his former wife. 
After this he married a woman of Serifos, belonging to a family of greater consequence than might be expected of a native of their island. Of this marriage were born Sopolis, Thrasilarchus, and a daughter, who is my wife. These were the only legitimate children left by Thrasillus and he made these his heirs when he died. Thrasilarchus and I. Having inherited from our fathers a friendship the intimacy of which I have recently mentioned. Made the bond still closer. For during our childhood we were fonder of each other than of our brothers, and we would perform no sacrifice, make no pilgrimage, and celebrate no festival except in one another's company, and when we reached manhood we never opposed one another in any action undertaken, for we not only shared our private concerns but also held similar sentiments regarding public affairs, and we had the same intimates and guest friends. And why need I speak further of our intimacy at home? In truth, not even in exile did we care to be apart. Finally, when Thrasilarchus was stricken with the wasting disease and suffered a long illness his brother Sopolis had previously died and his mother and sister had not arrived seeing him so completely destitute of companionship I nursed him with such unremitting care and devotion that he thought he could never repay me with a gratitude adequate to my services, nevertheless he left nothing undone to reward me. And when he was in a grievous condition and had given up all hope of life, he summoned witnesses, made me his adoptive son, and gave me his sister and his fortune. Please take the will. The will read to me also the law of Egina, for it was necessary that the will be drawn in accordance with this law, since we were alien residents of this island. Law it was in accordance with this law, citizens of Egina, that Thrasilarchus adopted me as his son, for I was his fellow citizen and friend, in birth inferior to no one of the Scythians, and had been reared and educated very much as he himself had been. I therefore do not see how he could have acted more consistently with the law, since the law insists that persons of the same status may be adopted. Please take also the law of CEOs, under which we were living. Law if, therefore, citizens of Egina, my opponents were refusing to recognize the validity of these laws, but were able to produce in support of their case the law of their own country. Their conduct would have been less astonishing. But the truth is that their own law is in agreement with those already read. Please take this document. Law what argument is left to them, therefore, since they themselves admit that Thrasilarchus left the will and that they can cite no law in their favour, whereas all support my case first, the law which is valid among you who are to adjudge the case, next, the law of Siphnos, the fatherland of the testator, and finally the law of the country of my opponents. And yet from what illegal act do you think these persons would abstain, inasmuch as they seek to persuade you that you should declare this will valid, although the laws read as you have heard and you have taken oath to cast your votes in conformity with them? On the issue itself I consider that I have adduced sufficient proof, but that no one may think that my possession of the inheritance rests upon feeble grounds. Or that this woman had been kindly in her behaviour toward Thrasilarchus and is being defrauded of his fortune. I wish also to discuss these matters. For I should be ashamed in behalf of the deceased unless you were all convinced that his actions were strictly in accordance, not only with the law, but also with justice. And I believe that proof of this is easy. There was, in truth, this great difference between us that this woman, who bases her contention on the ground of relationship, never ceased to be at variance with the testator and evilly disposed toward him and toward Sopolis and their mother, whereas I shall be shown to have been the most deserving of all his friends, not only in my relations with Thrasilarchus and his brother, but also with regard to the estate in controversy. It would be a long story to tell of the events of long ago, but when Passinus took Poros, it chanced that my friends had the greatest part of their fortune deposited as a pledge with my guest friends there, for we thought that this island was by far the safest. When they were at their wit's end and believed that their property was lost. I sailed thither by night and got their money out at risk of my life, for the country was occupied by a garrison, and some of the exiles from our island participated in the seizure of the city, and these, in one day and with their own hands, had slain my father, my uncle, my brother-in-law and, in addition, three cousins. However, I was deterred by none of these risks, but I took ship, thinking I ought to run the risk as much for my friend's sake as for my own. Afterwards when a general flight from the city ensued, accompanied by such confusion and fear that some persons were indifferent even to the fate of their own relations, I was not content, even in these misfortunes, merely to be able to save the members of my own household, but knowing that Sopolis was absent and Thrasilarchus was in feeble health, I helped him to convey from the country his mother, his sister, and all his fortune. And yet who with greater justice should possess this fortune than the person who then helped to save it and now has received it from its legitimate owners? I have related the adventures in which I incurred danger indeed.
yet suffered no harm, but I have also to speak of friendly services I rendered him which involved me in the greatest misfortunes. For when we had arrived at Melos, and Thrasylarchus perceived that we were likely to remain there, he begged me to sail with him to Trozen and by all means not to abandon him, mentioning his bodily infirmity and the multitude of his enemies, saying that without me he would not know how to manage his own affairs. And although my mother was afraid because she had heard that Trozen was unhealthy and our guest friends advised us to remain where we were, nevertheless we decided that we ought to satisfy his wish. No sooner had we arrived at Trozen than we were attacked by illnesses of such severity that I barely escaped with my own life, and within thirty days I buried my young sister fourteen years of age, and my mother not five days thereafter. In what state of mind do you think I was after such a change in my life? I had previously been inexperienced in misfortune and I had only recently suffered exile and living an alien among foreigners. And had lost my fortune, in addition, I saw my mother and my sister driven from their native land and ending their lives in a foreign land among strangers. No one could justly begrudge it me, therefore, if I have received some benefit from the troublesome affairs of Thrasylarchus, for it was to gratify him that I went to live in Trozen, where I experienced misfortunes so dire that I shall never be able to forget them. Furthermore, there is one thing my opponents cannot say of me that when Thrasylarchus was prosperous I suffered all these woes, but that I abandoned him in his adversity. For it was precisely then that I gave clearer and stronger proof of my devotion to him. When, for instance, he settled in Aegina and fell ill of the malady which resulted in his death, I nursed him with a care such as no one else I know of has ever bestowed upon another. Most of the time he was very ill, yet still able to go about, finally he lay for six months bedridden and no one of his relations saw fit to share with me the drudgery of caring for him. No one even came to see him with the exception of his mother and sister, and they made the task more difficult, for they were ill when they came from Trozen, so that they themselves were in need of care. But although the others were thus indifferent, I did not grow weary nor did I leave the scene, but I nursed him with the help of one slave boy, for no one of the domestics could stand it. For being by nature irascible, he became, because of his malady, still more difficult to handle. It should not occasion surprise, therefore, that these persons would not remain with him, but it is much more a cause for wonder that I was able to hold out in caring for a man sick of such a malady, for he was filled with pus for a long time, and was unable to leave his bed, and his suffering was so great that we did not pass a single day without tears, but kept up our lamentations both for the hardships we both had to endure, and for our exile and our isolation. And there was no intermission at any time. For it was impossible to leave him or to seem to neglect him to me this would have seemed more dreadful than the woes which afflicted us. I wish I could make clearly apparent to you my conduct with respect to him, for in that case I think that you would not endure even a word from my opponents. The truth is, it is not easy to describe the duties involved in my care of the invalid, duties that were very hard, very difficult to endure, most disagreeably toilsome, and exacting and unremitting care. But do you yourselves consider what loss of sleep, what miseries are the inevitable accompaniment of a prolonged nursing of a malady like his? In truth, in my own case, I was reduced to such a condition that all my friends who visited me expressed fear that I too would perish with the dying man and they advised me to take care, saying that the majority of those who had nursed this disease themselves fell victims to it also. My reply to them was this that I would much prefer to die than to see him perish before his fated day for lack of a friend to nurse him. And although my behaviour was as I have described, this woman has had the hardihood to contest with me his fortune, she who never even saw fit to visit him during his long illness, though she had daily information about his condition, and though the journey was easy for her. To think that they will now attempt to brother him, as if the effect of calling the dead man by a manner of closer kinship would not be to make her shortcomings seem worse and more shocking. Why, when he was at the point of death, and when she saw all our fellow citizens who were in Trozen sailing to Aegina to take part in his funeral, she did not even at that moment come, but was so cruel and heartless in conduct that while she did not see fit to come to his funeral, yet, less than ten days thereafter she arrived to claim the property he had left, as if she were related to his money and not to him. And if she will admit that her hatred for him was so bitter that this conduct was reasonable. Then Thrasylarchus would be considered not to have been ill-advised in preferring to leave his property to his friends rather than to this woman. But if there existed no variance between them and yet she was so neglectful of him and so unkind toward him, surely with greater justice would she be deprived of her own possessions than become heir to his. Bear in mind that, so far as she was concerned, he had no care during his illness, nor when he died was he thought worthy of the customary funeral rites, whereas it was through me that he obtained both. 
surely you will justly cast your votes in favour, not of those who claim blood relationship yet in their conduct have acted like enemies, but with much greater propriety you will side with those who, though having no title of relationship, yet showed themselves, when the deceased was in misfortune. More nearly akin than the nearest relatives. My opponents say that they do not doubt that Thrasylarchus left the will, but they assert that it is not honourable and proper. And yet, citizens of Aegina, how could anyone have given better or greater evidence of interest in the disposal of his own property? He did not leave his home without heirs and he has shown due gratitude to his friends and, further, he made his mother and his sister possessors, not only of their own property, but of mine also by giving the latter to me as wife and by making me, by adoption, the son of the former. Would he have acted more wisely if he had taken the alternative course if he had failed to appoint a protector for his mother, and if he had made no mention of me, but had abandoned his sister to chance and permitted the name of his family to perish? But perhaps I was unworthy of being adopted as a son by Thrasylarchus and of receiving his sister in marriage. All the Siphnians would bear witness. However, that my ancestors were foremost of the citizens there in birth, in wealth, in reputation, and in general standing. For who were thought worthy of higher offices, or made greater contributions, or served as Karegi more handsomely, or discharged other special public services with greater magnificence? What family in Siphnos has furnished more kings? Thrasylarchus, therefore, even if I had never spoken to him, would reasonably have wished to give his sister to me just for these reasons, and I, even if I had not possessed any of these advantages, but had been the lowest of the citizens, would justly have been esteemed by him as deserving of the greatest recompenses by reason of the services I had rendered him. I believe, moreover, that in making this disposition of his estate he did what was most pleasing to his brother Sopolis also. For Sopolis also hated this woman and regarded her as ill disposed toward his interests. Whereas he valued me above all his friends. He showed this feeling for me in many ways and in particular when our companions in exile determined, with the help of their auxiliary troops, to capture the city. For when he was designated leader with full powers he both chose me as secretary and appointed me treasurer of all funds, and when we were about to engage in battle, he placed me next to himself and consider how greatly he profited thereby, for when our attack on the city met with ill success, and the retreat did not succeed as we desired, and when he was wounded, unable to walk and in a faint condition, I and my servant carried him off on our shoulders to the ship. Consequently he often said to many persons that I was solely responsible for his coming through alive. Yet what greater benefaction than this could a man receive? Moreover, when he had sailed to Lycia and died there, this woman, a few days after the news of his death, was sacrificing and holding festival. And had no shame before his surviving brother. So, so little regard did she have for the dead man, but I instituted mourning for him in the custom prescribed for relatives. And it was my character and my affection for the two brothers that moved me to do all this and not any expectation of this trial, for I did not think that both would come to such an unhappy end that by dying without children they were going to oblige us to prove how each one of us had felt and acted toward them. How this woman and myself conducted ourselves toward Thrasylarchus and Sopolis you have, in the main heard, but perhaps they will have recourse to the one argument which remains to them that Thrasyllus, the father of this woman, will feel that he is being dishonored if the dead have any perception of happenings in this world when he sees his daughter being deprived of her fortune and me becoming the heir of what he had acquired. But I am of opinion that it is proper for us to speak here, not concerning those who died long ago, but of those who recently left their heritage. As to Thrasyllus, he left as possessors of his estate the persons of his choice, and it is only just, then, that to Thrasylarchus also the same privilege should be granted by you, and that not this woman, but those whom he designated in his will, should become the successors to the inheritance. However, I do not believe that I need evade the judgment of Thrasyllus. He would be, I think, the most harsh judge of all for her, if he knows how she has treated his children. If you should vote in accordance with the laws, he would be far from taking offence, but he would be far more incensed if he should see the testaments of his children annulled. If, for instance, Thrasylarchus had given property to my family, they would have had reason to lay that up against him, as it is, he adopted into his own family, so that the plaintiffs have not received less than they gave. Apart from this, it is reasonable to suppose that Thrasyllus, more than anyone else, was friendly toward those whose claims are based upon a testamentary gift. For he himself learned his art from Polymerinitus the soothsayer, and received his fortune, not through family relationship but through merit, surely, therefore, he would not complain if a man who had acted honourably toward his children should be regarded as deserving of the same reward as himself. 
you should call to mind also what I said in the beginning. For I pointed out to you that he esteemed relationship with our family so highly that he married the sister and then the cousin of my father. And yet to whom would he more willingly have given his own daughter in marriage than to that family from which he himself chose his wife? And from what family would he have more gladly seen a son adopted according to law than that from which he sought to beget? Children of his own body? If therefore, you award the inheritance to me, you will stand well with Thrasyllus and with all others who have any proper interest in this matter, but if you permit yourselves to be deceived by the persuasion of this woman, not only will you do injury to me, but also to Thrasylarchus, the testator, and to Sopolis, and to their sister, who is now my wife, and their mother, who would be the unhappiest of women if it should not be enough for her to have lost her children, but also must. See this additional sorrow that their wishes are nullified, her family without an heir, and this woman, as she exults over her misfortunes, making good at law her claim to the property, while I am unable to obtain my just rights, although my treatment of her sons has been such that, if anyone should compare me I will not say with this woman. But with any who have ever entered their claim to an inheritance on the strength of testamentary gift I should be found to have been inferior to none in my conduct toward my friends. And yet men of my kind ought to be honoured and esteemed rather than be robbed of the gifts which others have bestowed upon them. It is expedient, too, that you should uphold the law which permits us to adopt children and to dispose wisely of our property, reflecting that for men who are childless this law takes the place of children, for it is owing this law that both kinsmen and those who are not related take greater care of each other. But that I may conclude and occupy no more time in speaking, pray consider how strong and how just are the claims with which I have come before you, there is, first, my friendship with those who have left the inheritance, a friendship of ancient origin, handed down from our fathers, and in all that time never broken, second, my many great acts of kindness done for them in their adversity, third, there is a will which my opponents themselves acknowledge, and lastly, the law, which supports the will, a law that in the opinion of all Greeks is regarded as wisely made. Of my statement the best proof is this although the Greek states differ in opinion about many other enactments, they are of one accord concerning this one. I beg you, therefore, bearing in mind both these considerations and the others I have mentioned, to give a just verdict, and prove yourselves to be for me such judges as you would want to have for yourselves. Against Lokites. Well then, that Lokite struck me and was the aggressor all who were present when the event occurred have testified to you. But this offence should not be regarded as similar to other breaches of the law, nor should the penalty imposed for injury to the person be no greater than that which is inflicted for cheating a man of money. For you know that one's person is of nearest concern to all men. And that it is for the protection of the person that we have established laws, that we fight for freedom, that we have our hearts set on the democratic form of government, and that all the activities of our lives are directed to this end. And so it is reasonable to expect you to punish with the greatest severity those who do wrong to you in respect to that which you prize most dearly. You will find that our legislators also have had the greatest concern for our persons. For, in the first place, it is for this one kind of misdemeanor only that they have instituted public and private actions that require no preliminary court deposit, with the intent that each of us, according to what may happen to be within his power and agreeable to his wish, may be able to exact punishment from those who wrong him. In the next place, in the case of other charges, the culprit may be prosecuted by the injured party only, but where assault and battery is involved. As the public interest is affected, any citizen who so desires may give notice of a public suit to the thesmothetes and appear before your court. And our lawgivers regarded the giving of blows as an offence of such gravity that even for abusive language they made a law to the effect that those who used any of the forbidden opprobrious terms should pay a fine of 500 drachmas. And yet how severe should the penalty be on behalf of those who have actually suffered bodily injury, when you show yourself so angry for the protection of those who have merely suffered verbal injury? It would be astonishing if, while you judge to be worthy of death those who were guilty of battery under the oligarchy, you shall allow to go unpunished those who, under the democracy, are guilty of the same practices. And yet the latter would justly meet with a more severe punishment, for they reveal more conspicuously their real baseness. This is what I mean, if anyone has the effrontery to transgress the law now. When it is not permissible. What would he have done, I ask you, when the government in power actually was grateful to such malefactors? It may be that Lokites will attempt to belittle the importance of the affair, and ridiculing my accusation will say that I suffered no injury from his blows and that I am unduly exaggerating the gravity of what occurred. 
My reply to this is, that if no assault and battery had been connected with the affair, I should never have come before you, but as it is, it is not because of the mere injury inflicted by his blows that I am seeking satisfaction from him, but for the humiliation and the indignity, and it is that sort of thing which free men should especially resent and for which they should obtain the greatest requital. I observe that you, when you find anyone guilty of the robbery of a temple or of theft, do not assess the fine according to the value of what is stolen, but that you condemn all alike to death. And that you consider it just that those who attempt to commit the same crime should pay the same penalty. You should, therefore, be of the same mind with respect to those who commit battery, and not consider whether they did not maul their victims thoroughly, but whether they transgressed the law, and you should punish them, not merely for the chance outcome of the attack, but for their character as a whole, reflecting that often ere now petty causes have been responsible for great evils, and that, because there are persons who have the effrontery to beat others, there have been cases where men have become so enraged that wounds, death, exile, and the greatest calamities have resulted. That no one of these consequences happened in my case is not due to the defendant, on the contrary, so far as he is concerned they have all taken place, and it was only by the grace of fortune and my character that no irreparable harm has been done. I think that you would be as indignant as the circumstances merit if you should reflect how much more reprehensible this misdemeanor is than any others. For you will find that while the other unjust acts impair life only partially, malicious assault vitiates all our concerns, since it has destroyed many households and rendered desolate many cities. And yet why need I waste time in speaking of the calamities of the other states? For we ourselves have twice seen the democracy overthrown and twice we have been deprived of freedom, not by those who were guilty of other crimes, but by persons who contemned the laws and were willing to be slaves of the enemy while wantonly outraging their fellow citizens. Lokites is one of these persons. For even though he was too young to have belonged to the oligarchy established at that time, yet his character at any rate is in harmony with their regime. For it was men of like disposition who betrayed our power to the enemy, raised the walls of the fatherland, and put to death without a trial fifteen hundred citizens. We may reasonably expect that you, remembering the past, will punish not only those who then did us harm, but also those who wish now to bring our city into the same condition as then, and you should punish potential criminals with greater severity than the malefactors of the past in so far as it is better to find how to avert future evils than to exact the penalty for past misdeeds. Do not wait for the time when these enemies shall unite, seize an opportune moment, and bring ruin upon the whole city, but whenever on any pretext they are delivered into your hands, punish them, thinking it a stroke of luck when you catch a man who in petty derelictions reveals his complete depravity. It would indeed have been best, if only some distinguishing mark were borne by men of base nature, that we might punish them before any fellow citizen has been injured by them. But since it is impossible to perceive who such men are before a victim has suffered at their hands, at any rate as soon as their character is recognized. It is the duty of all men to hate them and to regard them as enemies of all mankind. Remember, too, that while the poor have no share in the danger of loss of property, yet fear of injury to our persons is common to all alike, in consequence, whenever you punish thieves and cheats you benefit only the rich, but whenever you chastise those who commit mayhem, you give aid to yourselves. You should therefore treat trials such as this as of the highest importance, and while in suits involving private contracts you should assess the plaintiff's damages at only what it is fitting that he should receive, when the case is assault and battery the defendant should be required to pay so large a sum that he will in future refrain from his present unbridled wantonness. If, then, you deprive of their property those who conduct themselves with wanton violence toward their fellow citizens and regard no fine as severe enough to punish those who do injury to the persons of others and have to pay the penalty with their money, you will then have discharged in full measure the duty of conscientious judges. Indeed in the present case you will thus render the correct judgment, will cause our other citizens to be more decorous in conduct, and will make your own lives more secure. And it is the part of intelligent judges, while casting their votes for justice in causes not their own, at the same time to safeguard their own interests also. Let no one of you think, just because he observes that I am a poor man and a man of the people, that the amount I claim should be reduced. For it is unjust that you should reckon the indemnification to be given to plaintiffs who are obscure as of less importance than that which men of distinction are to receive, and that the poor be thought inferior to the rich. For you would be lowering your own civic status if you should reach any such decisions where the many are concerned. 
Besides, it would be a most shocking state of affairs if in a democratic state we should not all enjoy equal rights, and if, while judging ourselves worthy of holding office, yet we deprive ourselves of our legal rights, and if in battle we should all be willing to die for our democratic form of government and yet, in our votes as judges, especially favor men of property. No, if you will be advised by me, you will not assume that position toward your own selves. You will not teach the young men to have contempt for the mass of our citizens, nor consider that trials of this character are of no concern to you, on the contrary, each one of you will cast his ballot as if he were judging his own case. In truth, those who dare to transgress the law that protects your persons do injury to all alike. And so, if you are wise, exhort one another. And reveal to Lokites your own wrath. For you know that all individuals of his kind despise the established laws, but regard as law the decisions rendered here. I have spoken as well as I could about the matter at issue, if anyone present has anything to say on my behalf, let him mount the platform and address you. Against you Thinus. I have no lack of reasons for speaking in behalf of the plaintiff Nishas, for it so happens that he is my friend, that he is in need, that he is the victim of injustice, and that he has no ability as a speaker, for all these reasons, therefore, I am compelled to speak on his behalf. The circumstances in which the transaction between Nishas and Euthynus came to be made I shall relate to you in as few words as I can. This Nishas, the plaintiff, after the thirty tyrants came into power and his enemies threatened to expunge his name from the number of those who were to have the rights of citizenship, and to include him in Lysander's list, being in fear of the state of affairs. Mortgaged his house. Sent his slaves outside of Attica, conveyed his furniture to my house, gave in trust three talents of silver to Euthynus, and went to live in the country. Not long after this, desiring to take ship, he asked for the return of his money, Euthynus restored two talents, but denied that he had received the third. At that time Nicias was unable to take any further action, but he went to his friends and with complaints and recriminations told them how he had been treated. And yet he regarded Euthyna so highly and was in such fear of the government that he would sooner by far have been defrauded of a small sum and held his peace than have made complaints where no loss was suffered. Such are the facts. But our cause presents difficulties. For Nishas, both when he was depositing the money and when he tried to get it back, had no one with him, either freeman or slave, thus it is impossible either by torture of slaves or by testimony to get at the facts. But it is by circumstantial evidence that we must plead and you must judge which side speaks the truth. I think that you all know that malicious prosecution is most generally attempted by those who are clever speakers but possess nothing, whereas the defendants lack skill in speaking but are able to pay money. Well, Nishas is better off than Euthynus, but has less ability as a speaker, so that there is no reason why he should have proceeded against Euthynus unjustly. No indeed, but from the very facts in the case anyone can see that it is far more probable that Euthynus received the money and then denied having done so than that Nishas did not entrust it to him and then entered his complaint. For it is self-evident that it is always for the sake of gain that men do wrong. Now those who defraud others are in possession of the fruit of their crimes, but their accusers do not even know if they shall get back anything. Besides, when conditions in the city were unsettled and the courts were suspended, it was useless for Nishas to sue Euthynus and the latter had no cause for fear though guilty of the fraud. It was not surprising, therefore, at a time when those who had borrowed money even in the presence of witnesses denied it, that Euthynus should have robbed him of what he had received from him when neither was accompanied by witnesses. And it is not probable that at a time when not even those to whom money was justly owed could recover it, Nishas should have believed that he could obtain anything by an unjust accusation. And again, even if nothing had stood in his way and he could have brought a false accusation against him and wished to do so, it can easily be seen that Nishas would not have proceeded against Euthynus. For those who desire to act in this way do not begin with their friends, but in alliance with them proceed against others and accuse those for whom they have neither respect nor fear, persons whom they see to be rich, but friendless and helpless. Well then, in the case of Euthynus the opposite is true. He is the cousin of Nishas and has greater ability in speech and action. And although he has little money, he has many friends. In consequence, he is the last person whom Nishas would have proceeded against. And, in my opinion, knowing as I do their intimacy, neither would Euthynus ever have acted unjustly toward Nishas if he could have defrauded someone else of so large a sum. But as it was, their transaction was simple. It is possible to choose whomever you please from the whole body of citizens for accusation, but you can defraud only the man who has entrusted a deposit with you.
Thus Nishas, if he had desired to get money by blackmail, would not have proceeded against Euthinus, but the latter, when he resorted to fraud, had no other victim available. But here is the strongest evidence and sufficient in every respect. When the charge was made, the oligarchy was in power, in which the situation of the two men was as follows, Nishas, even if he had been accustomed in former times to bring malicious accusations, then would have given up the practice. Whereas Euthinus, even if he had never before given a thought to wrongdoing, then would have been tempted to act thus. For his misdeeds were bringing him honours, but Nishas, because of his wealth, was the object of plotting. For you are all aware that, at that time, it was a greater danger to be wealthy than to engage in wrongdoing, for the evildoers were seizing the property of others, whereas the rich were losing their own. For it was the custom of those in whose hands the control of the city was, not to punish those who were guilty of offences, but to despoil the possessors of property, and they regarded the criminals as loyal and the wealthy as inimical. Consequently it was not the problem before Nishas how he might get possession of the property of others by bringing malicious accusations, but how he might not be made a victim of wrongdoing, although himself innocent. For while any man who possessed the influence of Euthinus could steal what he had received on deposit and also bring charges against those to whom he had lent nothing. Yet those who were in Nisha's position were compelled to absolve their debtors of just debts and to surrender their own property to blackmailers. Euthinus himself could testify to the truth of what I say, for he knows that Timodemus extorted thirty miners from Nisha's, not by demanding the payment of a debt, but by threatening him with summary arrest. And yet is it probable that Nishas went so far in folly that he was bringing malicious charges against others when his own life was in jeopardy, that he was plotting to get the goods of others when he was unable to protect his own, that he was making other enemies in addition to those he already had, that he was unjustly accusing persons from whom, even if they confessed the theft, he could not have exacted punishment, and that he was trying to get the better of others at the time when even to have equality with them was beyond his power, and, finally, at the time when he was being forced to pay back what he had not received, he hoped to collect what he had not lent. Enough has been said concerning these matters. Perhaps Euthinus will repeat what indeed he has already said, that, if he had been trying to defraud Nishas, he never would have returned two-thirds of the deposit, while withholding merely the third part. But that whether he was intent upon acting unjustly or wished to act justly, he would have had the same intention in regard to the whole amount. But you all know, I think, that all men, when they set about committing a crime, at the same time are looking about for a plea in defence, consequently, it should occasion no surprise that Euthinus, in view of this very argument, committed the crime. Besides, I could point out other men also who, after having received money, have restored the major portion of it, but retained a small part, and men who, though guilty of dishonesty in petty contracts, yet in important ones have shown themselves honest, therefore, Euthinus is not the only person, nor yet the first, who has acted so. You must remember that, if you ever countenance such a plea by defendants, you will be establishing a legal provision as to the way a fraud should be committed, consequently, in the future, holders of deposits will indeed return a part, but will retain a part for themselves. For it will be to their advantage. If they can use their repayment of some as presumptive proof so that they will not be punished for their stealing the rest. Consider, also, that it is easy to use on behalf of Nisha's arguments similar to those employed in the defense of Euthinus. For instance, when Nishas recovered the two talents, no one was present as his witness, so that, if he wanted to make a malicious accusation and that seemed best to him, it is obvious that he would not have acknowledged the receipt of even the two talents, but would have made the same plea for the entire amount, in that case, Euthinus would now be liable to lose even a larger sum, and at the same time he would not be able to use the presumptive proof on which he now depends. And, furthermore, no one can point to any culpable motive whatever that led Nishas to enter an accusation against Euthinus, but as to Euthinus, it is easy to see the reasons which induced him to commit a crime in that manner. For then Nishas was in adversity, all his relations and friends had heard him say that he had deposited his money with Euthinus. Euthinus knew. Therefore, that many persons were aware that the money was in his keeping, but that no one knew the amount, in consequence he thought that if he diminished the amount he would not be found out, but if he withheld the whole sum, his guilt would be manifest. Therefore, he chose to take enough and have left a plea in his defence rather than to pay nothing back and be left without a possibility of denial. The Letters Translated by George Norlin To Dionysius
If I were younger, I should not be sending you a letter, but should myself take ship and converse with you there, but inasmuch as it so happens that the fruitful period of my life and that of your own affairs have not coincided since I am already spent with years, and with you it is the high time for action I shall try to disclose to you my views about the situation as well as I can in the circumstances. I know, to be sure, that when men essay to give advice, it is far preferable that they should come in person rather than send a letter, not only because it is easier to discuss the same matters face to face than to give their views by letter, nor yet because all men give greater credence to the spoken rather than to the written word, since they listen to the former as to practical advice and to the latter as to an artistic composition, but also, in addition to these reasons, in personal converse. If anything that is said is either not understood or not believed, one who is presenting the arguments, being present, can come to the rescue in either case, but when written missives are used and any such misconception arises, there is no one to correct it, for since the writer is not at hand, the defender is lacking. Nevertheless, since you are to be the judge in this matter, I have great hope that I shall prove to be saying something of value, as I think you will disregard all the difficulties just mentioned and will direct your attention to the matters themselves. And yet, certain persons who have been admitted to your presence have attempted to frighten me, saying that while you honor flatterers, you despise those who offer you advice. If I had believed their words, I should have remained quiet, but as it is, no one could persuade me that it is possible that a man should so surpass others in both judgment and action, unless he has become a learner, a listener, and a discoverer. And has drawn to himself and collected from every possible source those means which will enable him to exercise his own intellectual ability. It was for these reasons, then, that I have been moved to write you. I intend to speak to you about important matters, matters about which no living person may more fittingly hear than you. And do not think that I am earnestly urging you in this way that you may become a listener to a rhetorical composition, for I am not, as it happens, in a mood to seek glory through rhetorical showpieces, nor am I unaware that you on your part are sated with such offerings. Furthermore, one thing is evident to all, that while our public festivals offer fitting occasions to those who want to make an oratorical display for their, in the presence of the greatest numbers, they may spread the fame of their eloquence abroad, yet those who wish to bring some serious thing to pass should address the man who is likely most promptly to accomplish indeed that which the word has proposed. No, if I were offering advice to some particular state, I should address its leading men. But since I have determined to give counsel looking to the salvation of all Hellenes, to whom could I more appropriately address myself than to him who is the foremost of our race and the possessor of the greatest power? In truth, it will be seen that not inopportunely I make mention of these matters. For when the Lacedaemonians were in power, it was not easy for you to take upon yourself the responsibility for the affairs in our region, nor to oppose the Lacedaemonians and at the same time fight the Carthaginians. But now, when the Lacedaemonians are in such a plight that they are content if they can remain in possession of their own land, and when our city would gladly join with you as ally in any struggle that you should care to make in behalf of the welfare of Greece, how could there befall a more favourable opportunity than that which now presents itself to you? Do not think it strange that I, who am not an orator who moves public assemblies, nor a leader of armies, nor otherwise a man of power, I'm undertaking so difficult an affair and am attempting two of the most serious things to speak on behalf of Greece and at the same time to give counsel to you. For at the beginning of my career I stood aloof from participation in public affairs the reasons for this would be tedious to relate, but of that culture which contemns the petty things and attempts to achieve the great things I should not be found to be entirely destitute. Consequently, it would not be surprising if I should be better able to see something to our advantage than those whose public life has been but guesswork, though they have acquired great renown. And so, without further delay, but from what will presently be said, I shall make it clear whether I really am worth listening to. To Philip, 1. I know that all men are accustomed to be more grateful to those who praise them than to those who give them counsel, especially if one offers his advice unbidden. And if I had not on a former occasion given you with most kindly intent such counsel as I believed would lead to a course of action worthy of one in your position. Perhaps even now I should not be undertaking to declare my view concerning what I has happened to you. But since I then did decide to concern myself your affairs, in the interests of my own state and of the other Greeks as well, I should be ashamed if, when comparatively unimportant things were the issue, I am known to have offered you advice, yet now I should have nothing to say concerning more urgent matters, particularly since I realize that in the former case your reputation alone was at stake, whereas at present it is your personal safety, which you have been thought to esteem too. Likely by all who heard the abusive reproaches directed against you. 
In truth there is no one who has not condemned you as being more reckless in assuming risks than is becoming to a king, and as caring more for men's praise of your courage than for the general welfare. For it is equally disgraceful, when your enemies threaten on every side, not to prove yourself superior to all the rest. And, when no urgent need has arisen, to hurl yourself into combats of such a kind that, if you succeeded, you would have accomplished nothing of importance, but if you lost your life, you would have destroyed all your present good fortune. Not every death in war must be regarded as honourable, on the contrary, although when death is incurred for fatherland, for parents, and for children it is worthy of praise, yet when it brings harm to all of these and tarnishes the brilliance of past successes, it should be thought disgraceful and should be avoided as being the cause of great discredit. I think that you would profitably imitate the fashion in which our city-states conduct the business of warfare. They all are accustomed, when they send forth an army, to take measures to secure the safety of the government and of the authority which is to decide what is to be done in the emergency. In consequence, if a single mischance befalls, their power is not also wholly destroyed. On the contrary, they can sustain many misfortunes and again recover their strength. This principle you too should take into consideration, and consider no blessing more important than your safety, in order that you may not only duly make use of the victories which may be yours but also may rectify the mischances that may befall you. You might observe that the Lacedaemonians also are extremely solicitous for the safety of their kings, and appoint the most distinguished of the citizens as their bodyguards, and that for them it is a greater disgrace to suffer the kings to meet death than to throw away their shields. And surely you are not unaware of what happened to Xerxes when he wished to enslave the Greeks and to Cyrus when he laid claim to the kingdom. Thus Xerxes, although he had suffered defeats and calamities of such magnitude the like of which have never been known to befall other kings, because he preserved his life. Not only retained his throne and handed it over to his children. But also so administered Asia that it was no less formidable to the Greeks than before. Cyrus, however, after he had conquered all the military might of the king, would have gained mastery of the throne had it not been for his rashness, which caused him not only to forfeit that mighty empire, but brought his followers into extreme danger. And I could mention very many men who, becoming commanders of great armies, because they were slain before they need have died, brought destruction at the same time upon countless numbers of their followers. Bearing these examples in mind, you should not honour that courage which accompanies heedless folly and unseasonable ambition, nor, when so many hazards which are inherent in monarchy are at hand, should you devise for yourself still others that bring no glory and belong to the common soldier, nor should you vie with those who wish to escape from an unhappy existence or who rashly incur danger in the hope of a higher wage. Nor should you desire such glory as many. Both Greeks and barbarians, obtain, but rather that exalted renown which you alone of living men could win. Nor should you be enamoured of such virtues as even ignoble men share, but only of those of which no base person may partake, nor wage inglorious and difficult wars when honourable and easy ones are possible, nor those which will cause grief and anxiety to your closest friends and arouse great hope in your enemies, as even now you have done. Nay, as to the barbarians with whom you are now waging war, it will suffice you to gain the mastery over them only so far as to secure the safety of your own territory, but the king who is now called great you will attempt to overthrow, that you may both enhance your own renown and may point out to the Greek world who the enemy is against whom they should wage war. I should have greatly preferred to send you this letter before your campaign in order that, had you heeded my advice, you might not have incurred so great danger. Or if you had rejected it, I should not now seem to be advising that same caution which has already, because of the wound you received, been approved by all, but, instead, your misfortune would be bearing witness to the truth of what I had said about the matter. Although I have much more to say, because of the nature of the subject, I will cease, for I think that you and the ablest of your companions will readily add as much as you wish to what I have said. Besides, I fear my advice may be inopportune, for even now I have unawares gradually drifted beyond the due proportions of a letter and run into a lengthy discourse. Nevertheless, although this is the case, I must not omit discussion of the affairs of the city of Athens, on the contrary, I must try to urge you to cultivate friendly relations and intimacy with her. For I think there are many who report to you and tell you not only the most disparaging of the things said of you among us, but also add their own inventions. But it is not reasonable for you to pay any attention to these persons. For you would in fact be acting inconsistently if you should find fault with our people for lending a ready ear to your calumniators, but yourself should be found giving credence to those who practice this art and should not perceive that the more easily influenced by nobody such persons declare our city to be, the better suited to your ends they prove it.
for if those who are powerless to be of any service to Athens can accomplish by words alone what they wish, surely it is right to expect that you, who are able in very deed to confer upon her the greatest benefits, would not fail to gain from us anything whatever. To the bitter accusers of our city I think I should place in contrast those who say that the very opposite is true. That is, those who assert that she has done no wrong at all, whether great or small. For my part, I would not make any such claim, for I should be ashamed if, while men in general do not regard even the gods as blameless, I should dare to affirm that our city had never transgressed at all. Nevertheless, this I can say of Athens that you could not find a city more useful to all the Greeks and to your enterprises, and to this fact you should give your special attention. For not only as your ally would she bring about many advantages to you, but even if she merely was believed to be on friendly terms with you. For you might then more easily keep in subjection those who are now under your sway, if they should have no refuge, and of the barbarians you could more quickly conquer any you should wish. Yet is there any reason why you should not eagerly grasp at a relationship of goodwill such that you will hold securely not only your present dominion, but also without risk acquire another great one? I marvel that so many who maintain great forces hire mercenary armies and expend so much money on them. Although they know that such help has been the cause of greater injury than of salvation to those who relied upon them, and have made no effort to gain the friendship of a city which possesses such power that it has ere now often saved every Hellenic state and indeed all Greece. Consider, too, that to many you appear to have been well advised because your treatment of the Thessalians has been just and advantageous to them, although they are a people not easy to handle, but high-spirited and seditious. You should, therefore, endeavour to show yourself equally prudent towards us also, knowing as you do that, while the Thessalians have the territory next to you, it is we who are next to you in strength and influence, and that is what you should seek in every way to win for yourself. For it is a much greater glory to capture the goodwill of cities than their walls, for achievements like the latter not only engender ill will. But men attribute the credit for them to your armies. Yet if you are able to win friendships and goodwill, all will praise the wisdom shown by you. You may well believe me in what I have said concerning Athens, for you will find that I have not been accustomed to flatter her in my discourses, on the contrary, more than anyone else I have censured her, nor am I highly esteemed by the masses or by those who form their opinions offhand, but, like yourself, I am misunderstood and disliked by them. But we are dissimilar in this, that they are thus disposed toward you because of your power and prosperity, but toward me because I lay claim to a wisdom greater than their own, and they see that more people wish to converse with me than with themselves. I could wish that it were equally easy for us both to dispel the prejudice in which we are held by these, but as it is, you will put an end to it without difficulty if you wish, but I must be content with the standing I now have because of my old age and for many other reasons. I know not what more I need to say. Except this only that it will be a fine thing for you to entrust your royal power and your existing prosperity into the keeping of the goodwill of the Hellenic race. To Philip, too. I have discussed with Antipater the course which is expedient for our city and for you, at sufficient length, I am convinced, but I wish to write to you also regarding the action which I think should be taken after the conclusion of peace, and while this advice is similar to that in my discourse, it is, however, expressed much more concisely. At that time, you recall, I counseled you that, after you had reconciled our city with Sparta, Thebes, and Argos, you should bring all the Greeks into concord, as I was of opinion that if you should persuade the principal cities to be favourably inclined to such a course, the others also would quickly follow. At that time, however, the state of affairs was different, and now it has come to pass that the need of persuasion no longer exists. For on account of the battle which has taken place, all are compelled to be prudent and to desire that which they surmise you wish to do and to say, namely, that they must desist from the madness and the spirit of aggrandizement, which they were wont to display in their relations with each other, and must carry the war into Asia. Many inquire of me whether I advised you to make the expedition against the barbarians or whether it was your idea and I concurred. I reply that I do not know for certain, since before then I had not been acquainted with you, but that I supposed that you had reached a decision in this matter and that I in my speech had fallen, with your desires. On hearing this, all entreated me to encourage you and to exhort you to hold fast to this same resolution, since they believe that no achievement could be more glorious, more useful to the Greeks, or more timely than this will be. If I possessed the same vigour which I formerly had and were not utterly spent with years, I should not be speaking with you by letter. But in your presence should myself be spurring and summoning you to undertake these tasks. But even as it is, I do exhort you, as best I can, not to put these matters aside until you bring them to a successful conclusion. 
to have an insatiate desire for anything else in the world is ignoble for moderation is generally esteemed but to set the heart upon a glory that is great and honourable, and never to be satiated with it, befits those men who have far excelled all others. And that is true of you. Be assured that a glory unsurpassable and worthy of the deeds you have done in the past will be yours when you shall compel the barbarians all but those who have fought on your side to be serfs of the Greeks, and when you shall force the king who is now called great to do whatever you command. For then will naught be left for you except to become a god. And to accomplish all this from your present status is much easier for you than it was for you to advance to the power and renown you now possess from the kingship which you had in the beginning. I am grateful to my old age for this reason alone, because it has prolonged my life to this moment, so that the dreams of my youth, which I attempted to commit to writing both in my panegyricus and in the discourse which was sent to you, I am now seeing in part already coming to fulfilment through your achievements and in part one have hopes of their future realization. To Antipater. Although it is dangerous for us here in Athens to send a letter to Macedonia, not only now when we are at war with you, but even in time of peace, nevertheless I have decided to write to you concerning Diodotus, as I think it only right to esteem highly all those who have been my pupils and who have shown themselves worthy disciples, and not the least among them this man both because of his devotion to me and of the general probity of his character. I wish that if possible I might have been the means of his introduction to you, since, however, he has already met you through the kindness of others. It remains for me to give my testimony concerning him and to strengthen the acquaintance which he already has with you. For although many men of various countries have been my pupils and some of these are of great repute, and while of all the others some have proved to be distinguished for eloquence alone, and others in intellect and in practical affairs, and still others have indeed been men of sobriety of life and cultivated tastes, but for general usefulness in the practical affairs of life utterly devoid of natural ability, yet Diodotus has been endowed with a nature so well balanced that in all the attributes I have named he is quite perfect. All this I should not dare to say of him if I did not possess the most precise knowledge of him gained by experience, and if I were not anticipating that you would gain the same, partly through your own association with him and partly from the testimony of his acquaintances, of whom there is no one who would not agree. Unless he be exceedingly envious. That Diodotus is inferior to none in eloquence and counsel, and that he is very honest, temperate, and self-controlled in respect to money. Nay more, to spend the day with and to live with he is a most charming and agreeable companion. In addition to these good qualities he possesses frankness in the highest degree, not that outspokenness which is objectionable, but that which would rightly be regarded as the surest indication of devotion to his friends. This is the sort of frankness which princes, if they have worthy and fitting greatness of soul, honour as being useful, while those whose natural gifts are weaker than the powers they possess take such frankness ill as if it forced them to act in some degree contrary to their desires ignorant as they are that those who dare to speak out most fearlessly in opposition to measures in which expediency is the issue are the very persons who can provide them with more power than others to accomplish what they wish. For it stands to reason that it is because of those who always and by choice speak to please that not only monarchies cannot endure since monarchies are liable to numerous inevitable dangers but even constitutional governments as well. Though they they enjoy greater security, whereas it is owing to those who speak with absolute frankness in favour of what is best that many things are preserved even of those which seem doomed to destruction. For these reasons it is indeed fitting that in the courts of all monarchs those who declare the truth should be held in greater esteem than those who, though they aim to gratify in all they say, yet say naught that merits gratitude, in fact, however, the former find less favour with some princes. This experience Diodotus has met within his relations with some of the potentates of Asia, to whom he had often been of service, not only in offering counsel, but also in venturing upon dangerous deeds, because of his frankness of speech in matters involving their best interests he has been both deprived of honours he had at home and cheated of many hopes elsewhere, and the flattery of men of no consequence had greater weight than his own good services. That, then, is the reason why Diodotus although from time to time he entertained the thought of presenting himself to you, hesitated to do so, not because he believed that all his superiors were alike, but because the difficulties which he had experienced with these rulers caused him to be rather faint-hearted with reference also to the hopes he placed in you. That feeling was, I fancy, like that of some persons who have been at sea, who when they have once experienced a tempest, no longer with confidence embark upon a voyage, even though they know that one may often meet with a fair sailing. Nevertheless, now that he has met you, he is taking the right course. 
for I reason that this will be to his advantage, chiefly conjecturing so on the strength of that kindliness which you have been supposed among foreigners to possess, and partly believing you are not unaware that the most agreeable and profitable of all things is to win by one's kind deeds friends who are at the same time both loyal and useful. And to befriend men of such character that on their account many others also will be grateful to you. For all men of discrimination praise and honour those who are on intimate terms with superior men just as much as if they themselves were deriving profit from the services rendered. But I think that Diodotus himself will best induce you to take an interest in him. His son also I have advised to espouse your cause and by putting himself in your hands as a pupil, to try to advance himself. When I gave him this advice he declared that while he craved your friendship, yet he felt toward that very much as he does toward the athletic contests in which crowns are awarded to the victors, victory in them he would gladly win, but to enter the lists to gain them he would not dare, because he had not acquired the strength that would deserve the crowns. Similarly, while he longed to obtain the honours it is yours to bestow, yet he did not expect to attain them, for he is appalled not only by his own inexperience but also by the splendour of your position, furthermore. He believes that his poor body, not being sound but somewhat defective, will impede him in many activities. He will do, however, whatever he thinks expedient, and do you, I beg, whether he resides with you or remains inactive in that region, have a care for everything else which he may chance to need and especially for the personal safety of himself and of his father, considering them to be, as it were, a sacred trust committed to you by my old age, which might fittingly receive much consideration, and by the reputation I possess if this, to be sure, is worthy of any interest and by the goodwill which I have never ceased to have for you. And do not be surprised either if the letter I have written is too long, or if in it I have expressed myself in a somewhat too officious way and after the fashion of an old man, for everything else I have neglected and have had thought for this one thing alone to show my zeal on behalf of men who are my friends and who have become very dear to me. To Alexander. Since I am writing to your father I thought I should be acting in a strange manner if when you are in the same region as he, I should fail either to address you or to send you a greeting, or to write you something calculated to convince any reader that I am now not out of my mind through old age and that I do not babble like a fool, but that, on the contrary, the share of intelligence that still is left to me is not unworthy of the ability which as a younger man I possessed. I hear everyone say of you that you are a friend of mankind, a friend of Athens, and a friend of learning, not foolishly, but in sensible fashion. For they say that the Athenians whom you admit to your presence are not those men who have neglected their higher interests and have a lust for base things, but those rather whose constant companionship would not cause you regret and with whom association and partnership would not result in harm or injury to you just such men, indeed, as should be chosen as associates by the wise. As regards systems of philosophy, they say that while you do not indeed reject heuristic, but hold that it is valuable in private discussions, you regard it nevertheless as unsuitable for either those who are leaders of the people or for monarchs, for it is not expedient or becoming that those who regard themselves as superior to all others should themselves dispute with their fellow citizens or suffer anyone else to contradict them. But this branch of learning, I am told, you are not content with, but you choose rather the training which rhetoric gives, which is of use in the practical affairs of everyday life and aids us when we deliberate concerning public affairs. By means of this study you will come to know how at the present time to form reasonably sound opinions about the future, how not ineptly to instruct your subject peoples what each should do, how to form correct judgments about the right and the just and their opposites and, besides, to reward and chastise each class as it deserves. You act wisely, therefore, in devoting yourself to these studies. For you give hope to your father and to all the world that if, as you grow older, you hold fast to this course, you will as far surpass your fellow men in wisdom as your father has surpassed all mankind. To the children of Jason. One of our envoys who were sent to you has brought me word that you, summoning him apart from the others, asked whether I could be persuaded to go abroad and reside with you. And I for the sake of my friendship with Jason and Polyalces would gladly come to you, for I think such an association would benefit us all. Many things hinder me, however, especially my inability to travel and that it is unseemly that men of my age should dwell in a foreign land, next, because all who heard of my residence abroad would justly despise me if, having chosen to pass my former life in tranquility, I should undertake in old age to spend my life abroad, when it would be reasonable for me, even if I had been accustomed to live somewhere else. Now to hasten home. Since the end of my life is now so near at hand. Moreover, I have fears for Athens, since the truth must be told, for I see that alliances made with her are soon dissolved. 
So, if anything of that kind should happen between Athens and you. Even if I could escape the ensuing accusations and dangers, which would be difficult, yet I should be ashamed if I should be thought by any either to be neglectful of you on account of my city, or on your account to be indifferent to the interests of Athens. For in the absence of a common ground of interest I do not see how I could please both sides. Such, then, are the reasons why I cannot do as I wish. But I do not think that I should write to you about my own affairs only and be indifferent to yours, on the contrary, just as I would have done had I come to you, I will now try to discuss these same matters to the best of my ability. And pray do not entertain any such notion as that I have written this letter, not on account of your friendship, but for the purpose of making a rhetorical display. For I have not become so demented as not to know that I could not write anything better than my previously published discourses, being now so far past my prime. And that if I produce anything much inferior in merit, I should find my present reputation grievously impaired. Besides, if I were intent upon producing a composition for display instead of having your interest at heart, I should not have chosen of all available subjects that one which is difficult to treat passably well, but I should have found other themes, much nobler and more logical. But the truth is that never at any time have I prided myself on the compositions of the former kind, but rather upon the latter, which most people have disregarded, nor have I undertaken my present theme with that intention, but because I see that your troubles are many and serious and wish to give you my own opinion concerning them. And I think that for the giving of counsel I am in my prime for men of my age are trained by experience, which enables them to perceive more clearly than the younger men the best course of action but to speak upon any proposed subject with grace, elegance, and finish is no longer to be expected at my age. Indeed. I shall be content if I discuss these matters in a not altogether negligent fashion. Do not be surprised if I am found saying something which you have heard before, for one statement I may perhaps chance upon unwittingly, another I may consciously employ, if it is pertinent to the discussion. Certainly I should be foolish if, although I see others using my thoughts, I alone should refrain from employing what I have previously said. This is the reason, then, for these introductory words, that the very first precept I shall present is one of those most often repeated. I am accustomed, that is, to tell the students in my school of rhetoric that the first question to be considered is what is the object to be accomplished by the discourse as a whole and by its parts. And when we have discovered this and the matter has been accurately determined, I say that we must seek the rhetorical elements whereby that which we have set out to do may be elaborated and fulfilled. And this procedure I prescribe with reference to discourse. Yet it is a principle applicable not only to all other matters, but also to your own affairs. For nothing can be intelligently accomplished unless first, with full forethought, you reason and deliberate how you ought to direct your own future, what mode of life you should choose, what kind of repute you should set your heart upon, and which kind of honours you should be contented with those freely granted by your fellow citizens or those wrung from them against their will, and when these principles have been determined, then and only then should your daily actions be considered. In order that they may be in conformity with the original plan. If in this way you seriously search and study, you will take mental aim, as at a mark, at what is expedient for you, and will be the more likely to hit it. And if you have no such plan, but attempt to act in casual fashion, inevitably you will go astray in your purposes and fail in many undertakings. Perhaps some one of those who choose to live planlessly may attempt to disparage such reasoning and ask that I give my advice forthwith with regard to what has just been said. Hence I must not shrink from declaring my honest opinion about it. To me the life of a private citizen seems preferable and better than that of a king, and I regard the honours received under constitutional governments as more gratifying than those under monarchies. It is of these honours I shall endeavour to speak. And yet I am not unaware that I shall have many adversaries, especially among those who are in your circle, because these persons especially, I think, urge you to despotic power, for they do not examine from all sides the real nature of the question, but in many ways deceive themselves. For it is the powers, the profits, and the pleasures that they see in royalty and expect to enjoy them, whereas they fail to observe the disturbances, the fears, and the misfortunes which befall rulers and their friends. Instead they suffer from the same delusion as do men who set their hands to the most disgraceful and lawless deeds. These in fact are not ignorant of the wickedness of their acts. But hope to extract all the profit therein and yet to be exempt from all the dangers and ills which inhere in such acts, and to manage their affairs in such fashion as to keep the perils at a distance and the benefits within easy reach. 
As for those who have this conception of the matter, I envy them their easygoing philosophy, but I myself should be ashamed if, while offering counsel to others, I should be negligent of their interests and look to my own advantage instead of putting myself altogether beyond the reach of both the personal benefits and all other considerations and advising the best course of action. Being aware, therefore, that I hold this conviction, I beg you to give me your attention. Then followed in the letter the practical advice of Isocrates to the future rulers of Thessaly. Presumably setting forth the advantages of a government under a constitution, I. E. A limited monarchy. To Timotheus. Of the friendly relations which exist between your family and me I think you have heard from many sources, and I congratulate you as I receive word, first that you are making use of the princely power you now possess in better and wiser fashion than your father, and also, that you choose rather to win good repute than to amass great wealth. In making this your purpose you give no slight indication of virtue, but the very greatest, so that, if you are faithful to your present reputation, you will not lack those who will praise both your wisdom and this choice. I think that the reports which have been noised abroad about your father will also contribute a great deal of credibility to the general opinion of your good judgment and superiority to all others, for most men are wont to praise and honour, not so much the sons of fathers who are of good repute, as those born of harsh and cruel fathers provided that they show themselves to be similar in no respect to their parents. For any boon which comes to men contrary to reason always gives them greater pleasure than those which duly come to pass in accordance with their expectation. Bearing this in mind, you should search and study in what fashion, with the aid of whom, and by employing what counsellors you are to repair your city's misfortunes, to spur your citizens on to their labours and to temperate conduct, and to cause them to live more happily and more confidently than in the past, for this is the duty of good and wise kings. Some, disdaining these obligations, look to nothing else save how they may themselves lead lives of the greatest licentiousness and may mistreat and pillage by taxation the best and wealthiest and most sagacious of their subjects, being ill aware that wise men who hold that high office should not, at the cost of injury to all the rest, provide pleasures for themselves. But rather should by their own watchful care make their subjects happier, nor should they, while being harshly and cruelly disposed toward all, yet be careless of their own safety, on the contrary, their conduct of affairs should be so gentle and so in accordance with the law that no one will venture to plot against them, yet they should rigorously guard their persons as if everybody wished to kill them. For if they should adopt this policy, they would themselves be free from danger and at the same time be highly esteemed by all, blessings greater than these it would be difficult to discover. I have been thinking, as I write, how happily everything has fallen out for you. The wealth which could only have been acquired forcibly and despotically and at the cost of much hatred, has been left to you by your father, but to use it honourably and for the good of mankind has devolved upon you, and to this task you should devote yourself with great diligence. These, then, are my views. But this this is the application, if your heart is set upon money and greater power and dangers too, through which these possessions are acquired, you must summon other advisers, but if you already have enough of these and wish virtue, fair reputation, and the goodwill of your subjects in general, you should heed my words and emulate those rulers who govern their states well and should endeavour to surpass them. I hear that Cleomis, who in Methymna holds this royal power, is noble and wise in all his actions, and that so far from putting any of his subjects to death, or exiling them, or confiscating their property, or injuring them in any other respect, he provides great security for his fellow citizens, and restores the exiles, returning to those who come back their lost possessions, and in each case recompenses the purchasers the price they had paid. In addition, he gives arms to all the citizens, thinking that none will try to revolt from him but even if any should dare it. He believes that his death after having shown such generosity to the citizens would be preferable to continued existence after becoming the author of the greatest evils to his city. I should have discussed these matters with you at greater length, and perhaps also in a more attractive style, were I not under the stern necessity of writing the letter in haste. As it is, I will counsel you at a later time if my old age does not prevent, for the present I will speak concerning our personal relations. Autocrata, the bearer of this letter, is my friend, we have been interested in the same pursuits and I have often profited by his skill, and, finally, I have advised him about his visit to you. For all those reasons I would have you use him well and in a manner profitable to us both, and that it may become evident that his needs are being realised in some measure through my efforts. And do not marvel that I am so ready to write to you. Though I never made any request of your father Clearchus. For almost all who have sailed hither from your court say that you resemble my best pupils. 
but as for Clearchus when he visited us, all who met him agreed that he was at that time the most liberal, kindly, and humane of the members of my school, but when he gained his power he seemed to change in disposition so greatly that all who had previously known him marvelled. For these reasons I was estranged from him, but you I esteem and I should highly value your friendly disposition toward myself. And you yourself will soon make it clear if you reciprocate my regard, for you will be considerate of autocrata, and send me a letter renewing our former friendship and hospitality. Farewell, if you wish anything from here, write. To the rulers of the Mytilenians. The sons of Aphareus, my grandsons, who were instructed in music by Agenor, have asked me to write to you and beg that, since you have restored some of the other exiles, you will also allow Agenor, his father, and his brothers to return home. When I told them that I feared I, I should appear ridiculous and meddlesome in seeking so great a favour from men with whom I have never before spoken or been acquainted, they, upon hearing my reply, were all the more insistent. And when they could obtain nothing of what they hoped, they clearly showed to all that they were displeased and sorely disappointed. So when I saw that they were unduly distressed I finally promised to write the letter and send it to you. That I may not justly seem foolish and irksome I make this explanation. I think you have been well advised both in becoming reconciled to your fellow citizens and, while trying to reduce the number of exiles, in increasing that of the participants in public life and also in imitating Athens in handling the sedition. You are especially deserving of praise because you are restoring their property to the exiles who return, for thus you show and make clear to all that you had expelled them. Not because you coveted the property of others. But because you feared for the welfare of the city. Nevertheless, even if you had adopted none of the measures, and had received back no one of the exiles, the restoration of these individuals is to your advantage, I think, for it is disgraceful that while your city is universally acknowledged to be most devoted to music and the most notable artists in that field have been born among you, yet he who is the foremost authority of living men in that branch of culture is an exile from such a city, and that while all other Greeks confer citizenship upon men who are distinguished in any of the noble pursuits, even though they are foreigners, yet you suffer those who are both famous among the other Greeks and share in your own racial origin to live abroad in exile. I marvel that so many cities judge those who excel in the athletic contests to be worthy of greater rewards than those who, by painstaking thought and endeavour, discover some useful thing. And that they do not see at a glance that while the faculties of strength and speed naturally perish with the body, Yet the arts and sciences abide for eternity, giving benefit to those who cultivate them. Intelligent men, therefore, bearing in mind these considerations, should esteem most highly, first those who administer well and justly the affairs of their own city, and, second, those who are able to contribute to its honour and glory, for all the world uses such men as examples and all their fellow citizens are judged to be of like excellence. But perhaps someone may object, saying that those who wish to obtain a favour should not merely praise the thing, but should also show that they themselves would be justly entitled to that for which they petition. But here is the situation. It is true that I have abstained from political activity and from practising oratory, for my voice was inadequate and I lacked assurance. I have not been altogether useless, however, and without repute, on the contrary. You will find that I have been the counsellor and coadjutor of those who have chosen to speak well of you and of our other allies. And that I have myself composed more discourses on behalf of the freedom and independence of the Greeks than all those together who have worn smooth the floor of our platforms. For this you would justly be grateful to me in the highest degree, for you constantly and earnestly desire such a settled policy. And I think that, if Conan and Timotheus were still alive, and Diophantus had returned from Asia, they would have supported me most enthusiastically, since they would wish that I might obtain all I request. On this topic I do not know what more I need say, for there is no one among you so young or so forgetful as not to know the benefactions of those great men. But I think that you would arrive at the best decision as to this matter if you should consider who your petitioner is and for what men the favour is asked. For you will find that I have had the most intimate relations with those who have been the authors of the greatest benefits to both you and the other allies, and that while those for whom I intercede are men of such character as to give no offence to their elders and to those in governmental authority, to the younger men they furnish agreeable and useful occupation that befits those of their age. Do not wonder that I have written this letter with considerable warmth and at some length, for I desire to accomplish two things, not only to do our children a favour, but also to make it clear to them that even if they do not become orators in the assembly or generals, but merely imitate my manner of life, they will not lead neglected lives among the Greeks. 
One thing more if it should seem best to you to grant any of these requests, let Agenor and his brothers understand that it is owing in some measure to me that they are obtaining what they desire. To Archidamus. Since I know, Archidamus, that many persons are eager to sing the praises of you, your father, and your family, I have chosen to leave to them that topic, since it would be a very easy one to treat. I myself, however, intend to exhort you to feats of generalship and military campaigns which are in no respect similar to those which are impending now, but, on the contrary, are such as will make you the author of great benefits, not only to your own state, but also to all the Greek world. This is the choice of subject I have made, although I am not unaware which of the two discourses is the easier to deal with, nay, I know perfectly well that to discover actions which are noble, great. And advantageous is difficult and given to few men. Whereas to praise your virtues I should have found an easy task. For there would have been no need of deriving from my own resources all that was to be said about them, but in your own past achievements I should have found topics for treatment so many and of such a kind that the eulogies pronounced upon other men would not have rivaled in the slightest degree the praise that I should have lavished upon you. For how could anyone have surpassed in nobility of birth the descendants of Heracles and Zeus and all men know that to your family alone confessedly belongs this honour or in Vela the founders of the Dorian cities in the Peloponnese who occupied that land, or in the multitude of the perilous deeds and the trophies erected as a result of your leadership and rule? Who would lack material if he wished to recount in full the tale of the courage of your entire state, and of its moderation? And its constitution established by your ancestors? How long a story would be needed to tell of your father's wisdom, of his handling of affairs in adversity, and of that battle in Sparta in which you, leading a few against many, exposed yourself to danger, and, surpassing all, proved to be the author of your city's salvation a deed than which no man could point to one more glorious. For neither capture of cities nor slaughter of a multitude of the enemy is so great and so sublime as the saving of one's fatherland from peril so dire and no ordinary fatherland, but one so greatly distinguished for its valour. Any man who should relate these achievements, not in polished style, but simply, and without stylistic embellishment, merely telling the tale of them and speaking in random fashion, could not fail to win renown. Now I might have spoken passably about even these matters, since I knew, in the first place, that it is easier to treat copiously in cursory fashion occurrences of the past than intelligently to discuss the future and, in the second place, that all men are more grateful to those who praise them than to those who advise them for the former they approve as being well disposed. But the latter, if the advice comes unbidden, they look upon as officious nevertheless, although I was already fully aware of all these considerations, I have refrained from topics which would surely be flattering and now I propose to speak of such matters as no one else would dare to discuss, because I believe that those who make pretensions to fairness and practical wisdom should choose, not the easiest subjects, but the most arduous, nor yet those which are the sweetest to the ears of the listeners, but such as will avail to benefit, not only their own states, but also all the other Greeks. And such is the subject, in fact, to which I have fixed my attention at the present time. I marvel also at those men who have ability in action or in speech that it has never occurred to them seriously to take to heart the conditions which affect all Greeks alike, or even to feel pity for the evil plight of Hellas, so shameful and dreadful. No part of which now remains that is not teeming full of war. Uprisings, slaughter, and evils innumerable. The greatest share of these ills is the lot of the dwellers along the seaboard of Asia, whom by the treaty we have delivered one and all into the hands, not only of the barbarians, but also of those Greeks who, though they share our speech, yet adhere to the ways of the barbarians. These renegades, if we had any sense, we should not be permitting to come together into bands or, led by any chance leaders, to form armed contingents, composed of roving forces more numerous and powerful than are the troops of our own citizen forces. These armies do damage to only a small part of the domain of the king of Persia, but every Hellenic city they enter they utterly destroy, killing some, driving others into exile, and robbing still others of their possessions. Furthermore, they treat with indignity children and women, and not only Dishna the most beautiful women. But from the others they strip off the clothing which they wear on their persons. So that those who even when fully clothed were not to be seen by strangers, are beheld naked by many men, and some women, clad in rags, are seen wandering in destitution from lack of the bare necessities of life. With regard to this unhappy situation, which has now obtained for a long time, not one of the cities which lays claim to the leadership of the Hellenes has shown indignation, nor has any of its leading men been wroth, except your father. For Agesilaus alone of all whom we know unceasingly to the end long to liberate the Greeks and to wage war against the barbarians. Nevertheless, even he erred in one respect. 
and do not be surprised if I, in my communication to you, mention matters in which his judgment was at fault, for I am accustomed always to speak with the utmost frankness and I should prefer to be disliked for having justly censured than to win favour through having given unmerited praise. My view, then, is as follows, Agesilaus, who had one distinction in all other fields, and had shown himself to be in the highest degree self-controlled, just, and statesmanlike, conceived two strong desires, each of them taken by itself seeming admirable, but being incompatible and incapable of achievement at the same time. For he wished not only to wage war on the Persian king but also to restore to their respective cities his friends who were in exile and to establish them as masters of affairs. The result, therefore, of his exertions on behalf of his friends was that the Greeks were involved in misfortunes and in fighting, and on account of the confusion which prevailed here had not the leisure nor yet the strength to wage war against the barbarians. So, in consequence of the conditions which were at that time not recognized, it is easy to perceive that men of good counsel should not wage war against the king of Persia until someone shall have first reconciled the Greeks with each other and have made us cease from our madness and contentiousness. On these topics I have spoken before and now I intend to discuss them. And yet certain persons who, although they have no share at all in learning, yet profess to be able to teach everybody else, and although they dare to find fault with my efforts, yet are eager to imitate them, will perhaps call it madness for me to concern myself with the misfortunes of Greece, as if Greece would be either better or worse off as a result of words of mine. Justly, however, would all men condemn these persons as guilty of great cowardice and meanness of spirit, for while they make pretense to serious intellectual interests, they pride themselves on petty things and consistently show malice and envy against those who have the ability to give counsel concerning matters of the greatest importance. These men, then, in their endeavour to give aid and comfort to their own weaknesses and indolence, will perhaps speak in such fashion. I for my part, however, pride myself so greatly on my ability that, even though I am now eighty years of age and altogether worn out, I think it is especially fitting to speak my mind on these matters, and also that I have been well advised in directing my appeal to you, and that it may well be that from my counsel some of the necessary measures will be taken. And I believe that if the rest of the Greek world also should be called upon to choose from all mankind both the man who by his eloquence would best be able to summon the Greeks to the expedition against the barbarians, and also the leader who would be likely most quickly to bring to fulfilment the measures recognized as expedient, they would choose no others but you and me. Yet surely we should be acting disgracefully, should we not, if we should neglect these duties in which our honor is involved, should all men regard us as worthy of them? My part, it is true, is the smaller, for to declare what one thinks is usually not so very difficult. But for you it is fitting, giving attention to all that I have said, to deliberate upon the question whether you should shrink from the conduct of the affairs of Hellas you, whose noble lineage I have a little while ago described, leader of the Lacedaemonians, addressed by the named king, and a man who enjoys the greatest renown of all the Hellenes or, disdaining the matters you now have in hand, you should put your hand to greater undertakings. I for my part say that, disregarding everything else, you should give your attention to these two tasks to rid the Hellenes from their wars and from all the other miseries with which they are now afflicted, and to put a stop to the insolence of the barbarians and to their possession of wealth beyond their due. That these things are practicable and expedient for you, for your city, and for all the Hellenes at large, it is now my task to explain. The conclusion is missing.